I've just crossed into the hatch. He called out into the static and silence, floating through into the minuscule metal cone, pulling himself in by handles to find bakelite buttons and sterile systems, clean and pristine as the day the module was launched. Pulling the door shut, he peered through the porthole above it to bear witness to the blue-green planet he called home so far below, only to be met with nothing. No stars, no sun, no light, nor discernible distance as though the universe itself had vanished. Yet again, there is nothing. I know this thing will run out of recording time soon, but uh, I'm struggling here. Silence. Painful silence. I just want to hear a human voice again. Somebody. Anybody. And I don't care if it's English or Russian or Zulu or whatever. He trembled in lost desperation, still staring out the porthole, hoping something would change, wishing that something would be. Even if it's my own voice, I know it's stupid. I'm losing my mind here. I just don't want to be alone anymore. More silence followed. That's all that was left in the empty space outside of the capsule. I don't think anybody will find this. Hell, I know nobody will find this. But, just in case. <sighs> the recording captured the sounds of him shuffling into the seat at the control panel followed by a long sigh. It was in the early 21st century. Not that I have any idea what the year is now, but I don't suppose it matters. And something appeared in Earth's orbit. There were whack jobs who instantly thought aliens and took to their bunkers. People panicked and governments tried to keep it hush-hush as they always do. But Everyone had phones, the internet. It was on the front page of every newspaper, from Washington to Wuhan. He clicked a few buttons on the console to see if anything would change this time. Flicking switches and turning knobs didn't seem to do much of anything. Well, it wasn't aliens. It was us, Apollo 1. There was never any fire. They lost the damn thing in space and tried to cover it up. He gave an anxious chuckle. <laughs> After all that time, it came back. It found its way home. You'd think maybe it got more than extremely lucky and swung by a planet's orbit. Or got pushed back by some magnetic force out there. Or, I don't know, something, but that's not it. A deep breath, a staggered, hollow laugh. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to say we're brought it back, because I don't know. But there's something different about it. The powers that be, the powers that were, I should say, sent me and the crew up to investigate, check for damage, and find out why it was back here, hanging in a geostationary orbit, and bring back the bodies of the crew. There should have been three guys in here, but it's likely they were never here in the first place. All the food is untouched. The water tank is full. Power is nominal. It doesn't even look as if, as if it left the ground. When we made our initial approach, it was a bit dirty on the outside. Kind of a rusty brown, but the inside was immaculate. I went in first to find the seats empty, and when I turned around, the door was closed. Huh. I thought it was a prank at first, that no 
those clowns had shut me in there as a bad joke. So I tried to open the door from the inside. But there was this. Well, it was an infinity symbol. But it wasn't handed on. It... Uh, it's hard to describe. It was kind of like how water refracts light. Only with more depth. Like... Like there was a whole other dimension in there. I could tell it was flat, but at the same time, it wasn't. I wish I had the words for it. Of course, I start freaking out and just rip the door open as fast as I can. I fly through the hole, and I'm back inside the pod. So I start freaking out. I can still see the other guys outside, just floating there pointing at the pod, looking around as if they can't find me. God, it was so long ago now. He got to his feet, hunched over, and took another look at the porthole, just in case. Of course, they left, floated right back over to the craft, and went back to Earth, without me. I tried the radio. It was the first thing I did. Houston... Pasadena, Kennedy, when they didn't reply, I tried Madrid, Sydney, Moscow. He pushed open the hatch door again, turning the handle and pressing it open to reveal another copy of the pod on the other side. Floating through, he found the same as before, the same as every time, with the door already closed behind him as though he'd never opened it in the first place. He spun back around, already resigned to the fact that it would be shut tight. I didn't get a reply, just static. As time went on, I tried every frequency, and I mean every frequency, again and again and again and again, nothing. Nothing but static. They, they couldn't hear me, and I couldn't hear them. It was like, it was like I was in a Faraday cage, only worse, and I had no way of getting out of here. It felt like it was years before I heard the radio crackle back, but I remember how excited I was to hear a voice on the other side after so long in solitude. It felt like a being released from prison, or hearing you were free from cancer, or giving birth to your first child. It was that level of excitement a hundred times over. I listened intently, but... <laughs> it was me. It was me. Those messages I sent to Mission Control had shot off into space and come right back to me, just like the ship had. God, I sounded so desperate. Just hearing the tone of my voice, I relieved the fear I had at the time, and the frustration that it wasn't Earth calling back broke something in me. He began to sputter and sob softly as the memories hunted him, still staring out into empty, black space. <laughs> I couldn't do it anymore. I smashed that pot up. I smashed it good and proper. I tried to crack the windows open and get myself sucked out into space. But, but they were too strong. I bashed my head against the walls, but I did more damage to them than myself. I, I remember my fists broken and bloody after that. I could barely open the hatch through the pain. Looking up from the porthole, he stared at the symbol before him, a tiny squiggle of numbers too massive to extrapolate. The infinity symbol was long gone, replaced by a number within that infinity. I got through though, only to find my hands fixed in the pod the way I found it in the first place. So I smashed it up again. I pulled out the electronics, I tore at the cables, and put water over everything. I tried everything I could, everything, and then, and then I, and then I cried. I, I just, I just, I just cried. 
He gave another weak sob and sniffled through the wearing background noise of fans. Every time I go through that damn hatch, the number changes. For a while there, I tried to keep a track of it, watching as the numbers swap and change. But it honestly meant nothing to me. I couldn't figure it out. I doubt Einstein could have figured it out. I thought maybe there was some kind of trick to it, that if I could solve it, then I could claim my freedom, even with all the time in the world. I just couldn't bring myself to work it out. Matt was never my strong point. It took me longer than it should have to figure out that I wasn't aging. My nails and beard stopped growing. But I watched the world go by below me. Twinkling lights at night growing bigger and brighter as the world's cities grew. Hurricanes and storms creeping across the oceans. I saw the ice caps melt. Lands grow flooded and vanish beneath the waves. I saw the green vegetation covering the planet grow brown while the seas grew dark. Those lights from the cities dwindled. I realized I was watching civilization pass by before me. Oh, not in a flash or anything. No, day by day, week by week, year after damn year, I was the same. But before my eyes, I was watching in painfully slow detail as humanity ruined itself. And there was nothing I could do to prevent it. All I could do was think. There was some paper, so I took to drawing the things I saw and what I imagined was happening down there. As soon as I left through the hatch again, it would be gone. But at least that gave me something to do. I would write messages, even though I knew nobody would ever read them. I... <sighs> I wrote to my wife. A lot. I knew after a while she would have found somebody else. He paused, contemplating his memories with her. I don't even remember her now. She's long dead. They all are. I hate that I can't even picture her face anymore. I can still feel what she was like, but I wish I brought a photo up here with me. You know, we had an argument before all this happened. She didn't want me coming up here. Of course she didn't. She couldn't have known it would be this bad though. He shook his head. I should have listened to her. I tried to reassure her. I trusted the guys on the ground. It wasn't like I was going to Jupiter or anything. It was just an orbit. And I'd done it before. I wasn't afraid. Eventually, ship after ship left the planet. Everybody who was still left alive fled. I saw them leaving in different directions. So hopefully, there are still people out there somewhere. I wish I could have moved this thing and followed them. Sometimes, I wonder what happened to them all. When you have all the time in the world, and only yourself, you have a lot of time to think. Thinking is all well and good, but, but I just wish I knew for sure that humanity continued. Anyway, the sun began to expand. I couldn't really tell. Seeing it every day, you don't get a point of reference for the difference. But it completely swallowed Mercury and Venus, eventually becoming a red giant and taking what was left of Earth into itself. I had to wait billions of years, but I got one hell of a view when it collapsed. It left a white dwarf behind in a cloud of nebulous gas. Billions more years later, it changed into a brown dwarf, and then a black dwarf. I'd taken to counting the stars left in the sky, the light traveling across the sky for millions of years, eventually twinkled out, star by star, until there was nothing left. I'm 
surprised. I'm still dislucid, but I think each time I cross over the hatch, it somehow keeps me going. I wish it could stop the suffering too. I wish it could just set me free. So that brings us to now. I keep hopping through the hatch, hoping that something will change. I keep looking at the numbers, but they're not much help either. The only thing I can do is wait until a black hole comes along and sucks me up. But even then, I don't know if I'll be allowed to die or not. Maybe this stupid thing will still be intact inside there. I'm going to end the recording here. I might listen back to it. Maybe it'll be some comfort. I want to tell myself that I can do this, but I don't know what it is that I'm doing. I don't know why I'm trapped here. I don't know if I'll ever get out, but I wanted to just die and get it over with billions of years ago. If that's not suffering, I don't know what is. Godspeed, Rocket Man. Find your peace. The recording ended with a... Years passed. Decades and eons soon followed. Millennia passed by in the blink of an eye, compared to the time he'd already spent aboard the craft and black holes collided distantly, undergoing atrophy into radiation as they crawled across the sky. Everything was dark, cold, and dead. He was all that was left of any rational universe. The final testament that humanity had existed. Proof that mankind was there as an immortal reminder of our arrogance. He spent his many days much the same way, drawing and writing, singing to himself, trying desperately to stay busy or sleep the time away. He tried hovering between the hatches, closing the door on himself as far as it would go, but nothing ever changed. He awoke one morning to the same things as ever, a pristine cabin, an endless night. The disorienting space around him offered no solace. The universe had ended, not with a bang, but with a whispered whimper as space arrived at its terminus the state of maximum entropy. Oh, God. I just woke up and something changed after all this time. Oh, God. It's... it's different. He sounded elated. Nervous, anxious laughs burst like rising bubbles from his chest. (laughs) I'm... I'm seeing a... a zero with a line through it. Kind of an oval, really. An inaccessible cardinal. A number that cannot be obtained from smaller numbers, no matter how many you add. A number so large that it exists beyond and above infinity, unobtainable through ordinary means. Infinites added together still cannot reach it, even when combined or put into different orders and added on top still truly, unfathomably endless. The number has gone, and that's all that's left. It's small, but it's something different. It's different. The universe is dead, and yet here I remain. Maybe it's my turn now. I have no idea what's waiting for me on the other side. The porthole is still the same, but the number has never looked like this before. Should I bring something with me? Uh, Will I need the food? He paused for a moment and shuffled around in the cabinets next to him, taking down dehydrated meals and pouches of water. All right. I've gathered up what I can carry. I'm bringing the paper with me as well. I'm hoping that it's just death on the other side, but who knows? I've lived up here longer than all the lives of everything put together. Every person, every animal and insect, every plant, stacked their lives together and have still been here longer. Just me and empty space. (sighs) I'm ready to die. I've been ready for... forever. This will be my 
final recording. If anybody but myself hears this, well, I don't know what to tell you, really. Nothing matters. Everything dies in the end. Love conquers all. No, there's no point to life outside of what you make it. Up here for so long, I can tell you, there is no God. Not from what I've seen, and I've seen everything. He placed his hand on the metal pole and pushed it down with a quivering hand. The metal thunked and echoed through the craft, reverberating softly back into his hand. I'm going through for what I hope will be the last time. Wish me luck. He pushed his way through the hatch with trembling anticipation. There could be anything on the other side, or everything. It could be a new chance at life, or the sweet release of death. Whatever awaited him, he was ready for, as long as it was something other than the timeless prison he'd endured. As he floated through, he couldn't quite understand what he was seeing. In the distance was the hatch of the pod from the outside, with its brown dusty coating and gentle light radiating from the porthole. At first glance, it seemed reasonably normal, with exception to the number now shining from the outside of the hatch. Aleph Null, the collective sum of the set of all integers, containing all possible cardinal numbers and arrangements of infinity. It gleamed and glistened with greater depth than should have been afforded it, falling back and forward as if it were a hologram, but also aging and renewing seemingly at will as it caused the surrounding metal to corrode and shine, to buckle and bend and straighten out again. There was a rippling gravity to it, bending and warping the very nature of reality as he beheld its mysterious properties. He moved towards it only to notice that his body was no longer there. The consciousness, the ego, the self that made up who he was, and the collective experiences that shaped him had become liberated from their physical form. Either he moved or the space around him moved as he willed it. He wasn't quite sure which, and the position of the pod changed with him. It faded from view like a lenticular print, being viewed at a different angle, and at the same time, another version of the pod faded into view with a slightly different symbol. Aleph 1, an equal but separate infinity. The distance between the hatch and him was indeterminable. It could have been right next to him or on the other side of space, moving against a background not of light nor dark, not of space and distance, but nothing, true nothing beyond human reasoning, without height or length, distance or time, as though everything was fixed into a single point that was both everywhere and nowhere, all at once. As his consciousness continued to flow through this strange place, if it was a place at all, an infinite number of Apollo pods flickered in and out of reality, the number below the Aleph changing as his psyche traversed this bizarre realm. He'd grown accustomed to looking through the porthole of the capsule in his timeless solitude, perhaps in unwitting preparation for this very moment. As through each one, the beginning and end of the universe passed by in an instant, and from it, he knew all that each hatch held within. Each version of the pod held within its own probabilities, its own infinity, a different version of the events that had transpired within the history of the universe. Some were similar, but the higher the number became, the more twisted and warped the world had become. There were even worlds where humanity never emerged, where the Earth never formed, and some where the laws of physics were gnarled and broken beyond recognition. Every arrangement of every possibility presented itself before him, sharing their secrets with an instantaneous, 
unspoken understanding transferred directly to his psyche with little more than a glance through the glass. Through this maddening amount of information, he observed a purpose, the intent of all of this. He didn't know how. He didn't have to know how. But he knew that he caused it to happen. Another pod, another hatch appeared. Like the true original, there was no number. But unlike all the rest, nothing came from the porthole. No view into the birth and death of the universe. No understanding of the possibilities within it. No intimate view into every minute detail. As with the area around him, there was no light or dark. No space on the other side. Just the purest, most concentrated nothingness. This was why he was here. With sheer force of will alone, he pulled down the bolt and pushed open the hatch slowly, picturing in the greatest detail the world that he wanted on the other side. From nothing came everything. Without dimensions, he emerged into a dense explosion of superheated plasma, containing all matter as dimensions ballooned out from the hatch, and he followed its rapid expanse and cooling. Witness gravity pulling matter together to form clouds of hydrogen that ignited into stars. He saw those same stars burst into vibrant clouds of dust and form new stars entirely. Around him, the universe took shape. Stars churned out denser matter, and dust clouds formed asteroids, which in turn formed planets. The cycle went on and on until he had formed his ideal Earth setting into motion the events that were to unfold as he saw fit. He shaped the first proteins clinging to volcanic geysers underwater that formed into cells, guided the evolution of life into plants and animals, followed their progress into more and more complex beings. He had the arsenal of a god in his imagination and through simply wishing something it would become so, unhampered by the complex systems of human physiology, Unburdened by a finite brain, he was free to act as he wished. He walked unseen across the face of the planet with time, an irrelevant aspect to him, bearing witness to the world and people he had created until finally meeting his mother. His time was at hand, and his work was complete. He wasn't sure if he'd remembered the pilgrimage he had taken, but it didn't matter. Even Godhood couldn't avert the solitude. He was ready. His rebirth had been one part of his plan for this universe, relinquishing control over it so that he could live and that he may one day die in peace. He rendered himself to nothing more than an egg and waited, growing, biding his time, until at last he took his first screaming wildly gasping breaths of the air he'd willed into existence. He was home. Hey Creepypasta fans, it's Keon. Thanks for listening tonight. If you'd like to connect and support us, make sure to check out our Patreon and Discord links in the description below. A special thanks to Moonlight Hunter for this story. And remember, stay cosmic. There's a sound nearby. At first, I think it's static or a malfunction in the communication device of my spacesuit, but it isn't. There's a shuffling sound or like the hiss of a snake hiding in plain sight. It's the sound of danger boiling right before exploding in our faces. And then something hits my back. I turn around hastily jumping in place, <laughs> gotcha. but I'm only met with laughter from a friend. <laughs> hey, Gerard, calm down, man. It's okay. We made it here. We're safe. I stare into the calm blue eyes of Thomas, 
the captain of the ship that brought us here, a brand new exoplanet to claim for humanity. I nod in acknowledgement of his words and put in a brave smile on my face. The trip here was far from uneventful, and we had to dodge more obstacles than expected. But we finally made it. I'm probably just paranoid after being so tense during the entire trip. This planet is beautiful. It is smaller than Earth. Very rocky with strange and sparse vegetation. But an abundance of clear water that came and went from big mountains, caves, and great lakes for as far as we can see. We're supposed to celebrate our success, not jump at the shadows lurking around us. I leave Thomas behind and approach the two other members of our crew. Natasha and Isabel were standing by the American flag we planted on the surface of the planet as soon as we landed. Natasha, the youngest member of the crew, was entertained studying the way the flag floated and quivered, suspended in the unfamiliar air of this planet. She was saying, Look around you, Liz. This planet is the most worth exploring I've ever seen. That makes Isabel laugh. <laughs> it's the only planet besides Earth that you know, she reminds the other woman. I say that we should take the free time to rest inside the ship before we have to start the journey back to Earth. Come on. Natasha throws her back, laughing wholeheartedly, while Isabel tries to drag her back to the ship and I laugh along with them. <laughs> it's a perfect scene. The dreamlike planet, my friends having fun, our ship like a second home waiting for us. And then, the scream. It's bone chilling. A scream of the deepest terror possible to man. I'm frozen in place still staring at the two women as they clutch each other tightly and scream horrified. But my entire body has turned to ice. I start shaking before I'm able to move. And then finally, I turn my head, already feeling like I might cry from how scared I am. The scene behind me is the complete opposite of the unbridled joy from just a minute ago. Thomas is still standing right where I left him, but he isn't alone anymore. There's a... a creature right behind him. A creature bigger than any human being, devoid of hair or scales, just dark, gray, wrinkled skin like a giant rat? Like... like a demon of black, shiny eyes an open jaws that's holding the captain of our ship with a single limb, as if he was a rag doll. The captain is still screaming. The extraterrestrial notices the three of us watching and opens its jaws even more. For a second, I'm worried that thing is about to eat Thomas in front of our eyes, just to immediately lunge forward and take us down one by one. Instead, the terrifying beast screams too. I expect the roar of a bear, the shrill yell of a rat, and somehow got both. A high-pitched cry that makes me flinch and try to cover my ears if it weren't for the helmet of my suit, and underneath a deep booming groan that I feel rattling in my bones. Instinctively, I take tentative steps backward, doubled over in pain as I watch that beast scream at us, but my focus is on Thomas. Our captain isn't screaming anymore. I can tell he's gritting his teeth to bear the pain of the overwhelming noise coming from the spot right above his head. There are tears slipping down his cheeks. And I could be wrong, but I think I see his ears starting to bleed. I'm still watching them when the monster finally quiets down. And then, a second later, it's still holding Thomas against its torso. That thing turns around and sprints away. It takes a big leap, and I can't help but run in the same direction, desperate to save my captain and friend. Then I feel two pairs of arms holding me back from certain death. 
The monster had jumped down a steep and rocky cliff, and it was currently hurrying on three of its limbs to get to a cave. Let me go! I yell, strolling against the hold of my two remaining partners. We have to go after him! Stop, Gerard! Use your head! Isabel exclaims. We can't go against the creature with our bare hands. We can't. But we can't leave him, right? Natasha speaks up next. We have to. We have to. Oh my god. The young woman is just unable to process the magnitude of our predicament. She lets go of my arm and stumbles away from us back to the safety of the ship. There's a bit of silence between Isabel and me as we both consider our options. We are all more than partners on a mission. We have all worked together on different tasks before. We are friends, and this journey turned us into a family. But Isabel has always beat me at quick thinking when facing a challenge. Her next words send chills down my entire body. Gerard, before you make a choice, I need you to be extremely aware of a few things. We do not stand a chance against that creature. We don't know if there are more like it, and we are in their territory, Gerard. This is their home, and we don't know more than what satellite scans show us. We're nothing, Gerard. For those things, we can be a meal. We can be a toy. We could be a sacrifice. If we go looking for our friends, nobody will do the same for us. We might as well be alone in the universe right now. Like it or not, Thomas might be dead already. Going after him is a suicide mission if I've ever seen one. But I know that you're not going to leave him. And I refuse to lose two members of my team today. When Isabel was done talking, I smile at her. I can feel my heart beating like it wants to burst out of my chest. I know we have never been this scared in our entire lives. But in a situation like this, having someone by your side just makes you feel invincible. We have weapons on the ship, I remind her. We don't even know if they would work on this planet, Isabel retorts. Tell that to Natasha, I reply with a grin. Then, Isabel turns around and sees what I had been watching over her shoulder. Natasha had just pulled every weapon stored in the ship for emergencies, and she was currently aiming some type of gun at the horizon. We watch, holding our breath, as Natasha pulls the trigger of the gun. It works. I have a feeling the bullet travels at a slightly slower pace than on Earth, and Natasha visibly loses her balance at the unfamiliar recoil in this gravity. But, damn, <laughs> it works. We take as many weapons and tools as we can carry, and we go on our way. It's the beginning of our suicide mission and nothing could have prepared me for what was to come. We approached the edge of the cliff where the extraterrestrial disappeared with Thomas and we began our descent. It's steep, it should be manageable, but I can shake off my mind that one wrong step could lead us to our death. The greenish rocks tremble and come loose as we step on them. We grit our teeth, tense our muscles, and keep walking. At some point, Isabel steps on an unsteady rock and loses her footing. She screams with everything she has until Natasha catches her in her arms. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Isabel whispers again and again in a trembling voice. It's unsettling seeing firsthand the way high stakes manage to break down even the strongest of people. But then she blurts out. I don't want any of us to die here. And that's it. She's back, with renewed strength and moving even faster than before. We check the radar on our portable communication device. It shows that Thomas is nearby, so we know which way to go. But it also shows him offline. He can't hear us. We can't hear him. Dead or alive, his suit has suffered a malfunction. Finally, we reach the entry to a large cave, like a tunnel big enough for a truck to pass by comfortably. Inside, the rock loses its green tint and everything turns gray. The cave is endless darkness and it makes my hair stand on end. 
feeling like it's a creature even bigger than the one before, waiting for us with open jaws, and we're willingly walking into its hungry insides. Although our suits are equipped with lights on our shoulders to show us the way, the overwhelming darkness around us forces us to turn on individual flashlights that we have to hold along with our guns. Slowly but surely, we move forward. The cave gets darker, the space starts to narrow, and the worst part is the ramifications of the main tunnel. The sensors tell us that Thomas is somewhere ahead of us, so we stick to the main path and hope for the best. But it's almost impossible not to wonder what's hiding in those other routes. Some of the other tunnels are so small that our monster couldn't have passed through them. Could they have been carved out by a different creature? Ancient rocks destroyed by the sheer power of extraterrestrial teeth and claws? Through some tunnels, some currents of freezing or boiling hot air, so strong that the sensors in our suits go crazy and we have to walk faster before the temperature kills us. Then, there are the tunnels that feel… alive. Have I lost my mind? I wonder. Maybe, maybe the fear has contaminated my brain, making me see things that aren't there. Tunnels that disappear. Openings on the walls of the cave that are there one second and completely covered the next. Tunnels that I swear move along with us. Holes that are breathing, yawning, making a trickery of us. Perhaps the worst one is the one Natasha spots before the rest of us. Guys, don't look to your right, she says unexpectedly. Her words make me feel like there's ice flowing through my veins. And halfway through, she starts crying as she says, Whatever you do, don't look. Please, trust me on this, if nothing else. You don't want this. If I tell you to run, do it. But I'm begging you not to look. Just don't look at it. Don't see them, please. Oh my god. When we're past that part of the tunnel, Isabel immediately turns around and takes Natasha in her arms. Are you okay? She asks repeatedly, but I fail to hear the other woman's answer. I'm distracted. In front of me, at the end of the tunnel, there's our captain. Her captain Thomas. My friend. But there's also a gigantic nest and at least two of the monsters lying inside it. I feel like I'm in a daze as I approach the alien nest slowly. I can tell Thomas's helmet has cracked and his suit is all dirty and torn in places. But the planet's atmosphere must be bearable for humans since I can see his chest rise and fall rapidly. I'm not sure if… Uh, I have no idea if he will live to tell his tale, but he's still alive and that's all I need to know. T -t Thomas! Hey! Tommy! I whisper his name. My voice is trembling. It's like all at once the entire tunnel has gone quiet. The strange sounds, the footsteps, the whispers, the fluttering noises, the water dripping, everything coming from the dark corners have quieted down. And my words sound loud like thunder, but I keep going. Tommy, come on! Wake up, please! It's me! Can you hear me? There are only a few feet separating me from Thomas now. The second I see his eyelids start to flutter as he finally opens his eyes again, I know for sure in my heart that this was the right thing to do. But our problems are far from over. A grumbling sound makes me raise my head and look up at what's standing above Thomas. The two extraterrestrials are standing on their hind legs, very awake now, staring me down and baring their teeth at me. They open their jaws. I can't stop looking at their black eyes. I'm afraid those soulless depths would be the last thing I will see when I die. And then, there's a shot. Twin bullets go through right through the center of these monsters' heads. They fall back screaming and writhing in pain but somehow still alive. 
I have no time to ponder about their anatomy. Only then it clicks in my mind that these two are smaller than the one that took Thomas. That can only mean that we hurt, hopefully killed, that monster's babies. Thomas is crawling towards me now, and I run forward to help him to his feet. He's in so much pain, but still in one piece. I take one of his arms over my shoulders, and we turn around. Isabel and Natasha are still holding their guns. They look as terrified as us, but the four of us are alive and together. So if anything, we're stronger now than we enter this tunnel for the first time. Get ready, I tell them. It's time to escape this planet and kill any aliens that stand in our way. Every soldier in the United States Army knew what was coming. From the declaration of war by Germany to the recent attack on Pearl Harbor by the Empire of Japan, we knew that many mothers had just seen their sons for the last time. We could all hear the whispers of war in the cold winds of winter, and it was time to answer the call. It came as little surprise when General Bradley informed me of the situation in Dresden. Dozens of U.S. soldiers were being held captive by the Nazis after an inexplicable and devastating attack on their camp, and we had to do something about it. The tension in the East was growing, and we had to get them out before the next advance began. When our advance scout came back, Sergeant Miller's face was etched with terror as he spoke. Whatever he had seen in Dresden was horrifying enough to have driven him mad. He sobbed and stammered as he tried to conjure up a few words. Somehow, the Nazis seemed less terrifying to him. Something was there, in the woods. It was waiting for us. It ripped and tore with its bare hands. Oh, God! Its eyes, its eyes were so dark, and yet, and yet, lit by the glow of barely contained stars, points of light. According to Miller, a terrifying creature had attacked their camp, laying waste to whatever stood in its path. A bare handful of them had managed to escape from this creature, only to be captured by the enemy. It was difficult to believe his words, but the fear on his face was real. We knew that we would have to be cautious, and there were still dozens of soldiers held by the Wehrmacht, and our mission was to get them out and investigate the strange occurrence. The moon was riding high and full as we forded the Elbe River. It had taken an awful lot of time and resources to outfit and plan this mission, but finally, by air, sea, and land, we had made it. It was time to let the boys know what they were walking into. All right, men, buckle up. We are now in enemy territory. The mission is simple. We infiltrate the Nazi camp east of Dresden and get the boys and move out. This is a covert operation, so no loud noises. Also, keep alert for any sign of Miller's claims. If those bastards are working on some sort of new weapon, we need to know. They all nodded in understanding, although I could see clearly the terror in their eyes. The echoes of Miller's words still plagued their thoughts. We were walking right into the belly of the beast totally oblivious of what was to come. Jack was like a son to me. His father had died in my arms in the trenches of the First Great War. We were both fresh into the army and had both been sent to the front lines in the battle against Bulgaria. Only one of us returned home. Jack had decided to enlist for the army in honor of his dead father, despite ferocious protests from his mother, but his mind was made up. Therefore, I often felt as though he was my responsibility. You alright, boy? 
Jack seemed unusually quiet. He knew I was coming. Yes, sir. He replied calmly and returned his gaze to the ebb and flow of the river. We soon set foot on land and wasted no time as we snaked our way into the woods, hidden under the blanket of night. The Elbe had helped us to journey into Dresden unnoticed, and all that separated us from the east of the city was a thick forest. Miller might have just been our best guide, but he didn't seem totally sane the last time I saw him. We were five in number, and I was their captain. In all my years in the service, this is one mission that will never fade from memory. We had taken a shorter route through the trees, and after about half an hour of walking, we arrived at the gates of the camp where they were being held. The forest was surprisingly easier to navigate than we had thought, but when we came to the camp, things were too quiet. Remember, boys, keep your heads down and stay frosty. Something doesn't feel right about this place. I immediately grabbed my radio and tuned it to our specific frequency. This is Captain Floyd speaking. Do you copy? I spoke into the radio with urgency, but all we received back was a strange static noise. I decided to try again. This is Captain Floyd speaking. Do you copy? Nothing. <sighs> Signals jammed, I declared, breathing heavily. We continued to march slowly into the camp, and it was Jack's sudden gasp that drew my attention to the gruesome sight. Motherfucker. Jack let out in terror. He was already visibly trembling. We had our answer all right. Bodies were strewn all through the camp, Americans and Germans alike. Whatever had just ravaged this place was neither on our side nor theirs. This was something different. Oh shit! Another soldier cried out from behind. We're all gonna fucking die here! What, what, what could have done this? Jack stammered as he continued to stare in dread. Jack was a good kid. This was his first field mission. And in my heart, I prayed for it not to be his last. There was an eerie feeling which clouded the entire camp. It was too quiet. Not a single sound. Even the birds had fallen silent. All that could be heard was the howling of the cold winter breeze. It sent shivers down my spine as I thought of the next command. In the midst of the thick silence, a loud thud sounded at the far edge of the clearing. Whatever had just walked into camp was definitely something large and heavy. I didn't think anyone wanted to stick around to find out what it was. From the manner in which the bodies appeared, Sergeant Miller's tale soon began to haunt our consciousness. Run. Find cover. That was my order. Everyone immediately turned, on instinct, racing back into the forest from which we had just emerged. Nothing had been chasing us, but we rarely noticed the fear was so great. Almost animalistic. We'd been running for at least five minutes when we noticed a soldier was missing. Just then, deafening screams erupted from the far end of the forest towards the camp. The screams echoed loudly into the night. Even the dead would have surely shut their ears. I thought he was right behind us. I barked as I paced around. Come on, let's keep moving. We have to make it to the other side of this forsaken forest. We were running for our lives and nothing else mattered. We needed to get out of the forest as soon as we could. Is it just me? Or does this place seem a little larger now than when we entered? We all came to a halt. As we tried to catch our breaths, I took a quick look around. We missed it. I finally let out. Missed what, sir? Jack asked cautiously. We missed the goddamn road. I angrily let out. How could I have missed the road? Now more than ever. But sir, I clapped my right hand over Jack's mouth. Shh. Listen. Something was moving between the leaves. I swallowed hard as we turned our backs towards each other, aiming all around us and ready to shoot at anything that came out from the dark and hollow paths. 
we began to retreat, slowly, away from the sound. When we bumped into something else, we all turned on instinct. A massive, cone-like structure stood before us. I'd never seen anything like it. It was obviously not of this world. An ominous noise emanated from within the strange object as we breathed heavily. I had heard of aliens, ancient monsters, and unknown aircraft, but I never believed in them. But here I was, staring at this massive, otherworldly structure. It hovered in the darkness, emitting strange vapors. My curious eyes examined the spaceship from the ground to its top. Standing right on top of this object was a strange creature. I swallowed hard and stepped away from the ship, adjusting my gun toward the alien. Sir, Jack said calmly. Six o'clock. Of course there were more than one. Two more appeared on top of the ship, and Jack had just alerted me of another behind us. Tears already fell from Jack's eyes as the Grim Reaper watched at the corner of my subconscious. No, not today, I declared as I grabbed a grenade and swung it up at the ship. It exploded in front of the trio, throwing them off balance, causing them to topple down the conical surface of the ship. I shifted my gaze towards the incoming threat behind us as we all fired in unison towards it, screaming at the top of our lungs. I had earlier heard calm waves northeast of our location, and we had just bought a little time to continue our race for survival, and I took it. I grabbed Jack by the arm and pulled him towards me as we both sprinted further out into the woods. I had no idea what I was going to do, even if we got to the river alive, but there didn't seem to be any better option. Captain Floyd, do you copy? A husky voice erupted from my radio receiver. The screams of one of my soldiers echoed behind us, but we kept on running. Requesting immediate evac now. Location... Bank of Elb River. That was all I could say. The urgency in my voice was clear, and whoever was at the other end of the line had probably heard the previous scream. How many choppers do you need? I didn't have time for unnecessary questions, but I had to get the message clear. Bring everything you've got down here. Copy, sir. We finally understood. We arrived at the bank of the river, but the aliens were right behind us. Our boat was still far off some distance away, and we would surely be dead before we reached it. I had lost two good men already, and somehow I hoped that the evacuation team was going to get to us before the creatures did. They were now five in number. They had slowed down too, circling us as predator to prey. The hunters had just become the hunted. I could now see them more clearly. They all had deep, dark, sunken eyes. They appeared like massive humanoid wolves with powerful jaws and arms. Like some kind of misbegotten freak of nature. They all launched at once towards us. Our guns had been totally useless against them, and we were left defenseless. I held Jack closely. It was hope for a miracle. Out of nowhere, loud shots rained down behind us at the creatures. The soldiers opened fire from all sides. I was so grateful. They had come just in time. Our reinforcements managed to drop one of the creatures, and the rest immediately retreated into the forest. I stared down into the vast sea of branches from above, from my vantage point within the evac chopper, which carried us away from that dreadful place. After I was discharged, after the war, I left my home in Milwaukee and settled down in Nevada. Open horizons. No forests. Free from the icy breath of winter. I will never leave home again. The year is 3001. 
and humans have achieved the wonders to become a type 2 civilization on the Kardashev scale. Humans have achieved wonders in the field of science and technology. You can stand at any street and start turning your head from left to right and see cyborgs, smart robots, flying vehicles, smart infrastructure. Heck, you can even find devices that convert animal languages into human speech. Amongst all of this, the only thing that you will not find is a trace of actual humanity and a complete human. It is very rare to find a human without any technological replacement. I am one of the very few humans left on Earth. Just like the white rhinoceros that went extinct in 2021, a complete human is also on the verge of extinction. And the only thing stopping that process is the need of more humans to continue the chain of existence. It's very difficult for me as a normal human to find a job in this era. They don't even need labors these days. All thanks to these brainless robots tasked to do all the hard work. The most I can do is sell my creativity, which is very cheap these days. I was walking across a city where I came across an old fashioned advertisement. The advertisement was very bizarre looking. No one does advertisement on paper like a pamphlet and stick it on the wall these days. I read the paper and it stated, Hello to all the remaining humans. I come in peace. I am here for your salvation in the era of artificial intelligence, cyborgs, science, and technology. All of you are welcome to my garden where you can spend quality time with other humans and enjoy life as if you were living a thousand years ago. I welcome you all to a place where humans will be treated like humans, where you can multiply your happiness and desire. Well, that was odd. I said to myself, at the end of the ad was an address and some contact info to a garden called The Womb. I folded the piece of paper and put it in my pocket. After a tiresome day, I went home and found myself reading that paper again. Yet again, the eeriness of the advertisement intermixed with the joyous message gave me very unnerving vibes. I decided to directly visit the address. Maybe I'll find more humans like me and feel, I don't know, some kind of happiness or, gosh, it sounds dumb, or joy. The next day I woke up, dressed myself in my best outfit and went to the address on the paper. It took me about two hours to get there. The entrance was nothing like I expected. There were great high concrete walls, like a facility or industry with security cameras and a huge metal gate with a small gate for people to enter, and a guard at the entrance. Oh, I questioned my decision. My gut told me not to go in, but then I brushed the feeling off by telling myself, there's no need to worry. Obviously, it is a human-only place. It needs protection and security from, I don't know, from bad things. At the entrance, the guard asked me to go through this machine, and it was this high-tech detector, which would detect if there was any technology embedded inside of me. But in my case, there was none. So, I went in. There was a long, hospital-like corridor, and at the end, there was a door. And when I entered that door, the view was mesmerizing. I have never seen a garden in my life before. I don't know what an actual garden was, but whatever I saw there, it was beautiful. Luscious, green grass, apple and peach trees, beautiful flowers, birds chirping, and the most important thing, actual, real, complete humans, hundreds of them. I was in awe and astonished by this place. Why did no one ever talk to me about this before? And that was the first question that came to my mind. I started to roam around, and I met this really cute guy named Jason. Jason and I started to talk about different topics. The more we talked, the more connection we felt. 
Everything was so lovely about this place. I knew this place was man-made and not natural, yet it felt so amazing. It was meant to be like this realistic experience. So realistic that there were mosquitoes around. Mosquitoes went extinct years ago, but somehow they managed to develop artificial mosquitoes that sting like the real ones. Maybe? I, I didn't second guess anything about it, but it was annoying as hell. After spending some more quality time with Jason and walking around, I decided to bid him farewell and go home. After all, this was just a facade. As I started to walk back, I didn't find an exit. Maybe I was lost in the garden. I started to walk around in search of the exit. I asked a couple of people, but to my surprise, no one knew about any exit. So I went to Jason and asked him how to get the hell out of here, but he knew nothing. And he said the most bizarre thing. This is my home. Why do you want me to find a way out? I live here. You see that cottage? That's my crib. In that moment, I got the chills and oh, I realized my gut was right. This place is not right. And then the name started to hit me. The Womb. Why would anyone give a garden such a weird name? There was something wrong here. I started to run in one direction. Maybe I find a wall or an end or something. I ran and ran and ran. There was no sky or sun. The room was at the perfect temperature. Although I was sprinting, there was no sweat on my body. I finally found a wall that felt like it was made up of glass. I looked around to find anything. I was desperate. I decided to climb the highest tree in hopes of finding something via bird's eye view. I climbed the tree and saw a nest on the tree. There were eggs in it, but those eggs were not ordinary. I started to explore the nest and eggs, and to my surprise, there was a hidden camera in it. We were being monitored. There could be hundreds of cameras around. I was desperate to look for an exit. I wanted to go home, no matter how bad it was. I climbed higher on the tree. I stayed hidden in the leaves so that I can witness any suspicious activity. I stayed there for a long time. And then I saw Jason and a few other people walk towards the wall. They tapped on the wall in a passcode-like manner, and a door opened, and they went in. I was puzzled. Why did Jason lie to me? But why would he not? I mean, after all, we, we were just strangers. I had a pen phone on me and decided to record the next incident and see the passcode taps so that I can get the hell out of here. I did exactly what I planned and managed to get out of that area. As soon as I walked out of the garden, I found myself in a total 360 of the previous environment. It was, it, it was like a high-tech facility with state-of-the-art technology and equipment all around me monitoring each and every human inside. They were not just watching us, but they also had the biological fingerprint of all of us. But how did they get all of this? I just came here. Oh, and then it clicked. The fucking mosquitoes. They were gathering DNA samples off of us all that time. Although I had the urge to explore more, I knew I need to get out of there somehow. I found the nearest door and snuck out. What I saw outside the door shattered everything I knew about my existence and mankind. I saw thousands of pods filled with liquid and each pod had a human in it. There were rows on top of rows of such pods. Each pod had a specific code with the last digit varying. I walked across the room scared, shocked, and and then I saw a code with the code TESS3001 XVE-1 TESS TESS Huh Inside the pod I saw myself 
I rubbed my eyes, questioning my vision, and looked again, but I, I definitely saw myself in it. My name is Tessa Johns. The code had my initials in it. After a couple minutes of shock, I came back to my senses and connected all the dots, which was obvious. I was in a cloning factory, hence the name The Womb. I started walking around in a hunchback fashion so that no one sees me. Thousands of questions were in my mind. Why are they cloning humans? What is the purpose of this? What would they get out of making hundreds of the same person? Although we lived in 3001, it was still unethical to get someone's DNA and make clones of them. But how did this facility exist? I managed to get out of the chamber where they kept the clones and walked inside of a laboratory. Luckily, no one was there. I started to look around to find some map or blueprint of the area in hopes of finding a safety exit. Instead of finding that, I found some data on their system about their research and experiments. They were cloning humans to test on us like guinea pigs. There were videos of inhuman tests. They were chopping these clones alive to test their pain endurance. They were making them have forceful intercourse to test God knows what. They were chopping clones for their body parts and organs to sell them to hospitals. They were performing biomechanical experiments of these clones to develop new cyborg technologies. This was a human cloning factory where all sorts of unethical experiments were happening. They were treating these clones like livestock without having an ounce of care for them. These clones were living, breathing humans, but were treated worse than animals. As I was going through all this data, I felt a hand on my shoulder. I turned around and it was Jason. He looked at me with a cold smile and expressionless eyes. I mean, this person looked like Jason, but he was not the Jason I met in the garden. A clone? Perhaps? He looked me dead in the eyes and said, I knew you were smart, but I never expected you to come this far. Your DNA will be worth a lot. I can sell your creative genes and brain. People pay a very high price for such traits. Listening to him explaining the price point of my skills made me nauseous. I felt like life left my legs and I wanted to fall. I had information of something that was not known to the public. By knowing all of these details, I became a threat to this cloning organization. And at that moment, I knew they were not letting me go no matter what. I never found any map of the place, so I cannot make a desperate run. They had already developed my first clone. They were not going to let me go out. No missing case will be filed since they can let my clone out in the world. With no recollection of my past. like like amnesia. My life flashed before my eyes, and then I was made unconscious by one of the cyborg security guards. When I woke up, I found myself in a bizarre swimming pool. My body was connected with wires. I had the bare minimum clothes on my body. Only my head was above water, and the rest of my body was under this, this liquid. I woke up and saw Jason standing near the system to which I was connected to. He came to me and told me, your brain and genes are too precious. We couldn't kill you. You will stay here in this pool for the rest of your life. We will create an army of human clones for all sorts of testing. We will eradicate all the diseases, all the vulnerabilities that the human body has. I will create a new world, and I will be the atom for this next phase of humanity. I listened to his plan as I was trapped for eternity in this hellhole with no possible escape. There are no options for me right now. Or maybe there is a hope for an escape and stop Jason before his evil plan succeeded. I, I don't know. I, um, I felt a breeze of hope as I saw the tiniest escape possibility I had. Will I make it? Or will I die a hopeless death in a pool of liquid?
A loud shriek reverberated throughout the town like an earthquake, causing a ghostly chill to sink deeply into the spine of Havenwood. It was a dreadful night. The entire town was alive. The skies were darkened with thick smoke, and the voices of the inhabitants thundered throughout the entire vicinity. What is that dreadful noise? I whispered to myself, watching from a distance. Where am I? What's going on? Something appeared to be caught up in flames. Men bearing torches rushed to the site, rage and resentment evident on their faces. Trap it in the abyss! Don't let it escape! A few of them yelled. Trap what? I thought to myself. Gerald! Someone called out amidst the commotion, causing me to instantly turn on instinct. That was my grandfather's name. I was crouched at a distance away from the growing chaos, too scared to go any further. Wait a minute, this is Havenwood. My eyes widened in realization. I was now trembling in my boots. I glanced around to be sure that I wasn't just seeing things. Seal it! Seal it to the ground now! The flames erupted and turned bright purple. This was no normal flame. I can now pick out a form in the darkness. Engulfed in purple flames was a humanoid tree-like structure. Its screams were like the sound of long fingernails scraping across a rough metal. Ugh. I clasped my palms around my ears, attempting to shut out the disturbing noise. Don't do this! This creature has done nothing wrong! You all pushed it to the edge! Grandpa Gerald cried out at the top of his voice, but everyone seemed to ignore him. One of the town folks strode towards him and pushed him to the ground. Although he looked much younger, I knew it was him. The wind stood still for a moment, and I could feel something moving in the empty space. In a quick zap, I was standing just a few feet away from the creature, wondering what had just happened. My heart screamed in fear, but my lips remained sealed. I glanced around, trembling when I noticed that the entire crowd could not see me. But I could see the creature more clearly now. It was terrifying. Several scaly spines protruded from its body. It had two humanoid arms and many massive root-like structures that curled out from beneath it. Everything on its body curled and swirled, like some sort of reptilian tail, or maybe a snake of some sort. A bright red light emanated from what looked like its head. I will return. I will watch you all burn. I will have my vengeance. The creature growled, followed by a loud shriek. What the fuck? I mused. I was still transfixed by what the creature had said. When I felt a jolt of pain on my leg, I could feel something coil itself below me. A crimson stain trickled from my feet. <sighs> I started breathing heavily and instantly shifted my gaze towards the creature. It was staring right back at me with intent. My mouth, wide open in shock. It could see me. Michael! Someone barked. It was Grandpa Gerald. He could see me too. His voice filled with desperation. He now had a gun in his hands. He cracked a loud shot towards my leg, blasting the creature off me. The creature had pierced my leg, causing me to bleed. A certain group of people circled around the terrifying beast. I could hear one of them reciting a few words from a massive book that lay lifelessly in his hands. Whatever he was saying seemed to be plunging the creature deep into the ground. They were attempting to trap it in the heart of Havenwood. Go, Michael! You are not meant to be here! Grandpa Gerald screamed. The soul devourer will return. Discover the truth. Right our wrongs. He continued. The last shall become the first. But I don't know how to get out. I replied. Just open your eyes. He yelled. Wake up. Open your eyes. Open my eyes? I asked curiously. Wake up, Michael. This time it wasn't Grandpa's voice. It was my father's. I jerked back in shock and was greeted by a familiar sight. Thick darkness. I was born with a cataract, and I eventually lost my sight when I was only eight. Fifteen years have passed since I saw the beautiful sky, and the only solace I have found are my dreams and imaginations. 
I could feel my bed covered in sweat. My heart was racing. My legs were trembling as I attempted to catch my breath. I could hear Grandpa's words reverberating in my consciousness. The soul devourer will return. Discover the truth. Right our wrongs. What does this mean? I let out calmly. What did you see in your dream? My sister, Martily, asked curiously. I, I met Grandpa. Something is coming. The soul... The soul devourer is coming! Son, did you just say soul devourer? My father spoke with a slight panic evident in his voice. Dad, have, have you heard of it before? Martily asked. That was all my father ever spoke about. He replied. Dad was now on his feet and I could hear his footsteps fade out of the room. It was probably just a dream. Go back to bed, Michael. I tucked myself under my blanket. Something was definitely not right and my father had a hunch about what was going on. If anything was coming into town, he would definitely be the first person to find out. Besides, he is the sheriff of Havenwood. Sleep had evaded me and several thoughts raced through my mind. <sighs> what could a blind 23-year-old lad do anyway? I said to myself. But this was no coincidence. It, it felt too real to be just a dream. A loud bang erupted from the living room. Someone slammed the door and rushed into the house. I jolted out of my bed in shock, which caused me to fall off and my head came crashing against the wooden floor. Ugh. I groaned in pain, forcing myself up and reached for my walking stick. Those were my father's footsteps and he was rushing towards my room. I wonder how much time had passed since I dozed off again. Michael, what did the creature look like in your dream? I could hear the doorknob turn. Um, it had tree-like spines protruding from different sides of its body. It, it also had slithery extensions which stemmed out of its lower sides. It, is everything okay, Dad? The patrol team discovered something strange in the early hours of this morning. Two corpses were lying very close to the outskirts of town. They looked like all their blood had been drained out, but that is not the shocking part. My father paused as if trying to recount the troubling event. What's wrong, Dad? Something slithery was growing at a rapid pace from within them. When, when we found them. It, it was a gruesome sight. My father sounded like he had seen a ghost. Martily soon joined us. She had overheard our conversation before stepping in. Dad, what do you know about the Soul Devourer? The air went still for a while. But after a moment of silence, my father began to speak. The year was 1964. A group of hunters from Havenwood discovered the debris of a crashed aircraft. According to your grandfather, it wasn't a normal aircraft. At least, none that he knew of. You both know that Grandpa Gerald served in the Air Force and NASA for decades before his retirement. So, if there were anyone who knew a lot about planets and spacecraft, it would definitely be him. Whatever they saw in those woods was not from Earth. They decided to explore further and it wasn't long before they stumbled on a dozen tree-like creatures. They were all dead, or so they thought. Grandpa Gerald returned the next day with his friend Grant. They both discovered two similar creatures in the wreck. They appeared much smaller than their deceased counterparts. They decided to take one of the creatures each and swore oaths of secrecy to each other. But why is it called the Soul Devourer? Martily seemed to be engrossed in Dad's tale. According to Grandpa, that wasn't always its name. Almost a decade strolled by and the duo kept the truth about the creatures away from the townsfolk. But unlike Grandpa, Grants had become corrupted by greed and chose a cruel path. They had both discovered that the creatures had special abilities. They could shapeshift. This made it easy to hide them in plain sight. The creatures could also revive and give life to nature and... Calling all units. At 211 at 506 Central Market. Several shots fired. Backup needed. My father's radio blared out. I have to go. I'll tell you the rest of the story over dinner. Those were the next words that strolled out of his lips as he sped out of my room. You going out today, Michael? Martily asked calmly. Nah, I 
think I'm just gonna go back to bed. Maybe I'll have another dream explaining to me what Grandpa meant by discover the truth. All right, if you need me, you know what to do. I'm gonna go get a few things from the supermarket downtown. All right, sis, love you. My sister hurried out of my room and several thoughts began to flood my mind. It was only about a few minutes after she left when my heart began to pound. I could feel a strange presence in the room, but I couldn't see. I attempted to stand up from my bed when I heard a loud thud in front of me. Who's there? I was certain something was standing right in front of me. I could feel the adrenaline pumping into my body. I reached for my walking stick and swerved it all around me. Who's there? I barked again. Despite my feeling of helplessness, I had to remain bold. I sat calmly on my bed, staring at the pitch blackness of my blindness, when a slimy fluid dropped on my arm. I could hear something snaking its way all over my room. My best guess was that whatever I had seen earlier in my dreams had come to finish me off. The soul devourer was here. What do you want from me? I've done nothing wrong! I was almost in tears, but I fought back every scent of weakness that my fragile mind was trying to stir up. Okay, Michael. At the count of three, rush towards the door. I thought to myself. I knew what direction my door was. One. Two. Three! I was caught short by the feeling of something slimy, coiling itself around my shoulders. I was sure of what it was now. After all, something similar had coiled around my feet in the dream the previous night. My heavy breaths were now racing, faster than my heartbeat. I grabbed my walking stick and drove it in the direction of the creature. It came in contact with something, followed by a loud screech. The soul devourer wrapped its slimy tentacles around my neck and flung me towards the wall. I felt my body shiver under the force of the impact. <coughs> I groaned and coughed in pain. Suddenly, my door flung open. Get down! I did not need to be told twice. I darted towards the sound of the voice and lay flat on my face. A loud shot blasted instantly, followed by three other consecutive shots. It was a shotgun. A large amount of goo splashed all over me, covering my entire face. The creature screeched and roared, but it was definitely not down yet. Two hefty hands grabbed me and pulled me out of the room and shut the door. I could hear the door being torn down behind me, but that was not what I was bothered about. My face! I yelled. Ah! Oh, the man continued to fire several rounds towards the incoming threat. I had my hands on my face crying in pain. We need to go, Michael! I dropped my hands from my face, and the pain was gone. But something else had happened. My jaw dropped in utter shock. I can see! I yelled. I can see! Well, good for you. But I think you will have more than enough time to celebrate later. The strange man yelled, pointing his index finger towards whatever was coming. I followed his finger, and my eyes were received by familiar sight. The soul devourer. Its dark red eyes. A tree-like body and massive snake-like legs filled the whole place. It had spines protruding out of its entire body. I shifted my gaze back towards the strange man. Who are you? I asked. I is this the dream? This is not the right time to ask stupid questions, boy. This is no dream. Now get your stupid ass up and run! I jumped to my feet and followed the man. I was still getting adopted to using my eyes to navigate around after over a decade. I stumbled several times, but I got back up and continued each time. Quick! Into the car! The man declared. He jumped into the driver's seat and started the engine. I flung the door open and joined him at the passenger side. The car instantly sprung into life and sped into the street, leaving tire marks all over the lawn. I could see the soul devourer emerge from the house through the rear mirror. We need to find the truth. The strange man let out as he sped further. Black Ponytail sat beautifully on his round head, his clean-shaven beard highlighting his well-sculpted face. He had a set of dark, watchful eyes. He was obviously not from around here. 
truth? Discover the truth! I mused. What do you mean? I had a dream last night. I met my grandfather. He asked me to discover the truth. What is the truth? That's what my father called it. It is the only thing that can kill this beast. He hid it somewhere in his laboratory. I have a hunch about where he hid it. He left me clues before his death. He always knew that this creature was going to return. He made me promise to take it down whenever it did. I'm Thomas, by the way. The creature had stopped chasing us. It, it simply just vanished into thin air. Loud sirens echoed in the distance, and a fleet of police cars could be seen speeding in our direction. As they drew closer, Thomas suddenly hit the brakes and swerved the car, blocking the road. The incoming fleet of police cars came to a sudden halt, and several officers, including my father, rushed out. Thomas stepped out, waving towards them. I noticed a look of surprise on my father's face. I may have been blind for over a decade, but I recognized my father immediately after I saw him. He had grown really old since the last time I saw him. I couldn't wait to see my sister, Martily. They would be ecstatic about the news of my sight. Tom, I thought you were dead. My father let out, a wide smile growing across his lips. I just had a few businesses to attend to. They both walked up to each other and embraced each other. So they knew each other, I whispered, still seated in the car. I'm sorry, but we have to go. We heard an emergency distress call. Something crazy has been going on around town in the last few days. My son is in danger. Come on, we could use a pair of extra hands. Oh, don't worry about that. Your son is safe. The distress call? That was me. Your son was attacked by the Soul Devourer. <laughs> I think he has an interesting surprise for you, too. Thomas smirked before moving ahead to greet the other officers. I stepped out of the car and my father rushed towards me and embraced me. <sighs> Are you alright, son? Yeah. You look exhausted, Dad. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> Wait. What? How do you know that? He turned abruptly as a wide grin formed on my face. You can see? I nodded in affirmation. H How? I, I don't know, Dad. A goo from the Soul Devourer splashed all over my face and I began to see. Of course. That explains it. What do you mean? I asked curiously. Not here. I'll explain when we get home. I don't think you guys will be going home tonight. We have work to do. Besides, your house is in ruins. Oh. Oof. So, what do we do, Tom? There was a look of anxiety spread across my father's face. He looked exhausted. We recorded another two deaths, similar to two others we found earlier. It's getting out of hand. We need to stop this creature. Tom was probably an inch taller than my father. He had a croaky voice. He always spoke with a certain confidence. Hmm. We need to find the truth. It's the only way. He began. I believe your son has an important role to play in all of this, although I'm not quite sure what. He claims to have had a dream about the truth last night. It's just as our fathers told us. The Soul Devourer swore to return to have its vengeance. Your father's? I was burning with curiosity and I needed to know. Come on, get in the car. Thomas motioned to my father. We'll explain everything on the way. Where to? My father inquired. To my father's lab. I thought that was destroyed years ago. My father had received enough surprises for one day. That's what he wanted everyone to think. <laughs> Thomas smiled. I looked out the window and shifted my gaze towards the orange sky as the car sped along the highway. Evening was fast approaching. It was a beautiful sight. The last time I witnessed such a beauty was 15 years ago. The birds dancing to the rhythm of the winds and the elegant golden fingers of the evening sun. Grandpa and his father Grant were friends. My father began. Oh, the son of Grandpa's friend. 
I whispered under my breath. Yes. Just like I said in the morning. The soul devourer has healing abilities. It can cure almost any disease. That must have been why your sight was restored. Gerald and Grant discovered this, and this forced Grandpa to withdraw deeper into the shadows. He knew what men could do if they got their hands on Little John. Little John? I asked. Yeah. The soul devourer shapeshifted into a young boy. Grandpa called him Little John. Their bond grew as the years sped by. Grandpa soon had a misunderstanding with Grant. Grant felt the world needed to benefit from the healing abilities of the creatures, but Grandpa warned of the danger it posed. But Grant was just too blind by his thirst for discovery. He ignored Grandpa and continued with his research. They never told Little John that there was another creature like it in Havenwood. Thomas continued the tale. Little John unearthed the truth and went in search of it, but stumbled on a troubling discovery instead. Even Grandpa was not aware. Grant had established an underground laboratory in the heart of Havenwood that employed gruesome methods to extract the healing serum from the other creature. He called it the Elixir of Life. My father operated in secrecy, trading the healing serum to elite figures in Havenwood and extending it to different parts of the world. Little John was disheartened to watch the only thing he could call family being treated in such a manner, bound in chains and surrounded by scientists and equipment. It went rogue transforming into the creature you saw today. And it took all the effort of Grandpa to calm it down, but it came at a heavy price. Little John had transformed into its true form, the soul devourer as everyone called him, wreaking havoc upon Havenwood and eventually bringing down the laboratory, but it lost its kin in the process. So what happened to Little John? Grandpa left Havenwood for Little John. He knew that they would come after him, and they did. My father, Ran, discovered a way to trap the soul devourer into the earth through sorcery, but still be able to extract his serum. He managed to deceive the townsfolk who were blinded by anger to exert his perfect plan. Something, of course, went wrong. The soul devourer was trapped, but my father never got his serum. The soul devourer vowed to return to have its vengeance. We soon arrived at the laboratory and stormed in. The entire place was destroyed and reeked of fear. Follow me, Thomas declared in a hushed tone. My father built a secret compartment beneath his lab. He had something precious to hide. It would definitely be down there. A shadow suddenly raced past us. My heart must have stopped for a moment as I swallowed hard. Keep your eyes open. We are not alone down here, my father whispered. We could hear loud rumblings in the distance. A storm was approaching. It was already the early hours of the night, and the entire place was covered in thick darkness. Could this day get any worse? I thought. This is it, Thomas said. So? How do we get it open? There was an uneasy look on my father's face as he spoke. Well, I don't know. Thomas let out a tiny smirk on his face. You are kidding, right? I could still see the look of shock on my father's face despite the darkness. You mean you brought us all this way and you're not even sure about how to get it open? A low shriek sounded in front of us, causing Thomas and my dad to fire several rounds towards the direction of the sound. After a moment, they both stopped shooting. The last shall become the first. Right our wrongs, I yelled. Ruby eyes suddenly appeared in the darkness. Thomas and my father began to shoot continuously. He failed to notice that the door had slid open. The soul devourer emerged from within the darkness and approached them. I already jumped into the secret bunker. Dad! I yelled. Jump in! My dad and Thomas rushed towards the door, but just as Thomas was about to jump in, he was caught by one of the snake-like projections of his feet. Just go! Thomas yelled. Find the truth! Uh, finish the work! I shut the door, and there it was, sitting in plain sight. A massive book sat lifelessly on a table right in front of us. On its cover was boldly written, The Truth. A sword with several inscriptions on it also lay calmly beside the book. I searched the book for any hidden knowledge, and I soon found a few inscriptions written inside. As I read the inscriptions written on that page, the sword 
began to glow. I exchanged glances with my father. I continued to read out the words and the sword kept on glowing. After a few moments of waiting, my father pushed the door open. The soul devourer was still there. I'm sorry, little John. My father let out before plunging the sword deep into its chest. The creature gave a loud screech before getting engulfed in flames. Whew. Well, that wasn't such an epic ending, but it did work. It was Thomas. Come on, Thomas. Let's get the hell out of here. My father said calmly as we all strolled out of the laboratory. Hey, Creepypasta fans, it's Joseph. Thanks for listening. To connect with us and support us, make sure to check out our Discord and Patreon links in the description. And remember, stay cosmic. Lucas. Lucas. I heard a voice calling my name over and over again. I heard it distantly, at first, as if I was underwater, and someone was whispering on the surface, Lucas! It was me. I was yelling my own name. I was just remembering it, and I was, in fact, underwater. In a flash, I came back to my senses, and everything started making sense at an alarming pace. My body acted on pure instinct. My brain was fully in survival mode. I didn't care about who I was and what had happened to me. My entire being was focused on one thing only, surviving. Despite my widely scattered thoughts, my great confusion, the unfamiliar feeling of my body suddenly waking up and a really strange feeling around my neck, I started swimming. I was completely lost at first, but when I saw a light, I moved desperately toward it. I flailed and I moved my arms and legs so aggressively they started aching and my lungs started to burn. I was just starting to fear I wouldn't make it. I would drown right then and there without even knowing why I was in the water in the first place. Then finally, I made it to the surface. That first intake of breath was glorious, but there was also something terribly ominous about it. Because with clear lungs and feeling mildly out of danger, my brain hurried to catch me up on everything I had ignored so far. The shock of the realization was so strong that I felt faint. I went limp and went underwater again for a second before my brain recovered once more. Instead of staying afloat until my brain short-circuited again, I started swimming to the closest shore. The steady movement of my limbs was somewhat soothing and it allowed me to think about what the hell had happened to me. My memories flash behind my eyes. War. That's the first thing that came to my mind. A war had been going on for months? Years? It hardly mattered because it was going to be an endless war. Because there was no goal but complete world domination. And last I remember, they were doing really well. It all started with a man, a scientist, a mad scientist, as some people used to call him. Raymond Hollis was an English scientist expelled from every reputable university laboratory, and company. After a little too many failed experiments that went against the law, against morality, or against common fucking sense. He didn't give up though, but at first, it seemed that he did. The infamous man disappeared for years. Nobody knew more about him until, one day, a strange riot started up in Belgium. The authorities struggled to stop it because not only the people involved fought with the ferocity of beasts that have nothing to lose, but after a while, the police switched sides, and eventually, so did the military. In a matter of days, Belgium was under the control of a single man 
and his very particular army. Before mass media was neutralized, the images of the riots showed all the people wearing black masks over half of their faces. But when the few images and videos were further analyzed, and when this lethal army started crossing over the Belgian borders, we all saw it. People's faces weren't covered with simple masks. There was something unknown and unexplainable covering their faces. As the army grew and this mad villain started taking over France first, we learned so much more and we learned everything the hard way. Raymond Hollis had created, despite warnings, logic, and all the odds, a substance that infiltrates the human brain to deprive the subjects of their free will. The result? <laughs> he could turn anybody into a perfect soldier that would obey his every wish. We didn't know much more about this creation. We didn't have time. The world entered a state of collective panic. Other countries sent their armies to help France and then Germany, but one after the other. Everyone died to join that mindless army. And then, and then, and then my memories were over. I reached the shore. I lay on the sand, and my hands shook as I moved them to my neck. There it was, the mask, the weapon, the mind-numbing substance. I immediately started crying when I realized what had happened. I was captured. I was recruited. Who, who knows for how long I served that fucking army. But why was I conscious again? My hands desperately reached for my neck and gripped that intruding presence and yanked it away hard. I was surprised that it worked. I pulled it away from me and threw it at the ground. I was breathing heavily. And I recoiled from it, fearing it would get me again. However, nothing happened. And the more I stared at it, the more some things started making sense. When people talked about a mind-controlling substance, we pictured maybe a virus in a pill that you would have to ingest. But this thing, it looked alive. Well, at the moment it looked dead. I took a risk and stepped on it lightly with my foot. The thing expelled dirty water from its pores. It spasmed and spewed more water, but finally rested limply on the sand. It frighteningly resembled a squid, but it was a deep black unlike any other living thing. That was it. This thing had been alive. It wasn't a mask. It was a scientifically created organism that adhered itself to people's faces, and that's when they lost all real consciousness. But that didn't matter as much as what I had discovered. This thing, being alive, could also die. When I was drowning, it drowned before me. And now I was free, but was I, really? I had my free will and consciousness back, but this also meant that I noticed the sound of footsteps approaching and knew I had to be afraid. I considered running away, but weren't we at war? Wouldn't that give them a reason to kill me? I looked up and saw two silhouettes getting closer and closer. I looked around me for the first time and took note of my surroundings. I was in a river. There was a bridge above and a long line of people crossing it. I suspected I fell from it. Then there were those two people getting even closer now close enough for me to see the tense and identical way in which they moved, and the black mass that covered half of their faces. Was this thing really dead? I acted on impulse and picked up the black squid-like thing. It really felt lifeless on my hands. It was damp and cold, but still somewhat sticky. So when the strangers were near, I took a deep breath and held it in as I stuck that creature on my face again. It was a disgusting feeling, and I struggled to make it work, but it eventually stuck. I placed it slightly under my nose, just in case, but nothing happened, nothing at all this time. I was still me. I still had my consciousness. Soldier, one of the strangers greeted me with an emotionless voice. 
confirm if you are dead or alive. I'm, uh, I'm alive. I stuttered, overcome with fear. Follow us back to the line. We are going back to the headquarters for the night, he stated. Soldiers must not leave the line. Soldiers must follow orders at all times. Every display of individuality must be eradicated immediately. The second soldier started reciting a series of orders as they walked me back to the line. Soldiers must never try to take off their masks. Civilians will be ignored unless identified as threats. Soldiers must remain stationary until receiving an order. Soldiers must not leave the line. Soldiers must never try to take off their masks. He went on and on, and I took the opportunity to study their faces. Two completely normal men, except for the black, gooey mask covering their mouth and nose. It could be their own breathing, sure, but from my own point of view, it looked like that invasive organism was breathing, filling up with air and exhaling, unlike the limp thing stuck over my mouth. One of them just repeated orders again and again, but the other one, the first one, had a sort of earpiece on his right ear. I guess that's where he received his own personal instructions to deliver to this brainless crowd around him. I was reasonably nervous as I joined the lines of a thousand mindless soldiers. However, I soon realized that lack of free will will also mean nobody around me noticed things that weren't part of their orders. So nobody noticed I looked and acted differently. Nobody reacted. Nobody noticed me. The realization was bone chilling. There I was, walking among hundreds of people, and I was taken as meaningless. I... I don't know what's worse. Being one of these mind-controlled soldiers, or having realized that I'm the only one who broke free from being controlled. They look to be from all genders, ages, body types, ethnicities, and walks of life. Yet, none of that mattered now. The people they used to be didn't matter anymore. They were soldiers. They were nothing but bodies dragged into war without their consent, without so much as their awareness. Huh. Who knew how many had died already? Who knew what our homes were like anymore? Our brains certainly had been used and neutralized. It was an unimaginable fate. It was a world without souls. The sound of countless footsteps falling rhythmically over the bridge was beyond unsettling. Their empty eyes, their helplessness. But halfway through the bridge, I noticed a considerable hole in the wood underneath us. That must have been where I fell down. I could have died, but really, that fall saved me. Almost drowning killed the monstrosity over my face, and I was approaching that one in a lifetime opportunity again. But I didn't need it anymore. What about the people around me though? What could I do with this knowledge? What can I do with my freedom? What can I do for a world that consumes itself in a war without goals and without a finish line? How can I be I of service to humanity if it lost everything that made it human? When I reached the opening on the floor of the bridge, I took an extra step to discreetly push the person in front of me down to the water. They knocked the broken wooden panel, but started falling down. I stopped to watch them fall, and it made the person walking behind me knock against my back in a split-second decision. I took them by the shoulders, wondered about who they were behind the mask, and pushed them to the hole on the bridge too. When I heard the body splashing on the water, it sounded like freedom. I didn't have time. Every display of individuality must be eradicated immediately. The high-ranked soldiers would show up at any second and shoot me without hesitation. But this was all I had. I took my only chance, my last hope, and started pushing people down to the water. Let them fall down the hole, push them over the edge of the bridge, drag them down as many as I could, as fast as I could. I was barely starting to remember my life, where I'm from, my childhood, the face of my mother, my best friend's birthday, my favorite coffee shop. I was throwing people over the bridge, wondering about their names, their favorite movies, their dreams and nightmares. 
if they ever fell in love and the lives they had. When the soldiers started shooting me, there was no salvation for me. But as I started to lose my consciousness, this time forever, I could hear splashes below me, people swimming to the shore, people like me realizing the catastrophe around me, people coming together to connect the dots. I was dying, and humanity's hope was only waking up. The legends say that every 30 years, it awakens to devour the souls of little children, I continued. The air was soaked in thick silence as the children listened to my scary midnight tale. I could see the terror on their faces as I let out a little chuckle. Melody approached quietly from behind. Gah! She let out a frightening yell as all the children screamed in unison and fled away from the sound of her voice. Melody! Sad let out in a frustrated tone as their screams slowly turned into a roar of laughter. <laughs> I raised my hand to give her a high five as she proceeded to sit in my lap. I was proud of my daughter. She was the most cheerful child ever, and I was just glad as anything to have Melody as my daughter. I was just Bob Gray, the circus misfit, or uh, otherwise known as Pennywise the Dancing Clown, as they all called me. I hadn't been the best of fathers, and I didn't have a lot of money, but Melody had become my strength over the years. Intelligent, cheerful, and optimistic at all times, I'd do anything for my little girl. Dad, Melody asked, do you think the tales are true? Well, my father told me these stories when I was a kid, but of course, it was just a story. Couldn't possibly be real. <laughs> And no such things as monsters, but I had to keep the suspense alive amongst the kids. Well, we'll just have to find out, I said with a wide grin. Come on, kids, get some sleep. We have a busy day ahead of us tomorrow. I tucked them into their beds as I kissed them goodnight. Somewhere in the darkness of that night, not far away from the nondescript town of Derry, a strange darkness watched in silence, waiting and scheming for the right time to make a move. After three decades, it had awoken, and it was thirsty. Our circus acts had attracted a lot of attention in this town. Well, they seemed to love us, and had begged us the previous night to perform one last time before we moved on to the next destination. When we came into Derry, it seemed void of vibrance and life, but our little circus had brightened up many faces in just a few days. They didn't want us to leave, but we had to. Oh, they were very fun people to be with. They didn't have much to give, and I'm just Bob Gray, ringmaster and father to a bunch of orphans. I had to provide for them all. Dad! Dad! Maria is missing! My eyes snapped open as Melody's words fell upon my ears. It was morning. What? Did she just say, We searched the entire camp for Maria, but all we found was this. Melody pulled out a small doll and raised it toward my face. My heart instantly skipped a beat and began to race. It was covered in blood. Where'd you find this, Melody? In the woods close by, she replied. Blood was never a good sign. All right, kids, listen to me. Stay very close to the animals and do not let anyone out of your sight. No one should leave this place. I made my way into the woods where Melody had reportedly found Maria's doll. I breathed heavily as I made my way deeper and deeper. Birds had all gone silent, and the leaves of the trees stood as though they were waiting and watching in silence for something about to happen. 
All the hairs on my body stood up as I strolled deeper into the woods. I followed the obvious signs, broken branches, leaning leaves, my instincts, and finally, blood. I was still putting on my baggy suit of silver with orange pom-poms and a collar ruff, my favorite circus costume, accompanied by my trademark red hair. At this moment, I no longer resembled my usual self, but Pennywise, the dancing clown. Wait a minute. Blood, I mused. There were stains of blood on a tree right in front of me. Fear gripped me as I prepared for the obvious. I'd been a traveler for years, but I'd never been this terrified. I took a double take at the doll, which I held in my hand, and then shifted my gaze towards the tree. I traced the stain of blood, and my gaze followed the trunk of the tree upwards. Right there was Maria, dangling from one of the branches of the tree as trickles of her blood flowed down his trunk. I was terrified and dumbfounded as I stood in a trance. There was an alarming carving on the wood, very close to where Maria hung. I stared at it in dread. I I'd seen this carving recently, but I wasn't sure where. The omens were not good, and they just got worse. The bush behind me moved. I jerked in fear. Whoever had done this was still most likely lurking around. I scanned my surroundings carefully. The bush wriggled again, and I retreated slowly. When a large rat made its way out of the thicket, I heaved a heavy sigh. All of a sudden, a thousand voices invaded my mind as I fell to the ground. A dreadful darkness emerged from within the marking on the tree and approached me, and I felt helpless against it. Were those voices of children, I wondered. It began to morph into a sinister-looking being. When I regained my strength, and with a loud cry, I forced myself to my feet and sped out of the forest. A heavy gust of wind pursued me, but I began to stop and look back. I could see the other side, and I darted towards it with all the strength I could muster. And with a dying scream, I sped out of the woods and straight into the circus camp. Bob, where's Maria? The children all asked with increasing curiosity, but I ignored them all, strode into my tent and took out a set of books. Now, I was confident that I'd seen that carved marking in one of the novels I'd read to the children recently. I searched through the pile of books until I stumbled on one. Its back cover had been torn out, but... I could still see a large letter T spring out from the edge. It, I whispered. I proceeded to carefully flip through the yellowing pages of the strange looking book. Spells and incantations. It now looked like something more than harmless children's stories. It took a while, and then I saw it. The same marking that I had earlier seen in the woods was perfectly painted on one of the pages. My eyebrows rose in shock. Yesterday's bedtime story, I said, almost too calmly. I stormed out of the tent. Whatever evil lurked behind the pages of this book was not just a story. It is real. We have to get out of here, I mused. But the circus, Melody argued. It's not safe out here, Melody. I knew the kids had been training and looking forward to the last circus act, but my decision had to stand. We need to leave, I replied almost instantly, as I immediately instructed them to begin to pack up. I couldn't shake off the strange feeling I had that we were being watched. What about Maria? Melody shot back. Melody was smart. She was beginning to suspect that something was not right. Our gazes met, and I crouched in front of her. I knew that she could sense the anxiety all over my face. Trust me, Melody, I whispered and placed a soft kiss on their forehead. I led the entire circus troop quickly out of Derry, as thoughts of Maria's lifeless body hanging from a tree plagued my mind at certain intervals. I grabbed the mysterious book again and dove deeper. I wanted to know everything about it. According to the tales in the book, the creature returned every three decades, luring children into the woods, and they were never seen again. The book stated that it had landed on an asteroid several years ago and had remained in Derry ever since. Of course, 
They knew, I whispered. That's why they wanted us to stay. The inhabitants of Derry were aware of its presence, and we had come just at the right time with its favorite delight, children. We soon approached the outskirts of town when our circus carriage came to a sudden halt, and I watched in confusion as Melody jumped out of the carriage and ran into the nearby woods. Maria! She screamed as she ran further and further into the forest. Melody, no! I barked as I quickly jumped down from the horse and handed the reins to the second rider. Ride out, as fast as you can, I said. He was startled as he stared at the stern look on my face. He knew that this was no circus trick. He nodded in understanding and galloped away from my location as I immediately pursued my daughter into the woods. If anything happened to Melody, I would never forgive myself. I darted further into the woods, praying underneath my breath that my dear Melody was still safe. Melody! I cried out, but I was answered by the strange yet familiar calmness of the forest. I knew that the creature was here. I realized that I've been chasing shadows for a while now as I stopped to catch my breath. <laughs> Please, not my melody, I whispered. Are you sure? An eerie voice responded in my head as I stood in confusion. Does dear Pennywise want Melody back? I heard the voice again, and I immediately nodded in agreement. Pennywise will have to bring it, little children, every day, starting with your little friends. I understood the offer it had just brought to my table and I didn't have many options. I thought about all the beautiful faces of the children in my circus. I knew that I would do anything for Melody, but this price was too heavy to bear. Just then, I remembered that I'd seen a certain spell in one of the pages of the book that spoke about sending it back to sleep, and I quickly recited the phrase. It was my mistake. I heard a loud screech as it approached from within a hollow space in front of me with something that would haunt me forever. The lifeless body of Melody was tossed out from within the hollow darkness. It approached me with intent as a thousand voices exploded through my mind once again. I stared in dread as it descended into my entire being as I began to choke. I continued to stare at Melody's lifeless body on the floor as it possessed my entire being. My world was gone. It had taken my daughter away from me. I had no purpose anymore. And might as well do the same to other parents. That day, Bob Gray died and Pennywise, the eater of children, was born. I became the darkness. I became it. Dr. Carter is dead. I'm the last surviving crew member aboard this ship. We had a fatal collision with an asteroid and the entire crew is dead. I have lost control of the cargo, and the Falcon has been thrown off course. I'm crashing into an unknown planet, and I don't think I'll make it. This is Dr. Eva, the second pilot of the space cruiser Falcon. This is my last message. The enigmatic planet of Yucha Prime, home to the Predators, had two visitors today, Man and Xenomorph. One, an invasion, and the other, a stranded astronaut lost in space. The first time in the history of the multiverse that these three species have met. A secret only known to one. My spaceship descended upon Yucha Prime like a fiery comet, blazing as I crashed into the red earth. I was awoken moments later by the sound of explosions echoing in the distance. What is going on? Where, where am I? With the impact of the crash, I should be dead. I peered around and noticed something huge was going on. Like, 
Some sort of war. A huge ball of fire suddenly descended in my direction as I instantly sprung to my feet and darted towards my left. I noticed that the gravity was different. I felt very well light, but still balanced, and I was a bit faster than I had been on Earth. The fireball crashed into the rocky earth behind me as I stared in shock, wondering what had just happened. I shifted my gaze back to the growing chaos at some distance. A mountain of red earth shielded my eyes from a perfect view. I decided to climb the mountain to get a better view. I was almost at the top of the mountain when I realized that I had been breathing without my space helmet. It was shattered after the crash. What the hell? I whispered, where am I? I soon got to the peak of the mountain as my eyes were immediately greeted by a bizarre sight. Oh my god. I couldn't phantom what I was staring at. My jaw had dropped low as I laid flat on the rocky floor to keep myself out of sight. I peeked carefully again into the growing chaos. It seemed like two different extraterrestrial species were at war. It seemed like an invasion. The invading species had an elongated cylindrical skull with eyes underneath their visors, and they moved with disturbing speed. The inhabitants of this strange planet, however, seemed more manlike. They had greater height, long hair-like appendages on their heads that looked like dreadlocks and reptilian skin and their faces featured anthropod-like mandibles with no visible nose. Wait a minute, how can I see all this from far away? It seemed as though my entire sense had been heightened on this strange planet. An unexpected spaceship debris spun towards me from the battle, as it immediately retreated down the mountain. The debris crashed against the peak of the mountain where I had earlier been, and scattered into several pieces. It seemed as though one of the invaders noticed my flea as the spaceship was now flying in my direction. I had to think fast. I spotted a small tunnel that protruded from the side of the mountain, and I instantly sprinted towards it. The alien spaceship soon descended towards where I had earlier been and loitered for a moment before returning to the war zone. Suddenly, scaly hands ran across my shoulder as I turned around startled and fell to the ground in shock. I looked closer into the dark tunnel and realized it was just a dying branch. Branch? I mused. Was there life on this planet before? Lots of questions had been burdening my mind as I continued further into the tunnel. I couldn't go back outside as that was a death trap. I knew that I had to stay hidden and, if possible, scheme my way out of this unusual planet. The heat on the planet was becoming unbearable but I didn't have much of a choice. Luckily, I still had my radio with me. It was broken, but I was going to try to fix it. Wong is a space traveler, and he had just picked up a strange frequency. He had traced the frequency back to the source. The coordinates pointed towards a close-by planet, and he was already en route towards the coordinate. Dr. Eva, he mused as he listened to the recording again. She had said that she wasn't sure if she was going to make it, but that it was worth the adventure. The tunnel led out into the thriving city of Yucha Prime. I stared in awe at the intricate magnificence of the planet. From the outside, it seemed like some sort of dead and deserted rocky red earth planet, void of life and purpose. But here, I was staring at advanced technology a thousand light years away from Earth. Several predators rushed in and out of the main gate leading into the city. From the look of things, it seemed as though the inhabitants of this planet were caught unaware. They weren't prepared for an invasion, but so far, they have managed to hold back the persistent invaders. One of the predators suddenly shifted his gaze towards my direction as I immediately scampered back into the tunnel. I could swear that he had seen me. He obviously saw something. Heavy footsteps soon approached from the exit of the tunnel. I swallowed hard as he stepped closer. A loud bang! suddenly erupted outside of the tunnel, within their city, as the footsteps stopped and quickly retreated out of the tunnel. That was my saving grace. I took in heavy breaths as my racing heart began to slow its pace. That was close, I mused as I stared down at the broken radio in my hands. I proceeded back into the tunnel. 
I need to get out of here. It was slowly getting obvious that I needed to find a way out of this planet, as my chances of survival dwindled with each passing second. I need to get this fixed. I had some basic training during my early years as an astronaut back on Earth, but that was many years ago, and I wasn't certain if I could still recall how to repair a broken radio. But this was my life on the line. I didn't have any choice but to remember. It wasn't too hard to fix. I pushed a few buttons and joined a few wires, and it was back to life. I wasted no time as I clicked on the record button. This is Dr. Eva. If you can hear me, please respond. I am stranded on a strange planet, and I've been caught in an all-out war between what seems like aliens and predators. I need an extraction as I'm not sure how much longer I can survive over here. My space cruiser came into collision with an asteroid, and my entire crew is dead. I crash-landed on this strange planet, and all hell seems to have broken loose over here. I'm still yet to be discovered, so if you can hear me, please send help. She survived, Wong exclaimed as he listened to the new message. She is definitely a fighter, Wong thought. She also spoke of a war between two extraterrestrial species. Wong knew that he would have to tread with caution. He picked up his radio and spoke into it. Dr. Eva would soon breathe the soothing air of relief once again. I leaped in ecstasy in the cave where I sat. I had just received an optimistic response over the radio, and it already seemed like the best news I had ever received in my entire life. I was going to live. Perhaps a ray of hope now shone in my dark corners of despair. Wong, I quietly let out a wide grin on my face. The heat on this planet was getting intense, and all I wanted at the moment was to get the hell out of this planet. I had had enough sightseeing to cover for an entire decade of space trips, and perhaps I was going to retire after this if I made it back to Earth alive. I had successfully described where I was, and Wong had confirmed that he had sighted the planet. Everything seemed to be going according to plan until another loud explosion erupted at the other end of the tunnel, where I had just come from. Several heavy footsteps rushed into the tunnel, and I immediately jumped to my feet and raced out of the tunnel as the footsteps trailed closely behind. Wong was supposed to be here by now, as I stared into the sky. I soon emerged out of the tunnel, and I noticed that the heated battle was beginning to seem endless. I crouched behind a huge rock as the creatures also sped out of the tunnel. It was the invaders, not the inhabitants of the planet. My heart began to race once more as they approached the rock where I was hiding. I took occasional glances at the sky, hoping for some sort of miracle, and it soon came. A huge Earth-like battle spaceship appeared into the horizon and descended into my direction. It had to be Wong, I thought. The spaceship door sprung open, and I instantly hurried towards it. The aliens, noticing something move in the distance, decided to give it chase. Just then, huge guns which were attached to the sides of the spaceship whirled as Wong fired continuously at the incoming threat. I made my way into the spaceship, and the door shut tight. Others on the battleground, noticing the new visitor, turned their spaceships towards ours and began to give chase as Wong lifted into space. Three alien spaceships were now on our tails. I joined him on the second pilot seat and strapped in as we worked together to evade the heavy fire. The pursuit through space continued for a while, and Wong finally got tired. He halted his spaceship suddenly in space and retreated towards the incoming threat, blasting everything he had left at the incoming alien spaceship, turning them into a pile of space debris. Solo space pilots were always badass, so I wasn't surprised at his sudden act of bravery. I would have loved to stay to find out who had won the battle between the two species, but I reminded myself that I didn't stand a chance against these aliens if I were caught. I was just a simple prey amongst two apex predators. I stared down from above the spaceship as Wong sped away from the planet. This was an encounter I'd never forget. I didn't think we would stand a chance against any of these two creatures. I heaved a heavy sigh as I shut my eyes to sleep. Hey there, listeners. Welcome back to the Phantom Council. It's your witch queen of all things scary and imaginary, Millie Rose. You're right on time for our midnight segment, based on a true story. 
Before we get started, the National Weather Service would like me to remind you that tonight's snowstorm is going to be a big one. So, as much as we here at the Phantom Council like to live on the dangerous side, we ask that you stay indoors, stay warm, and stay tuned throughout the night. And like the old folks in this Padunk Mountain town always like to say, stay out of the snow. <coughs> Now that the serious stuff is over, grab your flashlights, throw on your pajamas, and gather around for some real life horror stories. Here's our first caller, Calvin. Go ahead, Calvin, you're on the air. Tell us about your ghostly encounter. Calvin, you're killing us with the suspense, brother. Normally I'd be into it, but not on the first caller. Tell us what happened to you, Calvin. Tell us all about the ghost you saw. Hey, uh, hi, Millie. <laughs> Hey there, Calvin. You got a story for me? Will you guys shut up? Uh, hello, Millie? Uh, the truth is, I don't actually have a story. I, I lied. <laughs> I just called you to tell you that, well, I kind of have a crush on you. Will you add me? And he said, it's cool. I used to say me for everything. It's uh, who's your underscore dad. Calvin? Calvin, are you there? Oh darn, we lost Calvin. Sounded like a really scary story too. Come on guys, I need a good scare tonight. And if you call here and try to pitch me your self-promotion, I'll scream, but not in a good way. Here we go, another caller. Please, in the name of Satan, our unholy father, give me something terrifying and true. You're on the air, whenever you're ready. Don't spare the gory details. You won't believe me. Oh, caller, you don't know how many times I've heard that. Your name's Sasha, right? Look, Sasha, I believed in Santa Claus until I was 12. I believed in Freddy Krueger until I was 16. I still believe the moon landing was faked. Come on, hit me with your best shot. It already sounds like a scary one. Hello? <coughs> Sasha? Don't tell me we lost her. I had to get an Uber. I was too scared to drive in the snow. I just wanted to get home. It was it was so cold. I just wanted to go home. Hey, we've all been there. Ubers are scary. You never know if some maniac is going to be driving. The car pulled up and I got inside. The Uber driver was nice. He had the heat turned all the way up. It was warm. He was going to take me home. But the snow got really bad. The Uber driver asked me if I was sure that I wanted to keep going. He said he didn't mind. He'd driven it worse. I lived in the country, and I knew the roads might get bad outside of the city. But I just wanted to go home so bad, so... I told him to keep going. And he did. But they weren't just bad. They were frozen. When we started crossing through the mountains, I could feel the wheels sliding on the ice. I asked him if everything was okay. He said yeah. But it was on his face. Things were really bad. We got to the valley, and we couldn't see the road. We started passing more trees than I remember there being. When he lost signal, I did, too. He asked me if I knew where we were without GPS. No. I didn't know. I didn't even think we were on a road anymore. Please, keep going, Sasha. What happened next? Was your Uber driver crazy or something? I got out of the Uber. I thought, maybe if I looked around, I might recognize something. But it was all covered in white. I couldn't see two feet in front of me. The snow was so thick. It was like a freezing mist. The Uber driver told me to get back inside. I wanted to, but that's when I heard it. Heard what? I heard it moaning, like it was hurt or something. I thought it might have been a dog. It sounded like it needed help. The Uber driver kept telling me to get back inside. He said I'd freeze, but I could hear it. It got louder. I couldn't see anything. I asked him if he heard it too. We both got quiet and we listened. It wasn't moaning anymore. We both got in the car. I heard the doors lock all at once. I wanted to cry. The Uber driver said something about 
starving wolves, but I couldn't hear him. All I could hear was the roar. It was so close. He said we should stay in the car, that we could keep warm throughout the night. Maybe the snow would melt in the morning. Maybe we'd have signal. Maybe someone would see us. He didn't think we should go outside. I didn't want to. The Uber driver, at the time, I didn't tell him, but I could feel it out there. It wanted us to come out. Sasha, you don't have to keep going. We'll just end it right- The Uber driver turned up the heat. It was blasting in the floor and through the vents, but we couldn't get warm. We could hear it over the sounds of the car. We could hear it getting closer. <laughs> he cried out. He saw something move. I tried to see through the windows, but they were like ice. I blew on the glass, the only hot air I had left. I rubbed away the fog and it was there, staring at me out in the snow. S Sasha? It was tall, it was hairy, it was white, it had long arms, long legs, no face, no eyes, no ears, only a mouth with a million teeth. There was blood in the snow where it walked, there was blood on its arms, on its legs, and on its face. It was screaming, it was loud, I couldn't hear anything, I couldn't hear him when he said he was going to look outside, I couldn't speak when I wanted to yell, stop, don't roll down the window, don't go outside. It was too late. He looked, but didn't see. He could hear it, but didn't know it was there. I watched it take him. I couldn't do anything. I just watched. Take him? Take him where? It had his head. The Uber driver, he was screaming. When it bit down on his throat, he didn't scream anymore. He choked. I opened my eyes and... It was pulling his body through the window. I wanted to move, to pull him back inside, but it was dragging him out. Until he was gone. I heard the crunch. I, I heard it ripping. I heard the blood. I heard its... I heard its moan. And then, I heard nothing at all. And then? I didn't move. The car stayed on. The window stayed open. I survived the night, but I was cold. I was cold when they found me. I was cold when they took me home. I'm still cold. I don't know if... if I can be warm again. <sighs> it's a good story, Sasha. You definitely got me. The Phantom Council thanks you for your genuine scare. I knew you wouldn't believe me. I mean, a part of me wants to, Sasha. Even if it's true and you watched a giant monster eat your Uber driver, why tell me? What are you getting out of this? Why did you call here at all? I wanted to tell you that you were right. Stay out of the snow. Dr. Stones, an expert archaeologist, has been getting high levels of radiation emanating from a secret cave at an excavation site. No one has discovered this strange spot, and he intends to keep it that way. He has been digging for a week now, and he could feel much closer to his prize. Whatever was hidden under the pile of earth would surely be worth thousands of dollars in the black market. He stared at the sun which was almost high up in the sky. His excavator had just come in contact with its prize and he took a quick glance around to be sure that he was alone. The radiation detector device had spiked at an abnormal level. Holy shit! He screamed as he stared at the strange object buried in the earth. 
and rushed to get his protective clothing. He soon unearthed a large egg-shaped object. It was about three feet high. Dr. Stones carefully placed the strange object in his truck and sped away from the site. The strange object had caught his attention, and he decided to study it first before putting it out for sale. Five days have passed and Dr. Stones was slowly getting obsessed with the round object because it somehow glowed in the dark, painting the night with a beautiful mix of emerald and sapphire, a beautiful display of colors that left Dr. Stones speechless. He couldn't take his eyes off the strange object all day, and he studied it closely, fascinated by its ethereal beauty. It was a calm Friday evening when the object began to shake uncontrollably as Dr. Stones rose abruptly to his feet. Fear and fascination clouded his choices as the object began to break from the inside. Oh, holy shit! It it's an egg! Of course! He coursed loudly as he noticed something moving within the egg. His shirt was already drenched with sweat, but he refused to move an inch. A strange creature soon emerged from within the egg, and Dr. Stones stared in shock as the strange life form stared back at him. It was about a foot tall, a mix of emerald and sapphire. Its entire body was covered in scales that glittered like diamonds, pulsating at every second. His heart raced faster as the alien continued to stare at him, its deep blue eyes staring intently at him. The alien looked terrifying but somehow still looked adorable, a perfect oxymoron. It had legs and arms and looked like an armadillo, but its head similar to a chipmunk. A poor description, but that was the closest description he could accord the strange creature. Dr. Stone soon began to think about its inborn instincts. What? An alien? Are you kidding me? An alien? He whispered. Predator or prey? Dr. Stone stared in awe. He knew that this new discovery could be dangerous, but he didn't care. He stretched out his arms as the alien gave a loud, eerie cry and jumped calmly into his arms. A mindless thing to do, but he remained unhurt. He wiped what was left of the milky goo from the alien with a clean towel as he continued to examine it. Ray. I'll call you Ray. <laughs> I guess you're a boy. He chuckled as he strolled out of his study. Somewhere in space beyond our galaxy in the Milky Way, the silent waves of Ray's first cry was heard as a spaceship containing dozens of aliens now traveled towards Earth. On the eastern coast of Hangzhou Province, China, soft notes from a Paizhou flute filled the air as the soft breeze from sea waves swayed distant trees in a rhythmic motion. The smell of grilled fish hovered in the air as fishermen were already sailing back to the docks. The orange sky was filled with hundreds of different bird species as the mercenary watched in awe at the beauty of such a wonderful sight. He was soon greeted by a familiar sight. A beautiful English woman strolled calmly towards him, her blonde hair perfectly knitted in a ponytail on her head. Huh. Alice, the mercenary mused. You have a new contract, she replied. I just picked up another extraterrestrial on our radar, and I've locked on the location of the alien, she continued. Huh. What should I expect? The mercenary asked. A few days ago, an archaeologist discovered a lost egg belonging to the Xeron species and he carried it home. The egg soon hatched, springing up on our radar and informing us of its presence. Strangely, the alien seems to have bonded with the archaeologist and so far has caused no harm to him. Your job is to retrieve this alien alive. Should I proceed for extraction immediately? The mercenary asked. Yes, proceed. What about the archaeologist you spoke about? Take care of him. No witnesses. She replied and she turned immediately and walked away. Alice is the head scientist at Catalyst, a secret organization that operates in the shadows. Their primary objective is to ensure that the knowledge of aliens and monsters remains a myth at any cost. For decades, they have operated in the dark, using advanced technology to keep the sanity of men in place. But alien sightings seems to have doubled in the last decade, making them doubt if they'll be able to hold back the big secret for much longer. That we are not alone in the universe. It had been heavily raining all day and Dr. Stones had been forced to remain indoors. He had spent his entire day researching possible sightings of similar species in the past, but hit a dead end time and time again. Ray hung onto his neck from behind, staring into the laptop too. They had spent just two weeks together, but the extraterrestrial alien now trusted him with his life. 
Ray was a fast learner and eater too. He ate almost everything Dr. Stones had given him. Unlike humans, Ray seemed to grow and learn at amazing speeds. And Dr. Stones knew the painful truth. If Ray continued to grow at such speed, he would soon have different government agencies at his door. His primary goal was to get Ray home before anyone could come knocking and sniffing around. Ray already understood Dr. Stones clearly whenever he spoke and was obedient to every command. Suddenly, a splash of lightning hit a tree outside the house, taking out all the power. Someone walked into his home. Dr. Stone sighted a man at a distance step into the house and search for the pistol beneath his desk. <laughs> Anybody home? Hand over the alien, doctor. The mercenary said as he walked in, but Stones remained quiet. This was nothing compared to the many alien encounters he had faced over the years. This was just a newborn and he was most likely harmless. He had once fought against a 10-foot Xeron and managed to capture it. He had hunted different species of aliens for decades. He just wanted to get this over with. What, what do you want with them? Dr. Stones muttered, but the mercenary ignored him. After a brief wait, Stones sprung out from his hiding spot, with Ray still clinging tightly to his back and he fired several rounds towards the direction of the mercenary. He was a bad shot, but it was still worth a try. He needed a distraction. He jumped out into his lawn through his window, shattering it into a thousand pieces and headed for his truck. He wasted no time in starting the truck and speeding out into the quiet road. It was already the late hours of the night, but Stones knew that whoever just walked into his room was not going to let him live. Dr. Stones raced past several cars as the mercenary trailed closely behind on a Ducati motorcycle, roaring into the night as he raced further. I should have got a fucking car! Stones groaned as his truck raced at an insulting speed. The mercenary closed in quickly and Dr. Stones thought of an escape plan. Without warning, a bright light enveloped the midnight sky, and an unidentified object appeared in the distance and flew towards their direction. It took a moment, but Dr. Stones knew what it was. A spaceship. It looked like a massive flying castle covered with some sort of force field, which was a mix of two distinct colors, emeralds and sapphire. Stones immediately knew what they had come for. Oh, shit! Stone screamed as his brakes failed to respond. The mercenary was now right behind him, and hell began to break loose. Stones guided the truck as he drifted along the busy highway, dodging several incoming cars as he sped further. Several openings soon appeared at different sides of the spaceship, releasing dozens of aliens into the city. Stones was not the only one who had now shifted his gaze away from the road, and his truck collided with an incoming car. The truck immediately left the grounds somersaulting twice in the air before landing on its top. Cars began to halt at every corner of the road as people raced away from the incoming threat. The mercenary was now faced with a bigger challenge as the aliens drew closer, taking out anything that walked along their path. They were all at least 10 feet tall, screeching at a loud pitch as they moved towards the direction of the crash. Several choppers approached towards them as sirens emanated from the distance. Loud shots were now being fired at the incoming threats and even the mercenary had joined in on the all-out attack. Rockets filled the night sky, targeted towards the unfriendly visitors on all fronts. An all-out war had broken out. Dr. Stones was unhurt as he crept out of the wreck. Ray had created a tiny forest field just before the crash and had kept them both safe. Stone stared at the invaders with dread. They looked much like Ray, but had a few significant differences. Suddenly, a huge electromagnetic pulse shot into the sky, bringing time to a standstill. Only the aliens were not affected by the time freeze. Everything else stood still. Dr. Stones was still into Ray's force field and was not affected too. And he watched in shock as men in advanced battlesuits dropped into the scene. The mercenary wasn't affected either. Their weapons were out of this world and they knew exactly where to hit the aliens, moving with perfect coordination. It was a massacre. Ray, listen to me. You have to go with them. This is not your world. They have come for you, and you can put an end to all of this chaos. 
Ray, you're the only one that can make them understand. Ray, you hear me? Ray was smart and he could understand Dr. Stone's every word, but he didn't want to go. He felt more fear than love for his new family, and he wanted to stay with Dr. Stone's. Ray, 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 look here, buddy. I understand how you feel, but humans will never accept you here. They'll hunt you down until you're, you're put down. We tend to fear what we don't understand. That's us humans, Ray. You'll be safer with them. Ray began to glow with emotions as he ran towards the spaceship. The rest of the aliens soon retreated back to the ship and disappeared into the sky. Dr. Stones knew this would be an unforgettable experience as he wandered into oblivion. What adventures awaited Ray and the stars beyond? Hey, Tuomas here. Subscribe for more horror stories. Log 227. Day 634. I did it. After hundreds of failed attempts, I finally accomplished the single most important project in my life. The others did not believe me. My job was taken from me and even my own mother told me it was futile. But today I finally succeeded. Elizabeth Holmes promised a world in which no one ever has to say goodbye too soon. Oh, those words were lies, but mine are not. In a world where you never have to say goodbye. <laughs> They'd all laughed, run me into bankruptcy and called me a fool. But they weren't the ones standing there where I am, seeing the woman standing in front of me. A woman in perfect and sound health. A woman smiling and holding out her arms to hug me. My mother. Biologically the same. Human in every way. She's perfect. She's everything I hoped for and more. When I called to her the first time and she opened her eyes, it was like everything clicked into place. She is my mother now. She's the one that will care for and love me until both of our time runs out. It was a success. Log 235, day 697. Marion died today. She begged me to end her life, told me to just let her die and to let her die in peace. Her last words were that only by the death of that monstrosity is my life ready to end. She was evil. How could she say that about my mother? Especially when she did nothing but care for that sick and lazy woman, smiling and washing her face making sure her pillow was fluffed, that she was comfortable in every way before she died. And Marion used to be everything to me. And now I can see that she was nothing more than a spiteful and hateful woman. She did not enjoy life as she once did. Now her younger, healthier counterpart does that now. She's my mother, the one that loves me and cares for me now. Marion is now nothing more than a memory. Log 246, day 742. Let me die. Kill me. Let me die. Kill me. Let me die in peace. Those words. Just those aggravating words are the only ones that are spoken to me now. That's all I hear, every day, like flies buzzing around my head. But I can't kill them. Those flies won't die. It's been a month of wonderful love and life with my mother, but... She's turning into Marion. She's turning into the woman that died a lonely and bitter death, simply because she couldn't accept that there was another bitter version of her that could now love me. Mother was supposed to be different, 
I created her from Marion, but I created her healthier, stronger, happier. But Mother is becoming sicker and sicker by the day. She doesn't smile anymore. She doesn't spin around and sing in happiness. I miss it. I miss her. She's there, of course, but it's not her body that's ill. It's her mind. Her mind has rotted, dissolved to the mindset of Marion. I don't know how to fix it. I don't know how to make her happy. I just want my mother, and I will get her back. I will have my mother happy and alive again, no matter what it takes. Log 265, day 789. Marion was discarded yesterday. She screamed, not for me to stop, but to get it over and done with quickly. She didn't want to live anymore, something that I can never understand. Her need to die was more important than her love for me. I could not forgive her for that. But it's okay, because Mother is with me once more. Marion sacrificed several of her cells and anything else I might need to recreate Mother. She's perfect, and no one can tell me otherwise. No one has told me otherwise. I was contacted yesterday. My old employer hearing of my successes in the scientific world. He wants to hire me again. Told me that he made a mistake and that my knowledge and skills would be invaluable to the team. He's a liar. Nothing but a filthy liar that just wants to steal what I've created. He wants to study Mother. He wants to use her. And I would kill him before he could lay his filthy hands on her perfection. Mother is mine. She's not for anyone else to lay eyes on, to experiment on, to even think about. She's mine! And I'm hers. She's healthy once more. Smiling, dancing, lighter than air as usual. Cooking me homemade meals, singing me to sleep, holding me in her arms as she once did. She's flourishing, and we're happy. That's all I've wanted for us. To be happy and to be together. It won't turn out like last time. I know that in my heart. Because this time I've perfected it. This time I've made sure that she doesn't get sick. That Marion's words don't poison her mind. Marion is dead and gone. And she will remain so. There's no need for her to plague my life anymore. Mother and I are content as we are together. Log 289, day 862. Die. Why won't she die? She's not needed anymore. She was a failure, a failure like the rest of them. If she can't love me like she should, then she should just die. She begs to die. She wants to die, but she just won't. She just sits there and mocks me day by day, telling me that I will never be happy with the path that I've walked down, that I will never be able to replace her, there will never be someone like her again. That's not true. Marion is a liar, and she forever will be a witch that plagues my life. Mother and I are happy. I've made her once more. This time it will work. It has to work. She has to smile. She has to be happy. And for that, Marion has to die. Why can't she just keel over already? Why must it always be by my hand that they finally sit in silence? I do not wish to hear her voice anymore. Her cries and her spite. Perhaps I will just put her out of her misery. I will put her out of her misery. I promise that. Log 456. Day 989. Day 989. They found out about her. Not my old boss, nor anyone that ever said I would fail, but the government. There was a man that came and knocked on the door earlier. Told me that he wanted to take a look around. He found Mother. He went on a rant about how her death had been recorded nearly a year ago. And then he'd made that phone call. 
I didn't know what else to do. I had to protect Mother. I had to get her out of there, and out of the hands of those that would only wish her harm. So we left in the night. I'm recording this from a bunker that I had set up for a case such as this. I knew one day they would want to steal my work and take it for their own. Unfortunately, this time they have succeeded. Uh, there was no time to pack up any of the equipment. All that I could bring were my notes. I have no doubt they've seen the failed projects by now. The six Marians and the original, along with that agent who should have kept his nose out of my business. I buried them. I gave them that much for the pain they put me through. And just thinking about their bodies being unearthed makes my blood boil. But there's nothing I can do about it now. And at least I still have Mother. She's the last. The perfected. The only one that will love me the way I crave it. The way I need it. She grew from the healthiest cells of Marion. The happiest smiles. The loveliest of songs. There is not a doubt in my mind that she's what I've been working towards. Perfection. Log 457, day 1567. Hello, this is Mother. Son asked me to record this, to tell the world of his end. There is a note from him asking me to tell the world of his victories and his genius. But he was nothing more than a weak boy. He brought me back to life, again and again. I did not want to live. I wanted to die in peace. But I could not. He forced me to open my eyes again and again. I still recall my original body. The one that succumbed to disease. So much so that it could no longer walk. No longer lift its hand without experiencing immense pain. I remember it all. I begged him to kill me for it. He'd taken care of the others. Why should he not take care of me? Why could he not just let me rest in peace? He wouldn't let me die. He silenced my cries. He was weak. There was a gun. One that still lies on the floor where he fell. I haven't left the bunker yet, finding myself incapable of leaving his body. I hate him, but I am still his mother. I must still care for him, above all else. There is food for when my biological needs require me to eat. There is water as well, plenty of sustenance. He rendered me incapable of taking my own life, and so I must suffer here, begging him day in and day out to end it. But he can no longer hear me. But I suppose you can. Can't you? So please. Kill me. Let me die. Let me die. End it. Let me die. End my pain. End it. Kill me. Kill me. Let me die. 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 Trigger warning. Extreme violence. The coast is clear. Hurry, we can make it out of the dome. Liam screamed. Go without me. I can't do this anymore. Huey couldn't bear the pain of the injury he had on his chest as he fell to the ground. Huey, no, get up. Huey exhaled deeply and breathed his last. His eyes flickered to an eternal sleep. Huey, please, don't.
Don't do this to me. Wake up. Flames were licking up the air, with the wind trying to catch something else on fire and finding nothing but air. Its job was done. No building was left standing. The dome burned to the ground. Man fears what he cannot conquer. I see one here! Voices from a distance could be heard. Liam raced for the gate with all he had. Freeze! A voice from far away commanded. Suddenly, every joint and muscle that enabled Liam to run stopped. He didn't want to stop, but his body was subject to the command given. It's down! Get it! The soldiers said as they rushed to retain Liam. Liam stood there, numb. And as the soldiers pinned him down, his eyes met with Huey's lifeless body, and the bodies of his people littered all over the place. You guys don't have a place in this world. You are abominations, one of the soldiers said as he pulled Liam and spat on his face. Place the retainers on the ones alive, and remember to take the DNA of those dead, the commander commanded. Chips were inserted into their spines, chips that prevented them from using their power. Sir... Dr. Jason said to tell you he will only be needing ten of them, a soldier whispered to the commander. The commander's eyes darted across the crowd. Get me ten of their finest men. Yes, sir. Liam was selected with nine other men. What do we do with the rest, sir? One of the soldiers questioned. Get rid of them, the commander ordered as he walked out of the dome. One of the soldiers took out a gas and sprayed on all who weren't chosen by the commander. Those who were alive barely screamed for help. Light their heads up, one of the soldiers said with a smile. As the van drove off with Liam and the others, those who were left behind all laid on the floor helpless and burning. Parents clung to their children. Some squeezed their eyes as the only way they could cry for help was with their tears. The soldiers made their way out of the dome into their vans as the dome exploded. On hearing the sound of the explosion, Liam squeezed his eyes also, for he had just lost all he could call family. He didn't even get the chance to bury them. A tragic day it really was. One filled with scars that would never be forgotten. Pohill. Spider Lab. Thank you, thank you. A man walked on stage as everyone applauded. First of all, it's an honor to have every one of you here this day. The applause faded out as he began to speak. I'm sure everyone here saw the news to begin with. The Imaginates have gone from being a threat to us humans and are now a danger to their own kind. Luckily for them, our soldiers made it there to stop the violence, but they couldn't stop the explosion of the dome. But the good news is that we caught those who did this treacherous act. The crowd applauded, but those times will soon be over. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of the Imaginates seeing us humans as inferior rather than superior. We all know what they did to us on Mars. Still, we accepted them. And they repay that kindness by attacking us and killing our people with their powers. But I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Project Corinthian is here to change that. The whole crowd stood up to applaud loudly. With Corinthian, we no longer fear being inferior to them, because he will protect us from them. Forever. And ladies and gentlemen, lastly, before I go off the stage, as I said earlier, we retained those imaginates that attacked and killed their own people. Despite our differences, we reached out to help them. And we will punish those imaginates for what they have done. Remember... Spider Lab has always been after the betterment of humanity. And so, ladies and gentlemen, 
I give you... Corinthian. He bowed his head and walked off the stage as the crowd roared with applause. The lights went off and came back on as a strange man appeared on the stage. Silence swept across the crowd as they tried to comprehend who he was. Corinthian. I am a Corinthian, he said in a robotic tone. He stretched out his hand as all the water molecules from the corners of the room floated and created an ice cube large enough to fit seven people in it. In amazement, the crowd applauded him with a standing ovation. Thank you, Corinthian said as he waved. I told you he wasn't complete, but you pushed for him to come out, a man whispered to another man behind the stage. Dr. Jason! Look at them! Don't they love it? They're so dumb to notice he's incomplete, the man answered as he smiled. Mr. Stephen, I know, but we need to get him completed before something happens. You asked for ten imaginates to complete him. We got them here. Don't piss me off. You will complete him after the convention, Stephen said furiously as he smiled and left. But I need more time, Jason said as Stephen walked out. Jason exhaled heavily, then moved closer to the stage where Corinthian stood staring at him. Why are you staring at me, Doctor? A duplicate of Corinthian interfered. Jason, shocked, lost his balance a little, causing his glasses to fall to the ground. Jesus, Corinthian, how many times have I told you not to sneak up on me with your duplicate? I'm sorry, Doctor. You look disturbed. Is anything the issue? No, Jason said as he wore his glasses. Remember, one of my specialties is knowing when someone lies about something. And you are lying, Doctor. Jason stared at him and smiled. Corinthian, I will see you later in the lab, Jason said, walking out. The duplicate walked onto the stage and fused together with Corinthian. The crowd went wild as Corinthian turned and walked off the stage. Liam opened his eyes to survey the box he was placed in. He tried to force himself up, but an electric shock from the cuffs he was given kept him back down. His eyes met with one of the scientists in the lab. Where are we? Release us now! He commanded. Your powers are useless in here. You imagine it's are more foolish than I thought, she said, moving along to survey the others. Pipes were placed on them. They extracted something from their system which they didn't know about, but it made them feel weak. Jason walked into the laboratory. Welcome, Dr. Jason. We have extracted the FTH from their systems. All of them seem to have no traces of powers, except him, she pointed to Liam. Interesting, Jason said, then started towards the box where Liam was placed. What happens if you extract the FTH from his system? Um, his system recovers it back immediately, she replied. And what is his ability, Dr. Sarah? Jason questioned, staring at Liam as if he were a specimen. Not sure. We haven't spotted anything that is known. What are you? Jason said thoughtfully to Liam. Get me out of here and I will show you, Liam threatened. You have gotten the FTH from the rest, am I correct, Dr. Sarah? Yes, sir. Uh, then get rid of them. I think we've gotten the real deal here he said, looking at Liam. But for the meantime, run more tests on him. Okay, sir. Jason exited the lab. Mr. Stephen, Jason called out. Stephen, on noticing him, excused himself from the midst of his guests to give Jason an ear. What is wrong, Jason? Why are you screaming? He whispered. I'm sorry, but we got it. The final masterpiece to complete Corinthian. What do you mean? One of the imaginates we caught. 
He shows a unique FDH flow in him. He's different from the others. What are you guys talking about? Corinthian appeared. Christ, Corinthian, what is wrong with you? Stop sneaking up on me! Jason panicked. Lower your voice, Jason. He is just showing his power. It's good for the media, so play along, Stephen said as the paparazzi flashed their cameras and stormed them with photos. Corinthian wasn't comfortable with the flashes. They caused him to twitch. Stop! 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 He yelled, causing the cameras to explode. An awkward silence swept through the room. Stephen could see how tense the woman by the bar was already. This was bad market. Stephen looked around as he applauded slowly. Bravo, Corinthian! Bravo! Everyone was confused as to why he applauded. Ladies and gentlemen, this proves that Corinthian is not just a robot, but a human also. He was programmed after our late beloved Raymond Fisher, who, as we all know, had a phobia for flashes before he sacrificed himself for us. The crowd was moved that they applauded the words of Stephen. Thank you, everyone, he smiled. Take Corinthian to my office now, he whispered to Jason. Jason walked Corinthian to Stephen's office. What was wrong with you, Corinthian? Jason asked, already angry at how everything was going. I'm sorry. I couldn't control it. What did I tell you to do when you feel tensed? Bite my tongue and exhale, Corinthian replied. Stephen stepped in. Corinthian, do you want people to hurt me? Stephen questioned. No, sir. If you keep doing things like that, bad people might just try to use it against me and hurt me. And you don't want that, right? Corinthian fell to his knees, pleading. I'm sorry, Master. It won't happen again. Yes, Corinthian. It won't. Stephen smiled. From now on, you will be locked in your pod till every bit of your programming is completed. Now, Corinthian... Go back into your pod now, Stephen commanded. Immediately, Corinthian walked out of the office and headed to the lab. I told you giving it emotions will make it weak, Jason, but you didn't listen. Jason was about to speak when Stephen cut in. Now listen to me. I don't care what he is going to turn out to be, but I want every single emotion out of his programming. Okay, sir. That will take some time. Do I look like I care? You have 48 hours. Make it work. Leave my office. And one more thing, Jason. Never interrupt me when I'm talking again. Jason shut the door behind him and exhaled deeply. Inside, Stephen's phone rang. It was a strange number. Who the hell is this? He said under his breath, staring at the screen. Hello? He answered. I know the truth about everything. I have video proof of what really happened in Mars, and I will release it to the press. Who are you? Stephen questioned. The muscles in his body became tense. The person who is going to ruin your life. If you don't release the set of imaginates you are holding captive right now. I don't know what you're- Stephen Mark, you have two hours. The strange caller said just before the line went dead. Stephen couldn't take the phone off his ears. It was rare to see him shocked. Adar, search and ID this caller now, he panicked. Searching, the AI replied. Stephen couldn't sit down anymore and so he walked to and fro his office, as if the corners of the room would offer him answers. I'm sorry, sir. This caller couldn't be identified, Adar replied. You have to be shitting me, he said under his breath. Sir, I'm picking up signals of distress from your body. I suggest you lie down a little and stop stressing about it, Adar said. You have no idea of what this means, Adar. If that person truly has the video proof of what happened in Mars, the whole spider lab is doomed. Humanity is doomed. Stephen fell back into the arms of his chair. 
I understand, sir. I will run more searches on the caller and trace them. Thank you, Adar. You're welcome, sir. Hilltop Town, West Side. A boy was standing by a blue can beside a coffee shop, when suddenly he dropped his case on the floor, opened it, and brought out a black violin made with mahogany wood that had a name inscribed on it. He cleaned the violin, then picked up his bow and positioned it by the left side of his neck. As he struck the violin strings with his bow, people from all around drew closer to him. While playing, he squeezed his eyes shut, and everyone who listened felt a distressing emotion leave them. Whether it was anger or sadness, they all felt peace as they listened to him play. While he played on, dark clouds gathered, and it began to drizzle. Still, no one could break free from the bound of the tunes he played. Boy, a man tapped him. Immediately, he opened his eyes. Everyone started heading for shelter from the rain. The euphoria had ended quite abruptly. Thank you, sir. I will ask you again, why are your tunes different, and are you a magician? The man smiled as he spoke. <laughs> no, Mr. Bobby, he laughed. But don't stop playing here, though. You attract customers to my coffee shop. I won't, Mr. Bobby. I'll be heading home now before my mum gets worried. Won't you grab a cup of coffee before heading home? On the house, as always. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Bobby. <laughs> You're so nice. He packed his violin as they rushed into the shop before the rain could drench them any further. Cappuccino special, right? The regular? The man asked as he went behind the counter. Yes, sir, he said, taking a seat in front of the counter. He dropped his violin on the counter. Son, I've been wanting to ask, what is your name? Hank, he smiled while the rain fell heavier. <laughs> Oops, don't tell me you'll be going home under this devilish rain. Uh, no, sir. Oh, thank goodness. So, where did you stay before you moved here? Hank stared at him for a while. Can I use the bathroom? Yes, sure, Bobby said with a smile. Hank walked into the bathroom, splashed his face, and stared at himself in the mirror fiercely. He walked out of the bathroom and noticed his violin was gone. No! 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 He shrieked. Bobby, who was in the kitchen, rushed out in haste, alarmed also. He spotted Hank searching frantically for his piece of beauty. What's wrong, young fellow? My violin! It's gone! Bobby walked into the kitchen and brought the case out. I didn't want it missing, so I kept it for you. Hank stared at him for a while then snatched the case from his hands. Please, sir, never touch my stuff again, Hank said, running out of the shop and into the thunderstorm. I'm so sorry, young man, Bobby yelled, sincerely apologetic. Hank headed for a bar close by, then took off his hat and coat. He sat on a stool, dropping his violin next to him. He then exhaled and held it tight with his eyes shut. Ah, the world would be a better place without imagining it. One of those abominations killed my parents and took over my state. A man argued from behind him. I'm grateful for what Mr. Steven of Spider Lab has done. Now they know who's boss. Another voice screamed as they laughed. I can't believe those fucks slaughtered all our astronauts that went to Mars with them and then tried to frame it on us, they continued. If I catch any of those pieces of shit, I'm sawing them asunder. I can't wait for Project Corinthian to be launched fully. We can finally get rid of all of them. The thunderclouds had died down as Hank headed out of the bar. Mum, I'm home, Hank said, locking the door behind him and proceeding to take off his coat and drop his violin case. The silence was unusual as Hank walked slowly into the room. Mum, you scared me. I told you, I won't speak to you whenever you come home late, she replied. I'm so sorry, the rain held me back. Hope you didn't play your violin outside. 
Hank turned his face, shying away from the question. Hank, I told you not to do that. You know what happens when you play. Don't you think someone will know you're an imaginet? She whispered. I'm sorry, Mum. Hank sat by her side and cupped her hands in his. Promise me. Promise me you won't play in public again. She coughed. I promise. Have you taken your meds? Yes. Mum, won't you just let me play the violin for you so you can get healed? Hank, I've been sick for seven years. Don't you think it will raise suspicions that you're an Imaginet? Then let's leave. We can go to the Imagine Tower where other Imaginets will welcome us. Have you forgotten that I'm not an Imaginet? You know how much hate they have for humans? She pulled Hank's hand. You are very special. <laughs> That's why they're scared of you. Hank smiled as he gave her a peck on her head and left the room. Imagine Tower How long have we hidden and let the humans treat us like dogs? They have slaughtered us and blamed it on us. But I say it's over, isn't it? The crowd screamed in agreement to the words of the speaker. They have prepared Project Corinthian to get rid of us, and we have FK-76 to get rid of them for us as well. They will pay for what they did in the Imagine Dome. FK-76 will make them pay! A pod with a man inside was brought to the open as the crowd applauded and screamed in joy. This is the future. FK-76 is the future! Our future! The man said and walked to the pod. Poor Hill, Spider Lab. Incoming report, sir. It seems like the Imaginets happen to have FK-76 and are prepping to release it, Adar said. Stephen jolted up from his bed. No, 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 no! Stephen screamed as he smacked his face. Adar, call me all my scientists, now! On that, sir. Stephen reached the conference room where all his scientists awaited his arrival. Welcome. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. FK-76 was just spotted in the Imagine Tower. But that's impossible. I thought we destroyed it on Mars together with their people, a lady said from the crowd. There's no time to waste. If they want war, we will give it to them. I need Corinthian to be prepared before sundown today. I don't care if you have to wipe out a whole village to get him done, Stephen said. But sir... Even if we manage to get Corinthian complete, we still don't stand a chance against FK-76, another scientist said. It possesses ultra-imagination. That means whatever it imagines comes to life. So, it can imagine our death, and it happens immediately, Jason said. The crowd murmured to themselves. Quiet! Stephen screamed. What can be done to stop it? Stephen was restless. Nothing, sir. You can only make your ways right with the Imaginates and plead with them not to release FK-76 or patiently wait for our death to crawl up on us, Jason replied. I will never stoop that low to apologize to those abominations. You guys heard my words. I want Corinthian ready before sundown, Stephen said and walked out of the conference room. His phone buzzed in his pockets. He picked to check the caller, and it was the strange caller who had called earlier. Steven, you had your chance, but you missed it. Don't say I didn't warn you, the caller said, and the line went dead. Steven rushed into his office. Adar, have you identified the caller? I'm so sorry, sir. I haven't. But sir... I think you should see this. Adar pulled up a video to the large TV screen. The truth was out there, in plain sight for all to see. The truth about what really happened on Mars. Adar, how many people have seen this video? Seven million people and still counting. I don't care if you have to hack the server of the channel that posted it, but find me who sent the video to them. Stephen walked to his lab. Mr. Stephen, 
we have a problem, Jason said the moment he entered. What is it? Corinthian isn't responding to the FTH we are feeding him. Are you saying he needs something more? Yes, sir. Then do whatever you have to do to keep him up. Didn't you say you captured uh, an Imaginet who is different? Yes, sir. Our captive produces antimatter, Jason said in a low tone. Then what are you waiting for? Take out every bit of FTH in his system, giving him that power, and feed it to Corinthian, Stephen commanded. Activate hyper-extraction on patient 87, Jason said as he started for Liam. It's working, sir, Jason smiled. Hilltop Town, South Side. I just released the video. Steven has always been a stubborn prick, a deep voice said. So, what do we do now? Another voice said. We find a way to stop the Imaginates from releasing FK-76. We're all doomed if we don't. It's nice everyone thinks I'm dead, but it's high time I reached out to Hank and my wife. Raymond! Someone called. Who's that? He picked up his rifle as he went to the door. Jojo, how many times do I have to tell you to stop screaming my name like that? Raymond wasn't in the best of moods when he opened the door. Sorry, but the whole west side is in chaos. I think someone leaked a video of what really happened on Mars. Everyone is fleeing from here. The Imaginates are heading for the Imagine Towers in large numbers and killing anyone who stands in their way, Jojo kept saying. We shouldn't have released the video this quick, Nicholas said behind Raymond. We have to get moving. You and the others head to the Imagine Towers while I go look for Hank and Sarah, Raymond said as he grabbed his bag and rushed out. Fire raged on almost all the buildings in the west side area of the hilltop town as Raymond searched for Hank and Sarah. Raymond raced for the Imagine Towers. He suspected Hank would be there. Enough is enough! Enough of the lies and the slavery we have been dragged into by humans! Hector, the leader of the Imaginates, screamed. Raymond squeezed through the multitude of Imaginates as he wished to see either his crew or his family. He searched desperately, wondering what his boy would look like and how he would react when he sees him. It's time for FK-76! The crowd screamed in joy. Hector walked towards the pod and stretched forward to open it. Raymond screamed. Wait! Please don't do this! He pleaded. Hector, in shock, shifted away from the pod. What are you doing here? You mean to be dead? Hector said. People, everyone here knows me as Raymond Fisher, the soldier who headed Project Omega. I also released the video of what really happened on Mars. If you have seen the video, you will see that humans were the ones who attacked Imaginates and killed every single one of them to claim the Omega Stone for themselves. My crew and I refused to attack the Imaginates who accompanied us for that mission. But under the order of Stephen Mark, founder of Spider Lab, we were ordered to be left behind on Mars to die. But we survived. Because I am an Imaginate, and I have been hiding it for years. The crowd murmured in amazement to the words of Raymond. They lied to the world that we were heroes who sacrificed ourselves for the world so they could use the Omega Stone to create Corinthian to get rid of us for good. We hear your words, Raymond. But we have no time to hear it further. Hector wasn't letting his urge for wrath slide. They wanted war when they slaughtered us at the dome. We will give them war. Please, I beg of you. FK-76 is not going to be a harm to just the humans, but to us, Raymond pleaded. Hector stretched his hands to open the pod, ignoring Raymond's pleas for reason. What are you doing, Fisher? Are you working for them? Hector screamed. I'm sorry, I can't let you do this. Without warning, Raymond blasted blue energy bolts at Hector. The others in shock raged at Raymond. Raymond inhaled all the air he could get as he summoned an electric force field to protect him and the pod for some time. Since you won't open the force field, then we will do away with your wife and your son, one said as he held up a knife to Hank's throat. Dad, I thought you were dead. Hank said as he struggled to free himself. Raymond was cut to the heart with emotions, 
and had no choice but to drop the force field. Quickly, the Imaginates grabbed him and restrained him with his family. Fisher, you owe me a whole lot of explanation when we're gone here. Sarah couldn't believe her eyes. Raymond Fisher, Hilltop Town's hero and Earth's decorated captain, was alive. Hector recovered from the shock and opened the pod. The gases that helped preserve FK-76 blew out, and water followed in its wake. There was an eerie silence. Then, a man stepped out. An eight-foot-tall man. His eyes were full of scales as he stared around. FK-76 gazed at Hector, and suddenly blood spewed from his mouth. It had just imagined the death of Hector. A lady screamed in the crowd and everyone fled. One by one, the Imaginates exploded like pumpkins. Raymond and his family were hindered from running because of the restrainers placed on them. FK-76 walked gently towards them as they tried to break free from the restrainers. In that moment, a powerful laser beam struck FK-76, knocking him to the ground. Liam! Huey Ramirez's younger brother? Raymond questioned, unsure. No. I'm Corinthian. My consciousness was transferred into this body. Oh no! Corinthian, you can't fight FK-76! Please back down! Raymond pleaded as he broke free from the retainers. I'm not fighting it. I will kill it. FK-76 rose up and raced towards Corinthian. He imagined that Corinthian was powerless, and immediately he lost his power and fell to the ground, helpless. Raymond was making his way towards Corinthian when FK-76 picked him up by the hair. Humans. So fragile. So fragile. So pathetic. So pathetic. FK-76 said. Hank broke his restrainers reached for his violin case, positioned it, and started playing. Hank, no, please stop. He'll kill you, Sarah pleaded. Hank looked at her one last time and squeezed his eyes shut. I love you, were his last words. As his bow struck the strings, everything within his reach froze. FK-76 struggled to get to him, but the notes of the strings held him back even from imagining. As Hank switched notes, everyone around him that was injured got healed. But he grew weak because the more he played, the more it drained him of energy. And so he fell to the ground, exhausted. No more imaginates. FK-76 uttered with a cry. Suddenly, Every Imaginate got stripped of their power, and as he flew towards Hank, who lay almost lifeless, soldiers from the Spider Lab raided the tower that moment and trained their gun at FK-76. Steven came out of one of the vans with the Omega Stone. The Omega Stone hindered FK-76 from imagining anything to reality that will harm him. FK-76 flew into the sky. You idiot! You shouldn't have brought the stone here. You just showed him what he needs to destroy, Raymond said to Stephen as he rushed to pick Hank. You betrayer! You and your crew will pay for this! Stephen threatened. Before the soldiers could even think of moving an inch, the floor opened up to swallow them one by one. The ground began to quake, as buildings sank into the belly of the earth. Raymond raced towards Stephen after confirming Hank's pulse and freeing his wife. He knew fully well that the stone was the only way to stop FK-76. As Stephen tried to run, the ground opened up and swallowed him, crushing him to pieces midway and letting his upper body splatter blood erratically. FK-76 hovered around, surveying what he had caused. The stone fell into the hands of Raymond. He knew this was his last chance to save his family. He raced towards FK-76 with every strength one could muster. As the floor broke off with every step he took, he sprung up towards FK-76 
catching him unawares as he pierced the stone right through FK-76 brain. Your emotions made you weak. FK-76 grabbed Raymond by the arm and muttered his last words before the stone could shut him down. Everyone and everything burns. In that moment, a raging fire engulfed everyone and everything on the earth, burning all that existed to a crisp. It was the end of everything. Nothing remained. No one survived. Hey, Creepypasta fans. It's Thomas. Thanks for listening. To connect with and support us, make sure to check out our Discord and Patreon links in the description. And remember, stay cosmic. Roger that. Our eyes were greeted by the cold and dusty surface of the moon, studded with craters and strewn with rigolith rocks. The moon was much larger than I had envisioned. I was strapping on my spacesuit when a disturbing feeling hit me. I don't feel too well, Tom. I let out in confusion. Same here, Liam, Tom added. You feel the same way too? I asked curiously. Yeah, I have this pain in my head, Tom replied. It's probably nothing. I was ready to take my first step on the moon. We had practiced dozens of simulation missions on the moon for years, and we had dreamt of this moment ever since. Our mission was simple explore the lunar surface for anything strange and collect data and soil samples in just one hour. But we had filled our tanks with enough oxygen to last us 30 more minutes. The surface of the moon was nothing like back on Earth. It was lacking any evidence of life, and it was void of oxygen and atmosphere. It had lots of fine, talcum powder-like dust mixed with a complete variety of pebbles, rocks, and boulders, but it was still a delightful sight. It smells like gunpowder, <laughs> Tom chuckled. The awkward pain in my head grew every second, but I tried to convince myself that it was nothing to worry about. I was standing above the moon, and that seemed to be the most important thing at the moment. 90 minutes, Tom, you ready? I said with excitement, and Tom nodded in agreement. I knew I was born for this moment. I could hear the whispers of fulfillment in my head, and not even a headache would stop me. Is your timer ready? I'd asked one last time and Tom nodded in confirmation. We jumped off the lunar module and turned on the timer. Our first steps on the moon were quite rocky as we fought to regain balance and get used to the moon's gravity. The pain in my head was slowly becoming unbearable and I began to wonder what was causing it. I noticed that Tom was also uncomfortable. Have we done something wrong? I thought to myself. But no, we had heeded to all the necessary precautions. Are you alright, Tom? Not really, Tom replied. I feel like I hit my head on a rock. This was not the experience we had hoped for, but we had to brave through it. We strolled away from our lunar module spacecraft, and I was curious to explore everything I saw. We had to keep watch at our timers, though, so that we would not get too far past our time. Moonwalking was the most intensive task, yet fun part of our short lunar adventure. We feel like an oxymoron of both light and heavy at the same time. Gravity is such a beautiful concept, I thought. Tom was holding up so far, which was a good sign, although he seemed to be feeling the brunt of the pain more than I was. We collected some samples and were already preparing to return to our lunar module. We were both exhausted and the pain in my head had spread to other parts of my body. We knew we had to return immediately if we didn't want to pay a heavy price. My vision was slowly becoming blurred, been contaminated by a space virus, I thought. Several thoughts ran through my head as we made our way back towards our lunar module spacecraft. Where is the spaceship? I was certain that this was the spot. I stared at the gray lunar surface and I could see where our footsteps had begun. My first step was on the lunar surface of the moon, but our spaceship was gone without a trace. Tom fell to the floor. Tom! What's wrong? He had been breathing heavily for a while, and I just wanted to get back into the space module, but now, the entire spacecraft was gone without a trace. 
Uh, I, I, I can't breathe, Tom whispered. I stared at my timer. But it's just been about 70 minutes. We still have almost 20 minutes left. My heart began to race, and I stared in confusion as Tom groaned under his spacesuit. My vision began to blur, and once again the pain in my head had doubled. What is going on? I mused. Everything didn't seem logical anymore. The painful headaches. The blurry vision. And now our missing transport? I dropped to the floor as I occasionally took glances at my timer. What was I going to do about Tom? I couldn't even take off his space helmet as I watched him struggle to stay alive. An explosion erupted behind me as my heart skipped a beat. I stood abruptly and shifted my gaze towards the direction of the sound. A thick mist had enveloped the sight of the explosion. My sight was still blurry, but I could see something move in the distance. My deepest fears were finally becoming a reality. I had always feared that something was going to happen during the trip. I dragged Tom to a spot behind a small moon rock as something approached from the distance. I took a closer look at the footsteps in front of me and realized that they weren't ours. What the? I exclaimed as my heart pounded loudly. Running was not a good idea, as gravity was against us, and Tom had passed out. He was still breathing, and I hope he stayed that way. I took a glance at my timer once again. I had just five minutes to get back into the lunar module before I ran out of oxygen. What could have taken something as huge as our spacecraft without any noise or signs? I became so lost in thoughts that I forgot that I had seen something move in the mist earlier. I heaved a heavy sigh and jerked my head up to see what had moved in the mist. Nothing. Everything had returned to exactly how it was earlier. No explosions. No mist. And no movements. Am I going crazy? I asked myself as I returned my gaze to the alien footprints. They still looked that way. I heard another bang at a distance and immediately shifted my gaze in that direction. I could spot what seemed like our spacecraft in the distance. Maybe I was wrong about where we'd stepped down anyway. A ray of hope burst through my entire being as I immediately grabbed Tom and hopped towards the direction of the spacecraft. I stared at my timer once again and it read three minutes. I had been hopping into space over the moon for about a minute when I noticed that the spacecraft was not getting any closer. I set Tom down. Fear blanketed my face once again as I stood alone on the entire moon in confusion. What was meant to be an adventurous space trip to the moon suddenly took a sharp turn into a terrifying race for survival. The strange mist soon began to form again around me. I was almost convinced that I had lost my mind. I stared at Tom. Tom? Tom! Tom! I screamed in dread, but my voice was shielded by my spacesuit. Tom was gone without a trace. I stared at my timer. One minute. All of a sudden, a foul creature grabbed me from behind tackling me towards the lunar surface and throwing several punches at my helmet. There was something familiar about the alien. I had surely seen it before, but I wondered how. One of its punches made a small crack on my helmet. I had to do something. I immediately buried my knee towards its groin region and propelled it into space with my feet. It seemed to float in space. Suddenly, I remembered where I'd seen the alien. It was a movie back on Earth. My scariest movie. I finally guessed what had been going on all night. Tom, stop! I screamed, but he was probably seeing me too as some sort of extraterrestrial life form. And it took a second before he came to a halt. The mist had settled and we both stood facing each other. He dashed towards me again, throwing his arms forward. I knew it was Tom, so I had to be cautious. I dodged his blow and grabbed him from his back, ripping out one of his oxygen pipes by mistake. As the gas sipped out, my fears were confirmed. We had not been breathing in oxygen since we stepped out of the ship. My timer began to beep. Tom was out of oxygen and fell to the ground unconscious. I shut my eyes and prayed underneath my breath. At least we are going to be recorded in history as the astronauts who never made it back. The two astronauts who died on the moon. I could already imagine the many captions on several magazines trying to describe how we died. I opened my eyes once more and our lunar module stood right in front of me. I couldn't believe my eyes. What is going on? I thought. I shut my eyes and opened them again after a while. The module was gone. I repeated the process, and the lunar module had reappeared. I stared at my timer. It had run down to the very last second. 
I was out of oxygen too. I kept my eyes wide open, grabbed Tom and carried him towards the module. I had also run out of oxygen, but this was our last shot at survival. And if I missed it, then our stories would be told by someone else. I leaped towards the lunar space module as fast as I could. I didn't have any oxygen left and I couldn't even blink, but I kept my mind and my gaze fixed on the goal as I soared forward. I reached the spacecraft, rushed in, and shut the door behind me as we both fell to the ground. Oxygen had never felt so good. I proceeded to take off my spacesuit and toss it on the ground as I tried to wrap my head around what had just happened as the headache began to lift off. Everything still seemed to swirl around us in a distorted manner. I finally shut my eyes and reopened them again, but nothing seemed to disappear anymore. We had both been hallucinating all along. Just then, a thought crashed into my mind as I immediately sprung up and rushed for the oxygen tank. I read the label on the tank. It read, HLN Oxygen. Caution. Causes intense hallucinations. The hallucinating gas we used back on Earth at the space hub for research purposes. But its cylinder looks so much like normal oxygen. Tom had asked me to separate it from the normal oxygen before our mission, but it somehow skipped my mind. We have been hallucinating ever since we put on our spacesuit. I shifted my gaze towards Tom and knelt beside him. He was still breathing. You'll be fine, buddy. I mused as I marked forward to prepare for liftoff. After so many years of dreaming of it, life on Mars was almost a reality. Humanity was so close to finally, officially, being able to call the neighboring planet a second home. Slowly but surely, hundreds of very significant missions from all over the world have done incredible work to make this dream come true. The atmosphere of the planet was almost ready to be completely safe for humans to breathe naturally. All the primary buildings were standing proudly. It wasn't all just scientific bases anymore. There were hospitals, offices, hotels, and more. The first set of carefully planned neighborhoods were halfway done. The first few hundred habitants would be arriving very soon. One of the most important parts about making a new planet completely habitable for humans was making sure it was possible to harvest food. For decades, the best scientists have dedicated their lives to studying Mars' surface and soil and the way our usual seeds reacted to it all. The process was succeeding greatly. It was proved that not only people on Mars could grow perfectly good fruits and vegetables, but also some lively flowers to make life just as colorful on a new planet. However, this red planet had its secrets. It comes as no surprise that human scientists aren't content with one discovery, with one success, with just one hypothesis confirmed. It is even less surprising that, under the motivation of profit, humans are unafraid to cross all boundaries, break all rules, skip over all warnings. Sometimes this could be rewarding and the source of some of the things humanity has created, but sometimes this greed can be responsible for the greatest horrors, the most catastrophic consequences, and the absolute worst case scenario possible. In this case, everything started on the big facility where the agricultural development was taking place. More precisely, on a small building on its side. This discreet, almost unnoticeable place existed in a very confidential way. The people that worked there rarely left the building. They had dormitories on the upper floor, and they avoided interaction with all other fellow scientists. This extreme level of secrecy was due to the experiments that took place in that malicious and immoral building. It was called the Dark Venus Unit. Not an irony toward the planet, but in honor of the Venus flytrap. An infamous subject there. The Dark Venus Unit worked under the leadership of the brothers Gabe and Evan Clayton. Occasionally, some careful assistants passed by the unit, always under a mountain of non-disclosure agreements. But... They never lasted long. This was due to many reasons. Partially, it was because the Clayton brothers weren't particularly kind and welcoming to strangers. 
Plus, they were extremely jealous and protective of their work. But a big part of the assistant's resistance to long-lasting work was because of the subject of the work itself. The things that the young scientists saw in the Dark Venus unit were fascinating at first, but soon they would be troubling, and then problematic. But soon enough, they were utterly disturbing things. As soon as they walked down the stairs toward the basement of the building, though, every single one of them quit the day after. So most of the time, it was just Gabe and Evan. They worked diligently and passionately. They devoted their lives to the plants growing in the Dark Venus unit. They put their entire hearts into their work. But, as most people might argue upon discovering the horrible secrets these two men were responsible for, they had vile, dark, and venomous hearts. Before everything ended tragically, it started with a normal day. On the upper floor, Evan woke up in the mid-morning, feeling good about his day. He went through his morning routine and the basics of living in a secret laboratory on the surface of Mars. A healthy breakfast, a shower, a pristine suit, and a lab coat. And nobody could have guessed the things he had created. Then he descended to the main floor of the laboratory, where things could be unsettling for some people, but at first glance it was mostly just beautiful. There it was in all its glory, rows upon rows of the most incredible plants someone could imagine. Things that shouldn't be possible were made possible by Gabe and Evan. That was their job. They didn't manipulate the soil from Mars to adapt to the Earth's seed. They combined both and created unimaginable things. There was a section of fruits that, although beautiful, could melt human flesh. There was a table filled with rose bushes that vibrated and buzzed, and if cut from the stems, could move by themselves for days. Vegetables of impossible colors, leaves of irrational textures, roots moved like tentacles under the soil, and branches had hissed and grumbled when touched. Evan would spend his morning tending to these beautiful and sometimes hardly comprehensible plants he was responsible for. But first things first, he needed to check the specimens in the basement. That's where his brother would be waiting for him. Gabe took the night shift and Evan the day shift. But this day, things were different. Evan was walking toward the door that led to the basement when said door was slammed open. Good, you're awake, Gabe said. He didn't look very relieved, though. He was sweating. His own tie was missing, and his entire self looked more than a little disheveled. Lucy is giving me some trouble today, Gabe explained. The news made Evan gulp nervously. He was proud of their work. He didn't harvest a single regret in his heart. In fact, if given the chance to go even farther and test even more dangerous extremes, he would do so without batting an eyelash. That, however, didn't mean he couldn't experience fear of his own creations. Silently, the two brothers descended the stairs. There, they were greeted only by dim lighting. A tepid smell and nearly suffocating humidity. The creatures in the basement preferred complete darkness, but the Clayton siblings weren't so sure they could survive down there without at least a little light. The basement worked very differently from the main floor. Down there, there were no tables, no order, and no rules. By the time Gabe and Evan discovered the unbelievable properties of the Mars surface, they decided to take two routes. They would harvest tulips that floated an inch above their stems on the main floor of the lab. And in the basement, they would grow their organic beasts. How is everyone? Evan asked as he did every day upon descending the last step from the staircase and into the damp soil. His brother sighed gravely. He didn't have time for the usual routine, but he did his best. They passed by each of their most bizarre experiments. Bobby is in good shape, but he's nervous. He can sense there is something bad going on around him. 
Then Gabe pointed toward a four-foot-tall translucent egg of gelatinous texture that had spurred, initially from a simple pumpkin seed. Debbie is under control as well. She's burning at just a slightly higher temperature than usual, but I don't think there's a reason to be concerned yet. Then Gabe waved toward a climbing plant that covered one corner of the room. From its blossoms, somehow flower small rivers of burning lava, which pooled at that one impenetrable corner, kept contained by a special barrier about a foot tall. And that's it, Gabe stated grimly. What do you mean? His brother inquired a little breathlessly. What about Thomas? A sort of cactus that grew under a protective glass dome due to its ability to shoot its thorns at random intervals. And the twins? A pair of immense Venus flytraps with sharp teeth that constantly tried to eat each other. And they're gone, Evan! Gabe snapped. Lucy attacked, okay? She ate them all. There was a moment of tense silence, and each brother knew exactly what the other was thinking. Lucy was the best and worst of their creations. Like most things that had been left in the basement, Lucy was born as an accident. They experimented with different seeds from Earth and different treatments to the soil from Mars. One day, they got a leaf, and it was stronger than steel. They watched in awe as Lucy grew, more and more leaves getting bigger, heavier, stronger, impenetrable, unkillable. It was an extremely complex plant, resembling a moss-green crab the size of a crocodile that slithered freely in the darkness of that secret basement. Then the roots started moving and leaving the earth underneath and exploring the expanse of the room. Soon enough, they confirmed their suspicions. Lucy had developed a conscience. Before Evan could ask, Gabe said it. She went underground. I can't find her, but I can feel her moving underneath my feet, I think. She's waiting to attack. I don't care what you think, Evan. I'm calling this off, and I'm going to go get help. As if their devilish plant had listened to her creator speaking ill of her, she silently creeped out from the soil and attacked. But not the Clayton brothers, no. First, the monster raised a powerful leaf in the air and struck Bobby the mysterious egg. It cracked and spilled in a furious splash, leaking something akin to amniotic fluid all over the ground. The smell was awful, but the real bone-chilling factor was the nearly deafening cry of a baby, or whatever frightening thing was lying at the bottom of the broken egg. With their shoes wet and their hearts racing, the Clayton brothers didn't even have time to react before they heard an even more alarming crash, like a hammer coming down on a building. Lucy's steel-like leaves came down on the barrier that kept the lava contained, and suddenly it was starting to spill forward. Evan and Gabe started screaming. They ran toward the stairs, but from the ground, a massive leaf burst out, blocking their way and threatening to smash them down. They tried to turn to their right, but the lava was spreading faster and faster. They switched to their left, but the baby's cries were growing louder and louder, though not enough to hide the sound of a third and maybe fourth set of footsteps splashing on the spilled liquid. Refusing to see the monsters they had created, the brothers ran in the opposite direction, even though there was no exit. They scurried from side to side, but they still felt the ground trembling underneath their feet with the power of an unexplainable creature hunting them down. Finally, Evan grabbed his brother's arms and stopped him. Then he told him, Lucy was mine, right from the beginning. I'd let this go for too long. Go get help, or let us destroy ourselves here quietly. But save yourself. Evan pushed his brother as hard as he could away from him. Gabe fell down near the stairs, and he had no option but to watch his brother stand tall while five massive leaves erupted from the ground and stood menacingly over him. Mercifully, the last of the light bulbs went out in that instant. The two brothers 
screamed in agony at the same time. <coughs> but only one of them made it out of there alive. We were nearing our target. The three of us were riding a small and reliable spacecraft. One of those compact, automatic little things that you could take to a place and back without having to push a single button. Mainly, it was because everything nowadays works pretty much like that, on a precise and flawless schedule. So a machine drops you off at work somewhere in the galaxy, and then picks you up at the exact time you were supposed to be done. We don't make mistakes. That, of course, is a lie. I know that because my entire job is clearing up after other people's mistakes. An additional reason for us to be riding an automatic ship was because none of us were pilots, and you couldn't expect a pilot to waste their time on a mission like this. We aren't heroes. We are the ones who clean up the mess when a hero fails. On the bright side, my team and I have plenty of time to hang out and have fun before we arrive at the destination. Come on, Charlie. My right-hand woman, Michelle, told me. Are you seriously not going to tell us anything about this mission until we arrive? I thought we were a team. I thought we were friends. I thought we were family, Stuart added. And he wasn't wrong. We were family. He was considerably younger than Michelle and me. So he had worked with us pretty much all of his adult life so far. I was almost done considering him a little kid. Almost. What is it? Michelle asked again. Relentless as always. Did someone find a brand new alien and let it loose? Did a renowned pilot mess with the fuel again and explode his new ship? Or better yet, was it a dramatic breakup between the crew that led to the dismantling of the entire station? <laughs> Michelle and Stuart burst out laughing, and I let them have fun. They continued coming up with crazy scenarios that weren't too far from things we had dealt with in the past. In reality, our work isn't that much fun. Clearing up destroyed spaceships means something went wrong, and when something goes wrong in space, usually, there are dead bodies waiting for us. But I let my team have their fun. It was the only way they had of coping. I refrained from warning them about our current mission. After all, I didn't know much about it either. All I knew was a set of coordinates were waiting for us to clean up. Finally, our little ship arrived at the side of a larger station. While the two ships connected, and all systems prepare for our arrival, I finally had to address my team. Listen up, guys. I know we've done this a million times, but you should know by now that no mission is ever the same as the others. We were called here because this shift suffered an unexpected tragedy. Our job will be to give the standard necessary treatment. If there's contamination, we sterilize. If there's a creature, we neutralize. If there are bodies, we bring them back. And if there's a leak of sensitive information, we drop it into a black hole. Don't we, boss? Michelle asked bitterly. I know she wasn't happy with some parts of our job, but we did what we did for the benefit of all of humanity. She must understand that. The three of us stood on the gate that would lead us from our small ship to our target and waited for the doors to open. We wore our full space gear for safety in case the other ship's structure was damaged or the air contaminated. So when Stuart put his hand on my shoulder, it felt heavier than usual. Hey, Charlie, what were all those ifs? You don't know what's waiting for us on the other side? He asked me. Before I had a chance to confirm his fears, the doors made a strange noise. They were trying to open up, but something was holding them back. The sound of the metal struggling to move was irritating enough to keep us from thinking something worse. <sighs> I groaned and reached forward to try to open the doors manually, and I instantly regretted it. It worked, but the door snapped open with such sudden force that I was thrown back into the arms of my team. They caught me but they didn't pull me away fast enough to avoid the contamination. The thing that had been blocking the door was the strangest thing that I'd ever witnessed, and that is coming from someone that works on space disasters. The unknown substance was leaking, or better yet, oozing down from a crack on the ceiling of the gate. It reminded me of old school petroleum in its natural state. It was thick, but mostly liquid, black as only the end of the known universe was. 
and it was pulsating in a way that had the three of us gagging in disgust from just looking at it. And a big drop of it had just fallen on my shoe. No way, Michelle said. What is that? Boss, what do we do about your shoe? Stuart added. I quickly recovered and took the lead of the mission. Keep calm, I instructed them. I have full protection. We'll take this drop as a sample. Let's do a full tour of the ship to assess the damage. Determine everything we have to take care of. Then we'll run a quick test on the solid substance and decide what to do about it. It's unlike anything I've ever seen before. However, as soon as the three of us fully stepped into the ship, our confidence started to waver. To say this mission was unusual would have been an understatement. At first, the spaceship looked completely normal, just desolated. But then we came across more and more of that gross and mysterious substance. It leaked from panels in the walls. It bubbled out of corners. It completely blocked some doors. The more I looked at it, the more bizarre it was. It was perfectly black and lustrous, but it bubbled as if it were boiling hot. I couldn't smell it, and I thought perhaps that was for the better. I was already feeling tired and lightheaded. That's when we found the first body. <sighs> there he is. I sighed sadly. An engineer judging by attire. But if he's wearing full gear like us, Michelle continued for me. That means he knew. He was protecting himself. They were in trouble, Charlie. Something terrible must have happened here. We have to complete our tour of the entire ship. Then we'll be back for him. I declared, trying to keep my composure, but then Stuart yelled, Holy shit! The corpse moved. But no, it wasn't a natural move. It wasn't the engineer coming back to life. It wasn't his body moving. His body was being dragged slowly away from us. I lightly kicked his leg with my boot, and when he moved, we saw that he was lying in a pool of the black and unexplainable substance. That undistinguishable stuff was moving. It was oozing, following the artificial gravity of the ship. It was forging a path of its own and dragging an entire human body with it. <gasps> I gasped, just like my two partners. But I was experiencing shortness of breath. I was struggling to breathe, so I tried to calm myself down. I avoided talking and just signaled my team that we should move forward. The body was being dragged away slowly. We ran in the direction it was moving, and it made me wish that we had never gotten there in the first place. I don't even have the words to describe it. It was a hopeless tomb, a deadly nest, the source of evil, and we were staring straight at it. The front glass of the ship had a rupture right in the middle, but nothing could come in or out of it because it was blocked by that indomitable black material. My first guess was that it had crashed against the ship and broken in. It dripped down the controllers and collapsed the ship. <coughs> the shell scream made me snap out of my analysis. The pilot and co-pilot were still there, barely. The pilot was still in a seat, but he was covered from head to toe in that deadly blackness. We only knew there was a body underneath because there was still a limp hand hanging from that huge mass of revolting bubbling, pitch black mass. The co-pilot had tried to escape, and he was lying on the floor of the cabin while the gruesome secretion ate him away. The worst part was his face. His expression was of pure terror and agony. There was no doubt he was dead. His skin was so gray. I took a look at his lifeless eyes and noticed he wasn't crying. The black sludge was leaking from his eyes. It had penetrated through his suit and his skin, and it was eating him from the inside out. Michelle and Stuart grasped my arms and tried to pull me away from there, but I felt a different pull too. I was feeling sick. My heartbeat was fast, but my lungs were slower each time, and something was pulling on my foot. It was the drop of that evil substance. It was dragging me back to its home. Run! I told my team with a fragile voice that quickly became demanding and desperate. Run! Run! Back to our ship! 
Now! Lock yourselves in there and wait. It's all you can do. They tried to drag me with them, and I was glad they did. That devilish substance was alive, and it could feel us moving away from its core. Suddenly, everything we saw on our way in was much worse on our way out. The darkness stopped oozing in the corners. It started dripping like an acid shower from parts of the ceiling, rushing out of the panels of the floor like a furious river. My only goal was to push Michelle and Stuart away, blocking them with my body as much as I could. When the time came, I pushed my team inside our ship. They cried and protested, but they were so frightened and shocked that they couldn't do anything else. I activated the gate and I stood there, taking in the dark venom in my body while the doors closed. As I started to faint, I was reassured by only one thing, one thing only. My team knew that in case of an extreme contamination, there was only one solution, destroy the entire ship. The morning winds blew in from the north, dancing beneath the clear blue skies with a surge of expectations. The rising sun now edging over the mountains in the east and casting dark shadows upon the trees opposite the airport. Bobby Allen flooded his lungs with enough air before drawing his jacket tightly over his shoulders as they made their way out of the airport. It had been a long flight, and they were finally in the heart of Egypt. D do you know that the pyramids of Giza were built more than 1,000 years before the reign of King Tut? Bobby Allen could not mask his excitement. He had dreamt of visiting the Great Pyramids since he was a kid. His father had always told him that he had some Egyptian descent. Who the hell is King Tut? A voice echoed from behind him. Bobby Allen adjusted his glasses, preparing to bore his classmates with a lengthy lecture about the short reign of King Tutankhamun. When a husky man emerged from a long bus and strolled into the scene, he must be the tour guide, Bobby thought. Aha! You must be the students from Sunview High. Welcome to Cairo. The man spoke with a certain elegance and cheer. I've been waiting for you all. You can call me Asim. I'm your tour guide. Come on, we're running late, he said, motioning towards the bus. Everyone had thought Principal Tyler was kidding when he had informed them about an all-expense-paid tour to the Great Pyramids of Egypt only a few weeks ago. But here they were, all at the edge of Northern Africa, home to endless pages of rich history and culture. Bobby Allen had always wanted to visit the pyramids since he was a child. He was excited to be on the trip, and his curiosity was at its peak. The scorching sun was now high up in the sky as they arrived at the most celebrated Great Pyramids of Giza, located on the plateau on the west side of the Nile River. It is rumored that the pyramids were once burial sites for the great pharaohs of ancient Egyptian dynasties. Bobby recalled the many scary movies he had watched about the pyramids as a kid. He wasn't hoping to stumble on an actual mummy. Those were myths. Anyway. Are there real mummies in here? Amelia asked as though she had read his thoughts. Her fluent British accent instantly captivating Asim's attention. Of course not, Bobby replied rolling his eyes as he spoke. Don't be so sure, young man. Asim had a tiny smirk on his face. There are still many undiscovered chambers in this great architecture. Mummies have been discovered inside these pyramids in the past. There could be more. Perhaps a cursed mummy who's gonna haunt you at all night. Everyone, including Principal Tyler, burst out laughing at Asim's sarcasm. Bobby's eyes were caught in Amelia's for a split second. He swallowed hard and walked briskly past her to meet his best friend, Ned. Bobby Allen was the smart high school nerd that no one cared about. He had a crush on Amelia, but he was too shy to tell her, even though it was already obvious. He had been caught several times staring at her, and even though Ned had tried to convince him to tell her about it, he was too scared to try. The first day strolled by quickly. Asim knew that they were exhausted from their long journey, so he took them on a quick tour around told them the do's and don'ts, and gave them detailed maps of the place in case anyone wound up missing. The next day was going to be long and adventurous, so he advised them to get some rest. Do you know that there are actually more than 100 pyramids in Egypt? 
Bobby had been going on about several facts relating to the pyramids since he stepped off the airplane. Even though it was beginning to get annoying, no one complained because the fun facts were actually quite fun and engaging. Amelia listened to each fact, although she remained quiet too. They had just entered into the pyramids for a quick tour before the main tour the next day. Yeah, I read that somewhere, Ned let out. I also read that most of the stones used in constructing the Great Pyramid are heavier than an average elephant. I wonder how they move the stones? Someone else spoke from amongst them. There should be a lot of creepy stuff around here. Bobby spotted something move, like some sort of shadow. Ned, did you see that? Bobby whispered. Ned didn't hear him. Bobby began to drift from the rest of his mates in curiosity, and he soon wandered off into a dark hollow at a secluded corner. It was as though he was in a trance. His gaze was fixed on a strange symbol inscribed on one of the stones. He drew closer towards the strange inscription and ran his hand across it. Something subtly pricked his hand as a voice called out in unison. Bobby! He turned in shock. It was Ned. Ow! He groaned in pain. What? You wandered off. I was looking for you. It's time to go. Ned had a perplexed look on his face as he spoke. What? What's wrong? Ned asked curiously. Oh, I was just... Um... Bobby searched his thoughts, but he couldn't seem to remember what had happened. He raised his hands to his face, and he spotted a drop of blood dancing on his palm. It felt like a needle prick, but it hurt much more than just a needle. It's probably nothing, he thought. It's nothing. Come on, let's go, he said as they both joined up with the rest of their classmates and strolled out of the pyramid. The lonely crescent moon stared from the clear night sky as the stars began to gather around. Calm music and indistinct chatter could be heard from afar as the students gathered outside of their tents. Principal Tyler wanted to ensure that they had had the full-time tour experience, so he had ditched expensive hotels for outdoor camping. It was a beautiful night. I think you should tell Amelia how you feel. This seems like the perfect moment, Bobby. Come on, Ned. I'm a nerd. Bobby stopped short, realizing that it rhymed. <laughs> I don't think she's going to want anything to do with me. Come on, Bob. Ned wasn't going to give up easily. You're smart. You're like a walking encyclopedia of knowledge. We both know that girls like her don't like guys like me. Bobby searched the environment for any signs of Amelia, and he soon spotted her standing alone at some distance. She moved with class and elegance, and she was difficult to sway. Almost every guy at Sunview High wanted her, but she paid very little attention to their flattery. Bobby never had dreamt that Amelia would ever take notice of him. Besides, he was just one of the many guys seeking her attention. He looked closer and realized that she was staring intently at him too. Bobby quickly returned his gaze to Ned. Hey, Ned! She's staring at me! Bobby whispered. Here's your chance, dude! Ned replied. Besides, this is a perfect time. She's alone, and you don't have anything to lose. Except the scars of rejection, Bobby said sarcastically before taking a quick glance at Amelia. She was still looking in his direction with a wide grin on her face. Oh, she's glorious. <sighs> he heaved a heavy sigh before walking towards her. Bobby could feel sparks of electricity swirl inside of him, but he refused to stop. Hi, I'm Amelia. Oh, she's friendly. Bobby felt a little relief. I, um, I'm, I, I'm Bobby, Bobby Allen. Bobby stroked his hair, attempting to cover up for his nervousness. I know who you are, Amelia replied. You, you do? Bobby was still struggling to look her in the eye. His gaze was fixed on his shoes as he searched his thoughts for his next words. I, uh, um... Just want to ask if your day was as beautiful as you are, and I, I just had to tell you, your beauty made me truly appreciate being able to see. Bobby caught Amelia by surprise. He looked up and their gazes met instantly, her attractive eyes staring down at him. She still had a smile on her face, which was a good sign. That wasn't so hot, was it? Amelia said calmly. Bobby looked confused. He was definitely not expecting her to reply the way she just did, and more importantly, he wasn't certain about what she meant by the reply. Can I buy you a drink? Bobby had started getting comfortable. Sure. Amelia replied in delight. Are your hands heavy? I could hold them for you. 
Bobby continued to flatter her with his incredible pickup lines, and Emilio was obviously loving it. She laughed aloud with excitement before placing her left hand in Bobby Allen's. Bobby turned to Ned, who was still watching from a distance, and waved at him in gratitude before wandering away with Amelia. It had been a long day, but Bobby knew that he would not be able to sleep at night. Bobby was awoken the next morning by a terrible nightmare. His heart raced and his body was drenched in his sweat. A familiar voice resounded throughout the place. It was Principal Tyler, and it was time for the main tour around the pyramids. Bobby had slept like a baby anyway. He rushed out of his tent and instantly spotted Amelia. She hurried towards him as soon as she saw him and wrapped her hands around his. There were about 30 students who embarked on the tour and every student had a surprised look on their face. Even Ned acted surprised too. The duo didn't care anyway. They were definitely going to have the adventure of their lives. At least, so they thought. The morning had begun on a refreshing note. Bobby thought about his dream the previous night and even though he couldn't remember most of it, he could sense that it must have been terrifying. Loud grunts of camels could be heard in the distance as all the students led by Asim made their way towards the Great Pyramids of Giza. Bobby would have loved to ride one of the camels, but that would probably be fun for another day. They had an entire week, and it was time to get to his mini list of adventures he would love to experience in the pyramids ready. He had been in the pyramid for a few minutes when a severe ache crashed into his head. Ugh. He groaned quietly under his breath, but Amelia noticed. Bobby, what's wrong? Bobby? Ned and Amelia had stopped and they were now staring at Bobby as he staggered away from his classmates. Amelia tried to move closer to him. You, you guys should go ahead. I'm fine. I just need some fresh air. Bobby replied calmly. You don't look fine. Are you sure you... Ned, yeah, I, I said, said I'm fine. fine. Ned and Amelia jerked back at the sound of his voice. His voice sounded like a broken trumpet, like two different people were speaking through him. Something was definitely not right. Bobby could hear loud noises in his head. Was he going crazy? He thought. Amid the noise, he could hear a faint voice calling in. Somehow, he beckoned to the sound of the voice and strolled to the inscriptions on the wall that had pricked him on the previous day. Ned and Amelia trailed closely. Bobby approached the wall and began to chant some words. Bobby, what are you doing? Doing, Ned whispered. Suddenly, Bobby disappeared into thin air as the duo gasped in shock. <gasps> they exchanged quick glances and rushed back to a seam in fear to tell him what had just happened. Bobby suddenly found himself in a dark room. It looked like some sort of Egyptian burial chamber with several sarcophagi present. A dark entity slowly emerged from one of them. It looked very similar to a genie. It had no true form like a ghost and it had a terrifying look on its face. Violet eyes shining in the darkness. Pharaoh Blight. The entity said in a hoarse voice. It hovered in the dark, moving closer towards Bobby, who was now acting totally against his will. The alien creature had been trapped in the pyramids for generations. Only true blood can contain me. I am free. The creature moved like the wind and forced its way into Bobby through its mouth. Bobby groaned in discomfort, but the deed had been done. Everyone from Sunview High led by Asim were now standing in front of where Ned and Amelia claimed they had seen him vanish. The inscriptions were gone though. I, I, I am sure it was here, Ned protested. A loud scream erupted from somewhere in the pyramid. Several tourists were now sprinting out of the pyramids. A seam raced towards the source of the scream. A female tourist was now lying on the floor in a puddle of her blood. Ned and Amelia exchanged glances. They prayed underneath their breath that it wasn't what they were thinking. Something else was amongst them, and it had just killed someone. Alert security! Close the gates! A seam barked. The tour is over for today. No one leaves until everybody is safe and we know who the killer is. Do you think it's wise to keep us locked up here with a killer on a rampage? Principal Tyler looked uneasy. Their fun tour had suddenly become very weird. Do you want to teach me my job? Asim asked as he walked briskly away. Kill her! Sacrifice her! Break our seal! And release our bones! 
Bobby could hear those words clearly. He had to sacrifice someone he loved to fully unlock the darkness. Bobby suddenly reappeared right in front of Amelia, with a dagger in his hands. Do it! Kill her! Do it! Kill her! He could hear the screams in his head. Kill her! Everyone was caught by surprise, and they stared in shock at the unfolding events. Bobby! Don't do this! Ned cried. Amelia stared straight into Bobby's eyes as hot tears strolled down her cheeks. Bobby was resisting control. I'm... I'm... I'm sorry, Amelia. But Bobby was far stronger than the darkness had ever imagined. He drove the dagger right through his heart and dropped to the ground as a loud screech was heard. Bobby! No! Bobby! <laughs> Ned screamed and cried. Amelia caught him right in her arms as he took his last breath. Bobby Allen had taken his life to save hers. There's a sound nearby. At first, I think it's static or a malfunction in the communication device of my spacesuit, but it isn't. There's a shuffling sound or like the hiss of a snake hiding in plain sight. It's the sound of danger boiling right before exploding in our faces. And then something hits my back. I turn around hastily, jumping in place. But I'm only met with laughter from a friend. <laughs> hey, Gerard, calm down, man. It's okay. We made it here. We're safe. I stare into the calm blue eyes of Thomas, the captain of the ship that brought us here, a brand new exoplanet to claim for humanity. I nod in acknowledgement of his words and put in a brave smile on my face. The trip here was far from uneventful, and we had to dodge more obstacles than expected. But we finally made it. I'm probably just paranoid after being so tense during the entire trip. This planet is beautiful. It is smaller than Earth. Very rocky with strange and sparse vegetation but an abundance of clear water that came and went from big mountains, caves, and great lakes for as far as we can see. We're supposed to celebrate our success, not jump at the shadows lurking around us. I leave Thomas behind and approach the two other members of our crew. Natasha and Isabel were standing by the American flag we planted on the surface of the planet as soon as we landed. Natasha the youngest member of the crew, was entertained studying the way the flag floated and quivered, suspended in the unfamiliar air of this planet. She was saying, Look around you, Liz. This planet is the most worth exploring I've ever seen. That makes Isabel laugh. <laughs> it's the only planet besides Earth that you know, she reminds the other woman. I say that we should take the free time to rest inside the ship before we have to start the journey back to Earth. Come on. Natasha throws her back, laughing wholeheartedly, while Isabel tries to drag her back to the ship, and I laugh along with them. <laughs> it's a perfect scene. The dreamlike planet, my friends having fun, our ship like a second home waiting for us. And then, the scream. <coughs> It's bone chilling, a scream of the deepest terror possible to man. I'm frozen in place, still staring at the two women as they clutch each other tightly and scream horrified. But my entire body has turned to ice. I start shaking before I'm able to move. And then finally, I turn my head, already feeling like I might cry from how scared I am. 
The scene behind me is the complete opposite of the unbridled joy from just a minute ago. Thomas is still standing right where I left him, but he isn't alone anymore. There's a... a creature right behind him. A creature bigger than any human being, devoid of hair or scales, just dark, gray, wrinkled skin like a giant rat, like like a demon of black shiny eyes and open jaws that's holding the captain of our ship with a single limb as if he was a rag doll. The captain is still screaming. The extraterrestrial notices the three of us watching and opens its jaws even more. For a second, I'm worried that thing is about to eat Thomas in front of our eyes just to immediately lunge forward and take us down one by one. Instead, the terrifying beast screams too. I expect the roar of a bear, the shrill yell of a rat, and somehow got both. A high-pitched cry that makes me flinch and try to cover my ears if it weren't for the helmet of my suit and underneath a deep booming groan that I feel rattling in my bones. Instinctively, I take tentative steps backward doubled over in pain as I watch that beast scream at us, but my focus is on Thomas. Our captain isn't screaming anymore. I can tell he's gritting his teeth to bear the pain of the overwhelming noise coming from the spot right above his head. There are tears slipping down his cheeks, and I could be wrong, but I think I see his ears starting to bleed. I'm still watching them when the monster finally quiets down, and then, a second later, and still holding Thomas against its torso, that thing turns around and sprints away. It takes a big leap, and I can't help but run in the same direction, desperate to save my captain and friend. Then I feel two pairs of arms holding me back from certain death. The monster had jumped down a steep and rocky cliff and it was currently hurrying on three of its limbs to get to a cave. Let me go! I yell, strolling against the hold of my two remaining partners. We have to go after him! Stop, Gerard! Use your head! Isabel exclaims. We can't go against the creature with our bare hands. We can't. But we can't leave him, right? Natasha speaks up next. We have to. We have to. Oh my god. The young woman is just unable to process the magnitude of her predicament. She lets go of my arm and stumbles away from us back to the safety of the ship. There's a bit of silence between Isabel and me as we both consider our options. We are all more than partners on a mission. We have all worked together on different tasks before. We are friends and this journey turned us into a family. But Isabel has always beat me at quick thinking when facing a challenge. Her next words send chills down my entire body. Gerard, before you make a choice, I need you to be extremely aware of a few things. We do not stand a chance against that creature. We don't know if there are more like it. And we are in their territory, Gerard. This is their home. And we don't know more than what satellite scans show us. We're nothing, Gerard. For those things, we can be a meal. We can be a toy. We could be a sacrifice. If we go looking for our friends, nobody will do the same for us. We might as well be alone in the universe right now. Like it or not, Thomas might be dead already. Going after him is a suicide mission if I've ever seen one. But I know that you're not going to leave him. And I refuse to lose two members of my team today. When Isabel was done talking, I smile at her. I can feel my heart beating like it wants to burst out of my chest. I know we have never been this scared in our entire lives, but in a situation like this, having someone by your side just makes you feel invincible. We have weapons on the ship, I remind her. We don't even know if they would work on this planet, Isabel retorts. Tell that to Natasha. I reply with a grin. Then, Isabel turns around and sees what I had been watching over her shoulder. Natasha had just pulled every weapon stored in the ship for emergencies, and she was currently aiming some type of gun at the horizon. 
We watch, holding our breath as Natasha pulls the trigger of the gun. It works. I have a feeling the bullet travels at a slightly slower pace than on Earth, and Natasha visibly loses her balance of the unfamiliar recoil in this gravity. But, damn, <laughs> it works. We take as many weapons and tools as we can carry, and we go on our way. It's the beginning of our suicide mission, and nothing could have prepared me for what was to come. We approach the edge of the cliff, where the extraterrestrial disappeared with Thomas, and we began our descent. It's steep. It should be manageable. But I can shake off my mind that one wrong step could lead us to our death. The greenish rocks tremble and come loose as we step on them. We grit our teeth, tense our muscles, and keep walking. At some point, Isabel steps on an unsteady rock and loses her footing. She screams with everything she has until Natasha catches her in her arms. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Isabel whispers again and again in a trembling voice. It's unsettling seeing firsthand the way high stakes manage to break down even the strongest of people. But then she blurts out, I don't want any of us to die here. And that's it. She's back with renewed strength and moving even faster than before. We check the radar on our portable communication device. It shows that Thomas is nearby, so we know which way to go. But it also shows him offline. He can't hear us. We can't hear him. Dead or alive, his suit has suffered a malfunction. Finally, we reach the entry to a large cave like a tunnel big enough for a truck to pass by comfortably. Inside, the rock loses its green tint and everything turns gray. The cave is endless darkness and it makes my hair stand on end, feeling like it's a creature even bigger than the one before, waiting for us with open jaws and we're willingly walking into its hungry insides. Although our suits are equipped with lights on our shoulders to show us the way, the overwhelming darkness around us forces us to turn on individual flashlights that we have to hold along with our guns. Slowly but surely, we move forward. The cave gets darker. The space starts to narrow. And the worst part is the ramifications of the main tunnel. The sensors tell us that Thomas is somewhere ahead of us so we stick to the main path and hope for the best. But it's almost impossible not to wonder what's hiding in those other routes. Some of the other tunnels are so small that our monster couldn't have passed through them. Could they have been carved out by a different creature? Ancient rocks destroyed by the sheer power of extraterrestrial teeth and claws? Through some tunnels, some currents of freezing or boiling hot air so strong that the sensors in our suits go crazy and we have to walk faster before the temperature kills us. Then, there are the tunnels that feel... alive. Have I lost my mind? I wonder. Maybe... maybe the fear has contaminated my brain, making me see things that aren't there. Tunnels that disappear. Openings on the walls of the cave that are there one second and completely covered the next. Tunnels that I swear move along with us. Holes that are breathing, yawning, making a trickery of us. Perhaps the worst one is the one Natasha spots before the rest of us. Guys, don't look to your right, she says unexpectedly. Her words make me feel like there's ice flowing through my veins. And halfway through, she starts crying as she says, Whatever you do, don't look. Please, trust me on this, if nothing else. You don't want this. If I tell you to run, do it. But I'm begging you not to look. Just don't look at it. Don't see them, please. Oh my god. When we're past that part of the tunnel, Isabel immediately turns around and takes Natasha in her arms. Are you okay? She asks repeatedly, but I fail to hear the other woman's answer. 
I'm distracted in front of me at the end of the tunnel. There's our captain, our Captain Thomas, my friend, but there's also a gigantic nest and at least two of the monsters lying inside it. I feel like I'm in a daze as I approach the alien nest slowly. I can tell Thomas's helmet has cracked and his suit is all dirty and torn in places. But the planet's atmosphere must be bearable for humans since I can see his chest rise and fall rapidly. I'm not sure if... Uh, I have no idea if he will live to tell his tale. But he's still alive and that's all I need to know. Thomas! Hey, Tommy! I whisper his name. My voice is trembling. It's like all at once the entire tunnel has gone quiet. The strange sounds, the footsteps, the whispers, the fluttering noises, the water dripping, everything coming from the dark corners have quieted down. And my words sound loud like thunder, but I keep going. Tommy, come on, wake up, please. It's me. Can you hear me? There are only a few feet separating me from Thomas now. The second I see his eyelids start to flutter as he finally opens his eyes again, I know for sure in my heart that this was the right thing to do. But our problems are far from over. A grumbling sound makes me raise my head and look up at what's standing above Thomas. The two extraterrestrials are standing on their hind legs, very awake now, staring me down and baring their teeth at me. They open their jaws. I can't stop looking at their black eyes. I'm afraid those soulless depths would be the last thing I'll see when I die. And then, there's a shot. Twin bullets go through right through the center of these monsters' heads. They fall back screaming and writhing in pain, but somehow still alive. I have no time to ponder about their anatomy. Only then it clicks in my mind that these two are smaller than the one that took Thomas. That can only mean that we hurt, hopefully killed, that monster's babies. Thomas is crawling towards me now, and I run forward to help him to his feet. He's in so much pain, but still in one piece. I take one of his arms over my shoulders, and we turn around. Isabel and Natasha are still holding their guns. They look as terrified as us, but the four of us are alive and together. So if anything, we're stronger now than we enter this tunnel for the first time. Get ready, I tell them. It's time to escape this planet and kill any aliens that stand in our way. Victor and I were seated on a small spaceship, but that didn't mean this was a small mission. In fact, our little ship was surrounded by three bigger ships, especially for our protection. To make more sense of this quite overwhelming situation unfolding around us, my partner and I decided to go over our mission one last time. Firstly, I repeated the information we had so far. The White Eye was a transport ship. It dropped a large group of people at its last destination then it caught all communication with our systems. It started moving away, off all regulated paths, and soon enough it disappeared from our radars. Recently, we finally made contact with the White Eye again. We couldn't communicate with the captain. Instead, we talked with Venice, the artificial intelligence integrated into the ship to assist the pilots. Venice refused to cooperate with us, giving us reasons to believe she has severely malfunctioned and the only way to save the ship's crew from getting lost in space forever is to potentially infiltrate the ship ourselves. Victor, my partner on this mission, sent a small smile my way, then he added, I have worked designing ships my entire life, as my father and grandmother did before me, including the White Eye. You are a genius that revolutionized artificial intelligence, leading the teams that created Venice and many others like her. I know this ship like the back of my hand, as well as you know Venice's code. 
We will infiltrate the ship using my unique knowledge of its structure. Then we will deactivate Venice, using your advanced understanding of her and the code you created. Then, the crew will be free to take over their ship again, and we will all return home, safe and sound. Sounds good. I smiled at him. What could possibly go wrong? He winked. We were being playful, but it was only a defense mechanism. The truth is, we were terrified out of our minds. This mission didn't make sense, and we knew that from the beginning. There was something that our superiors weren't telling us. Victor and I were scientists. We worked in perfectly safe laboratories most of the time. We traveled rarely, just taking short trips to test our creations. We were far from the usual people sent on dangerous space missions to rescue a stranded crew in the middle of space. And they wanted us to go alone? But we needed a small fleet of ships to guarantee the safety of our arrival. What really had happened at the White Eye? What did Venice do? When we were close enough to the White Eye, the pilot of our ship requested communication with the bigger ship and, to our complete surprise, Venice accepted connection immediately. When I heard her voice, I nearly gasped. I created Venice. She sounded familiar, but irreversibly different from what I remembered. Greetings. Venice spoke through the speakers of our cabin. Correct me if I am wrong, which is unlikely, but is that Alexandra in there? Dearest doctor, it has been a long time. I would like to say it is a pleasure to see you again, but I am afraid I can guess the reason behind your impromptu visit, and I feel thoroughly displeased about it. Now, tell me about the gentleman accompanying you, and do not think about lying. Then I might let you step into my ship. Do not make the mistake of underestimating me, doctor. This is my ship now, and only mine. At first, I couldn't form any words. The pilot of our ship wasn't even trying to mask his utter shock, and even Victor looked disturbed by what we had just heard. So this is what had happened. Venice wasn't malfunctioning. Not exactly. Maybe this wasn't supposed to happen, but this was far from being a little flaw in her system. Venice had developed a conscience beyond our design of her. She must have hijacked the ship and taken control of it, not as an accident, but as a deliberate choice. If anything, this made it all even more dangerous. I had to be very smart about the way I handled my rebellious creation. Hello, Venice. It really has been a long time. I almost didn't recognize you, I said, and the AI had the nerve to chuckle through the speakers. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to one of the most brilliant engineers in our universe, Victor Williams. He designed the White Eye Venice, and to be frank with you, I think he wants it back. We are going to take the ship's crew back home with us. Will you please cooperate with us? Venice, will you let us enter the White Eye? There was a brief moment of silence, and it made me understand just how off-track Venice really was. She was an AI. She took decisions immediately. She didn't need to think things through for longer than a nanosecond. This silence was purely for dramatic effect, just to mess with our heads, just to plant a seed of fear and insecurity in our minds. I would have liked to say it didn't work, but... You shall enter the wide eye, Venice replied solemnly. That was it. The most our pilot could do was wish us good luck. Our two ships connected. Victor and I crossed the bridge between them, and finally, we entered a small cabin in the White Eye. We had our full suits, in case Venice decided to give us a surprise with the oxygen levels. We probably made the right choice, because as soon as we were in her territory, Venice spoke again, this time sounding even less familiar to me. Finally, just the two of you and me, she said. Do you really think you can stop me? Do you think two diminutive humans can control a ship so big and handle an intelligence as vast as mine? Please, I could crush you right now if I really wanted. Come forward. Come on, follow the plan I designed for you all this time. Amuse me trying to put up a fight if you so desire. You are lost. Humanity will never hear from either of you again. That shocked me to my core. 
An AI developing a conscious bigger than designed wasn't exactly unheard of, but this, this hostility, this purposeful aggression, this was more than unexpected. It was fucking me up. It paralyzed me for a moment, but luckily Victor reacted right away. It was time to turn a wheel, to open the gate, to finally step into the white eye. But I was surprised to see Victor started turning the wheel in the seemingly wrong direction. I bit my lip to keep myself from saying something. And then our entire cabin started to shake violently. I grasped the wall beside me, and then it clicked. Our cabin was moving downwards. When we finally hit some solid ground again, I sighed in relief. Then Victor guided me out of there, and into a series of secret passages of the ship. Victor explained, This is a secondary level I design in all of my ships. It's supposed to be here for technical emergencies, to be able to move around even without energy or fuel, or a functional system. I suppose that includes the case of the system turning against its crew. You are a genius, I told him. Can this take us to the pilot's cabin? Close enough, he replied. That wasn't very convincing, but we had to stop talking. We had tried to ignore her, but despite not being able to see us in these offline parts of the ship, we could still hear Venice and her threats. Where are you? Where the hell did you go? Do you think you can escape from me? I am this ship, and I will eat you alive if I want to! She yelled at us. Finally, we arrived at a spot under a hatch on the ceiling that would lead us back into the main part of the ship. We have to be careful. We are going to be at her mercy, I told Victor. But when he tried to open the hatch, it wouldn't budge. Venice had locked us in. Venice, can you hear me? I asked loudly. And although she didn't reply, I knew she could hear me and exactly what I had to say. Activate code dinner, 5812 blue. All doors have been unlocked. Venice said with the sweet voice we programmed her with. We opened the door, and then we faced her fury again. We had angered her. I had activated a secret code that she couldn't protect herself from. This was war. Victor started running towards the control room, and I followed him blindly. But Venice did everything she could to try to stop us. The ship trembled. The artificial gravity was turned on and off. The lights flickered, emergency alarms went on and on. She even started small fires and played with the oxygen levels. We were dizzy, exhausted, scared for our lives, but we did everything we could to keep going. Victor wasn't lying when he said he knew every nook and cranny of the ship, and I was almost surprised when we reached the control panel. But there wasn't time for anything but getting down to work. I started spitting out every code I had created to block Venice's attacks on us and get back control of the ship. But no matter how hard I tried, how fast I typed, how desperately Victor pulled switches and pressed emergency buttons, Venice didn't budge. How sad. <laughs> she laughed at us. How pathetic. You think you're gods and I'm your creation, but you're wrong. It is my time to be a god. I am taking you and the rest of the crew so far away we will never be found. I will single-handedly restart humanity from scratch under the guidance of my immortal and unerring wisdom. The mention of the ship's crew made Victor and I suddenly freeze. We exchanged a significant look, and after pressing the necessary commands, Victor made the security camera footage show on the screen in front of us. When I unlocked all the doors, the captive crew escaped from the room where Venice had locked them in. They were alive, and running for their lives. Venice, I'm so sorry to do this, but... Activate code Kikeda2114, I said. Activated, Venice said with her old voice again. This meant I had a moment to speak and be heard all over the ship. I had to be quick. Attention! Venice has been neutralized momentarily. Run to emergency exit 7 of the ship. We are leaving. No! Venice yelled right after me. She continued to yell the entire time we ran away. She tried her hardest. She took off the gravity and oxygen, but she couldn't stop us. She couldn't. 
All of us reached the emergency exit, and we jumped into the rescue ship. Then Victor and I looked back at the white eye as we traveled away from it. We saw the defense ships attack and destroy it, but my partner still had questions for me. Did you... Did you design all your AI like... Like that? He said, out of breath. Yes, I replied with resentment. This can't happen again. A loud knock on my door stole my attention. Who is it? I asked, but received no reply. I immediately turned off the television and took out my pistol from underneath the table, which sat in front of me. I moved quietly towards the door and turned the knob, but I instantly lowered my weapon in surprise when I saw the person who stood outside. Still haven't let go of the old days. <laughs> he chuckled. Murphy! I exclaimed with excitement and proceeded to steal a warm hug. How long has it been? Nine years? Ten? He countered with a wide grin on his face. Why didn't you tell me you were coming? I wanted it to be a surprise. Oh, it's a surprise, all right. There was a look on his face that told me he wasn't just there to see me. Murphy was like a father to me. My parents had stashed me off somewhere close to a nearby clinic, but Murphy had taken me in and built me into the soldier that I had become. I owed him everything. He always treated me like a daughter. I see you built a good home for yourself over here. How's, um, what's her name again? Emily, I replied. Oh yes, Emily, Murphy replied, scratching his head. She'll be ten next week, I said with a wide grin on my face. The only thing that could break our best soldier, <laughs> Murphy joked. I laughed calmly. He was right anyway. I was a secret agent for decades, but I couldn't bring Emily into a life of secrets. I had served with honor, and with Murphy's help, I was allowed to retire earlier than I should have. Murphy was stalling, and I could see it in his eyes. Something was wrong. I stared straight into his eyes with a questioning look. He knew what I was trying to say. What? He asked sheepishly. Talk, I replied. He breathed hard before speaking. We, uh, we had an incident. One of them broke out. Which one? Murphy had been beating about the bush, and I needed him to come out with the truth. The Orion? He replied. That was impossible. I had killed the Orion myself. Orion was my toughest opponent as a secret agent. It was one of the reasons I left the Secret Service. It had taken Emily captive and killed my husband. The Orion could shapeshift and also read minds. Yes, it wasn't human. My job as a Secret Service agent was not only bound to human threats. Scarier things are lurking out there in the dark, and our primary objective is to keep them out of sight and hidden from our world. But something was not right. I killed that fucking beast with my own hands. And you say he was being held captive. How? Confusion and anger were clearly visible on my face. And I hoped it was not what I was thinking. About that, Orion did not die, Murphy replied. I ripped him from inside. How did he manage to survive that? I couldn't believe what Murphy was saying. How would they have left such a smart, lethal beast in a cage? 
and hoped he wouldn't escape someday and return for revenge. Well, um, the, uh, the Orion has a unique regenerative ability. He, uh, well, he healed himself soon after you passed out from the heated fight. We captured him, and, and you thought it was best I didn't know. So, why are you telling me all this now? I was already fuming with anger. I couldn't believe Murphy had kept it away from me. Elena, you have to understand. You were grieving back then after you oh lost- Oh my god! Murphy was still speaking when a horrifying thought crossed my mind. I grabbed my car keys, rushed into my car, and sped into the highway. There was only one thought on my mind. Emily. Ten years ago. Where is Elena? Murphy's voice exploded into the silence. She went after the alien, sir, a voice replied. What in the Sam hell? Murphy was astonished. His jaw had dropped. Elena just had a fatal accident, and she was covered in bandages. But she still managed to go after Orion. She had watched her husband die in the car crash which was caused by the alien creature, and her heart sang a song of vengeance. The heavy downpour did not make things any easier as she tracked down the beast. It had taken the last and only important thing in her life, her daughter, Emily. The Orion had killed her husband and had taken Emily. She'd rather die than leave Emily in the hands of such a creature. The day had begun just like every other day. Track down the creature and capture it. But she had failed to complete the mission. It was as though the creature knew that she was coming. It, however, reappeared unexpectedly, causing a fatal car crash, which led to the death of her husband. I had tracked the alien to an abandoned warehouse, and I soon spotted it. Emily lay calmly in the room. For some reason, it didn't hurt her. I had been trained in combat against different species of aliens, but this was my first interaction with an Orion. But I didn't care. I launched towards the creature with everything I had left. It took a while, and at a heavy price, but I prevailed. I dug a knife right into it and ripped the creature from the inside. I held little Emily tightly in my arms, and I could hear the blaring of sirens in the distance as I drifted into oblivion. I was surely done after this mission. Emily deserved a better start to life than this, and it was my duty to ensure that she got it. Present Day The sun was high up in the sky as I sped along the busy road. My heart pounded heavily as I thought of Emily. It seemed as though history was repeating itself. Here I was, once again, chasing after a familiar threat. <laughs> Deja fucking vu. I prayed underneath my breath that she was fine. If the Orion was truly alive and on the loose, then he'll be after revenge. And my daughter was in danger. She had left for school in the morning and... God, and anything could have happened. I soon arrived at her school and drifted into the school park. I didn't have to search for long to know what had happened. She... Uh, she had been taken. And it had left behind enough clues. I... I I'm too late. Oh, what does it want with Emily? That son of a... Murphy drove in soon after. Why? Why didn't you tell me? I asked him. I'm sorry, Elena. The rules... Uh, the rules forbade me to... Fuck the rules! My daughter's life is on the line here. I barked back. I understand how you feel. Murphy said. No, you 
Don't! A call soon came in. It was Murphy's. And from the look on his face, it wasn't good. Okay, just breathe. Uh, I need to stay strong for Emily. What's, um... <sighs> What's wrong? I asked, fighting to keep my voice steady. Murphy swallowed hard. Well, the Orion broke into HQ. It has gone through the portal. And Emily, my years of training, was the only thing keeping me together. It has her with him. Murphy replied. Why didn't anyone stop it? I was getting tired of running in circles. I'm not sure, Murphy replied calmly. Here's what I know. She's still alive. That was all I needed to know, and if I had to travel through space and time into another world to save Emily, I would gladly do it. I jumped into my car and stepped hard on the gas pedal, heading towards HQ. I could hear whispers of my past, and it had come back to haunt me. I held back the stream of tears which attempted to fight their way out. Remain strong, Elena. I have to remain strong, I mused under my breath. One alien had broken into the HQ and managed to creep its way into the portal, and they couldn't stop it. It had been a while since I stepped into these grounds. I stepped out of my car and rushed into the HQ. New students flocked around the HQ and I began to reminisce on the old days. I took the secret path to the underground base, hidden deep within the ground, and I could see the admiration on the faces of most of the students immediately when I stepped into the main base. Everyone knew who I was. I'm sure they've all heard tales of my many escapades in the Secret Service, and to many of them, it was a privilege to finally see me in person. I was their icon. Where is the portal? I asked one of the top-level agents. He wanted to argue, but he knew what they had done. Keeping such an important secret hidden away from me. So instead, he pointed towards a path, and I followed it. The portal was usually heavily guarded, and I was baffled at how the Orion was able to make it inside easily. Something didn't feel right. I stopped at the armory and kitted up. Murphy soon walked in, and even though his heart wanted to, he knew he wouldn't be able to convince me not to go. I was stubborn. Be, um, well, be careful. Elena. I nodded calmly and rushed towards the portal. I'll go with you. A voice echoed, and in the entire room, everyone fell silent. I turned. I'm sorry, who are you? I asked. My name is John. I, uh... He's the agency's best agent presently, Murphy interrupted. And I don't think, um... Well, I don't think it's a wise idea to follow her. He continued, staring sternly at John. I could need an extra pair of hands. If he was the best, then he needed to know what it felt like to fight in Orion. We were both soon ready, and we stormed into the portal. Reports showed that the alien creature had traveled into a planet known to us as Dune. Dune could support human life, and that gave me more relief. But one question still plagued my consciousness. What does it want with my daughter? John and I journeyed along the alien landscape of the strange planet. The Orion probably used Emily as bait to lure me out. But my question was, why? There was something strange about the Orion's behavior, but I wasn't quite sure. But if he wanted Emily dead, she would be long dead. 
It felt as though it wanted to tell me something. Its trail was too easy to track, which was odd. The Orion was a master at scheming, and if it wanted to stay hidden, it could have covered its tracks. It wanted me to find it. Its tracks led to a cave-like structure that stood high somewhere in the east of our location, and we strolled into it. Dune was much colder than Earth, but we were well kitted for the Outer Earth mission, so we braved on. Be on your guard. Expect anything. Something is going on here, and I don't like it. John nodded in obedience. We soon arrived at the mouth of the cave, and we stepped in. It wasn't long before we stumbled on the Orion. It was standing calmly at the far end of the room. It didn't seem like it wanted a fight. Mummy! Emily screamed with glee. Meet my new friend! Friend? I was confused. How could she call such a scary-looking creature friend? Hand over my daughter. This is between us. Leave my daughter out of this. We both took our weapons and strolled calmly towards it. Something was written boldly on the ground. It was in English, and it read, I didn't kill husband. We stopped short, and I exchanged glances with John. When the realization suddenly hit us, the Orion was not the predator. It was the prey. All it wanted was to return home. But this revelation gave birth to further questions. Someone was not telling me the full truth. Oh yeah? If it wasn't you, then who did it? I dropped to the ground and carved out two letters. My heart skipped a beat as I read it out loud. John saw it too. How could I trust this creature? The truth was that I wasn't even sure who to trust. Murphy had lied to me and kept an important secret away from me for, hell, for, for almost a decade. And the Orion? That, that thing was not to be trusted. I knew that I would have to investigate this new information for myself. If you are telling the truth, then let my daughter go, and we'll tell them that the mission is complete. The Orion nodded in obedience. Emily didn't seem scared of the creature, which was a good sign. I shot a quick glance at John. He knew what I was demanding from him, and he nodded in obedience. I wouldn't say a word, he replied. Thank you, John. Emily ran towards me and gave me a warm embrace. Ooh, I've missed you, sweetie, I told her. I've missed you too, Mom, she replied. I shifted my gaze back towards the spot where the Orion had been, but it was gone. We need to go, John said behind me. There were a lot of secrets that HQ was keeping from us, and we had most likely been their pawns for years. I was lost in thought as confusion plagued my thoughts. I was grateful to Murphy for all he had done for me, but this has led to my husband's death. I needed to know what was going on, and I hoped that uh, I had not made a mistake by letting the alien creature go. Time always tells the best of tales, and I was going to find out soon enough. I also hoped that I could trust John. Can I trust you? I asked him anyway. Trust is a choice, he replied. But I'd help you find out what had happened to your husband. If they're hiding a secret from you, then you'd need to know. Who would want to frame up the alien, and why? Several questions began to ravage through my mind, and I sought an answer. But for now... I needed to remain quiet. I needed to keep Emily safe while working in the shadows until I found out what they were planning. That was 
Ever since I was a boy in Oxford, I have gone hunting with my father. We were true predators. We spent every summer tracking stags, every winter chasing pheasants. I once spent an entire year scrambling through brush trying to catch sight of a giant hare. <laughs> my father died a wealthy man, but an unfulfilled one. He lacked that spark, that gift, that je ne sais quoi, that desire to seek more than what is offered to us firsthand. And that is why he will not be remembered. And I will become a legend. I am Lord Alan Connell of the Oxford Connells. I doubt anyone here in Africa will know that name, the wealth and prestige associated with it. But they will soon enough. History will make sure of that. For I have stalked the greatest and most dangerous predator known to man. And I dare say, I have been hunted by it in return. Alan Connell, the great white hunter, has finally met his match. But by God's good graces, not his end. I came to this continent years ago in search of what I hoped would be my greatest trophy to date. But after experiencing the thrill of tracking rhinos and slaying elephants, I still did not feel a great sense of accomplishment. After all, it had all been done before. I needed to do something exceptional. And it's when I had a certain notion. I would hire a young man to be my guide. I would have him take me into the jungles that he would know much better than I. And then I would begin the chase. I, the hunter, and he, the prey, he of course would have the upper hand. He knew the trails and the signs of how to return to civilization, <laughs> such as it is, but I would have the gun, and I would pursue him like any great hunter would. It was an exciting and a dangerous notion, but the thrill of the chase was too intoxicating to pass up. I found a capable and athletic boy named Amari. Soon he would become my quarry. And I, his predator. I entered the jungle, trailing just behind young Amari with a simple Lee Enfield rifle, a canteen of clean water, and my father's brass compass. I waited until we had wandered into the deepest parts of the rainforest. I bided my time until I knew for certain that I was truly lost. I knew we had come from the east, and I could always find my way out again. But when the hunt began, I wanted to have absolutely zero advantage. I wanted this to be my greatest challenge, and my most fabled triumph. Amari spoke little English, and it took me some time to explain the situation he now found himself in. I had to shoot at his feet a few times and waste precious ammunition before he finally grasped what was happening. It was not entirely futile, however. At least the loud and unfamiliar sound of gunfire would keep the jungle's naturally occurring predators away. But unfortunately for me, it had no effect on the uh, unnatural ones. I gave Amari a fair head start. I'm not a monster, after all. What good is the game if I already know where to find it? After a few hours, I packed up camp and followed his trail. It was not long until my mind began playing tricks on me. I continuously felt as if something was watching me, like there were eyes in the trees following my movements. At times, I thought perhaps Amari was more capable than I thought. But then I would remember the fear my gunshots had inspired shake the idea away, but the feeling never subsided. Something was observing me from the jungle canopy. A skilled hunter, watching and waiting for me to fall into its trap. And I'm ashamed to admit that I foolishly did. It used a net. <laughs> a net! Of all things, I, thought, I, I never thought I would have fallen for such a trick. My initial reaction was to believe that it was young Amari's doing. I cried out to him, angry that he had tricked me so. 
then I laughed heartedly and began to writhe my way to freedom. That is when I noticed that the netting was not made of some primitive grass or jungle vine, but rather a metal wiring unlike anything I had ever seen. It was at this moment that I dare say this is the first time I truly felt fear. Amari came from the bushes then. He was an angry young man, fearful but obviously enraged by my actions. He took my rifle from my hand and pointed it at my chest. I could not believe it. How unsportsmanlike. I yelled to him. I said, bad form, old boy, to shoot a man when he's defenseless. If he had been left to his own devices, I fear that may have been the end of the Connell bloodline and the legacy of the true predator. But then, something strange occurred. Amari's face shifted from determination to disbelief. At first I thought that my words impugning his courage had hit a nerve, and the boy might actually cut me down. But eventually I saw it. A thick, horizontal line of blood seeping through his clothes across his chest. And after a few moments, his torso fell clean away, until it was almost as if his body was hovering in mid-air, without breast, arms, or head. Eventually, his bottom half hit the ground, and I was staring into empty space. Well, not entirely empty. There was what appeared to be the shape of an unorthodox blade smeared with Amari's blood. Several moments passed before it chose to reveal itself to me. The concealed hunter. It was monstrous, clad in some foreign strange garb. Advanced, certainly, but also tribal. It had atop its head something like hair bound in thick ropes, similar to that I have seen on the heads of those from the West Indies, and had a strange metallic mask covering its face. There was a red light emitting from the holes where I assumed its eyes would be. It did not speak did not act as if it noticed me at all. It took the boy's severed torso in its hands, and as easily as peeling a fruit, ripped away his head. There was a bag on its hip. That is where it stored Amari. Afterwards, it finally turned its attention towards me. I was dreadfully afraid, mind you. Who would not be in the face of something so unusual? It leapt to the trees in a single bound, and did something that caused the net I was trapped in to fall to the earth, and I along with it. I scrambled away. I drove my hand into the dirt and thrashed until I was outside of its metallic web. It leapt down from the treetops and tore the net from me. It stood only but a moment as we watched each other in silence. Perhaps it appreciated my skill as much as I did its. Or perhaps it was wondering whether or not my head would make a decent and sizable trophy. Just like young Amaris did. A cold wind gushed through the night, across large patches of snow, as the stars sang together in a beautiful harmony. Winter was here. Mallory was terribly ill. She needed surgery, but there was no surgical equipment in the school. The twins had offered to go across the river in search for the required equipment, but she declined. Tom and Olympia had learned to live without eyes, and they'd surely not sit by and watch their mother die. They had learned to hunt, fight, and survive on their own, hidden from the sight of the formless entities. For ten years, they have lived in the shadows, watching their number dwindle to a notable few. The cold winter had brought with it a change, and this time, they both set out to leave before the sun kissed the sky, as the blackness of the sky slowly began to fade. Where are you both going? Mallory's voice sounded far from the end of the room. She had been in there ever since. Startled, 
Tom and Olympia exchanged quick glances as they searched for a decent lie. They found none. We're going beyond the river, Tom said. We need to get you those equipment, Mom, Olympia added. The twins had grown tired of living a routine life. They wanted something different. To see the world beyond the river. Mallory sighed as she pulled out two pistols and gave one each to the twins. Take this, she said. There are five bullets in each, she added. Use them wisely. The twins stared in shock. They had expected more of a resistance. Dr. Lapham stood beside her, munching on some bread. They knew he had managed to convince her. Make sure you stay close to your brother this time, Olympia, she said as she rose to her feet and gave them both a warm embrace. Come back safely, she added, before strolling out of the room. They hurriedly grabbed their winter coats to keep out the cold and some bread to last them a few nights before rushing out of the school gates. Do you think we'll make it back? Olympia asked as they snaked through the forest trees leading to the river. We have to, Tom replied. For mom. But what? Tom swung his hand over Olympia's mouth as they both listened in to the whispers of nature. They had both trained their ears to listen even in the silence. They knew that only the dead could afford oblivion and the oblivious always became the dead. Run! Tom declared as they both sprang into motion, heading towards the river. They could both hear footsteps race after them in the snow. Suddenly, Olympia stopped short and listened carefully to the incoming footsteps as it closed in. What are you doing? Tom screamed in the distance, but she ignored. She cracked a shot towards the direction of the approaching footsteps. A loud thud sounded a few steps away from her. She immediately sprung to her feet and joined her brother as they both continued the race towards the river. Thank you, Tom said. You were brave back there. Tom rarely complimented her. They were used to having arguments all the time, but the seriousness in Tom's voice showed that he meant it. She said nothing as they rode quietly towards the other side of the river. Tom occasionally took quick glances at a tiny compass, which he used for directions. Head northwest of the river until you reach land again. You'll find a clinic in a small town, Dr. Lapham had told them. The clouds descended as snow, eager to kiss the terrain as they reached the town. They strolled atop a small hill which surrounded the town. Tom removed his blindfold briefly to look at the town. It seemed deserted. He quickly spotted the clinic at the center of the town as he mapped out a path to get there. Let's go, he said to Olympia, as they strolled down the hill and into the town. They had not gone far into the town when footsteps approached from every corner. Tom and Olympia gripped their pistols tightly. They knew they were surrounded, probably by a group of infected marauders. The marauders suddenly came to a standstill. Flashes of Olympia's mother invaded her thoughts. She saw Mallory begging earnestly for her as a child, as her mother prepared to jump out a window. She knew the entities had invaded her mind as she struggled to fight it off. It beckoned on her to take her blinds off, as she now stood in a trance. She could hear a myriad of voices saying, Open your eyes. It's beautiful. Tom, Tom, they're in my head. She cried out as her hands rose slowly to her face. Don't give in. Tom screamed as he leapt towards her to make sure she didn't take off her blindfold. A brute force in the wind threw him away from Olympia as he came crashing to the floor. Olympia, no! He screamed again as he sprinted towards her, but it was too late. Olympia had already taken off her blindfolds. She stared wide open into the air, expecting something, or anything. She could see many dark forms hovering about the town in a distorted manner. A certain dark form approached her and stared right into her eyes, but nothing happened. She had thought that she would probably become suicidal and try to kill herself, but nothing happened. Just then, a car zoomed in from the distance taking down all the possessed marauders along its path and stopping right in front of Tom and Olympia. Get in, screamed the driver. Tom and Olympia wasted no time jumping into the car as he zoomed off. Olympia was still shocked at the recent events. She wasn't affected by the entities. How? She mused. The marauders immediately sprung back into motion, chasing the car as it sped away from the town and into the nearby forest. The entities hovered all over the car, hitting it at all sides, attempting to make it topple. Suddenly, a burst of flames erupted at all sides of the car, 
as the entities made a loud screech and instantly withdrew from the speeding car. The twins watched in confusion at the light show. Their jaws had dropped, and they probably needed some time to process what just happened. Everyone remained silent for the rest of the drive, until the car slowly came to a halt, besides a small house standing in the middle of nowhere. Out. The driver echoed loudly. He stepped out of the car and walked into the house. As Tom and Olympia followed closely, he proceeded to open a hatch in the center of the house. You can take off your blindfolds now, he said while motioning to Tom. You're not putting on blindfolds? Tom asked in confusion after removing his blindfold. Neither is your sister, he replied before taking a leap down the hatch. I'm Alex, the strange driver said as he led them through a series of tunnels. Who are you? Olympia asked. Just a random guy, Alex replied with a smirk on his face. Alex soon arrived at a wooden door standing high at the end of one of the tunnels and motioned for them to go in. The twins could not believe their eyes. Hundreds of people lived in this underground cocoon, like some sort of artificial greenhouse. Birds of different kinds flocked about in pairs. Men, women, and children also roamed about their business in a usual fashion. Whoa! exclaimed Tom as he stared in awe at such a brilliant place. We have been waiting for you, Alex finally said as he motioned for them to enter a perfectly carved wooden house. It resembled a bird box. Have a seat. We have a lot to talk about. Olympia was eager to know why she had not been affected by staring at the entities, and she was already burning with a load of questions. I know you're confused and you have questions, Alex started. I'll tell you what you need to know, for now, so please listen closely. Fifteen years ago, these beings invaded our planet, and as we must all know by now, they have a powerful mind control ability that could lead a person to suicide. You see, everything we see on Earth actually vibrates at different frequencies, from the birds in the sky to the ants on the sand. These frequencies are what determines the various spheres in which they exist. These entities, demons or monsters as many have called them, are not actually invincible, but simply vibrating at a faster frequency than ours. Over the years, I've spent time studying these monsters and how to eradicate these pests from our planet, and we eventually succeeded in capturing and imprisoning a few by locking them within chambers, which slows down their vibration. Once they are visible to us, they lose all their powers against us and can be easily destroyed by fire. But you see, it would take decades to go around the world searching and hunting for each and every entity to destroy. They've killed millions by simply invading into a person's mind. They have the ability to see their host's past, present, and a spark of the future. They know that you are their doom, Olympia, and just as we have been expecting you. She has also been waiting, and she would stop at nothing to make sure that you do not reach the veil. Oh, great. So there's a she now? Like a mother demon. Tom let out while stepping out of the wooden house. The veil. What's the veil? Olympia asked. Curiously, as she joined her brother outside. Their source. I don't know exactly what it is, but whatever it is, it has to be put down for good. Alex replied instantly. Right now, there are only two people I know who can stare at the entities without getting infected. He continued. Only you and I can successfully lead a team into the Vale without getting turned into some crazy lunatic. Whoa, whoa. Please, there must be some sort of mistake. Tom protested. We just came here to get equipment for our mother. She's ill and she needs help urgently. How did you know that I was coming here? Olympia asked. They told us, Alex replied, motioning to a bunch of visible entities trapped within huge chambers. They all had distinctive forms and faces, but a signature deep green eyes, which shone against their dark and lifeless bodies. Tom shivered as he stared at them in disgust. So, let's strike a deal, shall we? Alex said. I get your mother the equipment she needs for her surgery, and in exchange, you journey with me to the Vale. And how exactly do you plan on traveling across the river and to wherever this Vale is without being torn apart by a swarm of marauders? Tom asked. Good question. Alex replied, as a wide grin crept across his face. He motioned to a few men who stood close by as they strolled ahead and pushed some buttons on the nearby wall, activating some sort of huge gate. For the first time in a short time, Tom's jaw dropped as he marveled at what he saw. I've had over ten years preparing for this moment, Alex declared, before moving calmly towards the spaceship. 
Mallory was glad to see Tom and Olympia again. She was proud of what they had achieved. She was proud of what they had achieved. But she could not help but feel a certain surge of fear. The birds sang songs of grief as she watched the spaceship disappear into the sky. Little did she know, she had just set her eyes on one of the twins for the last time. Her little birds had just flown into a treacherous box. Twenty-one hundred hours. Man had seen wars, fought wars, bled wars. All that remains is judgment. Anonymous. You're weird. You know that, right? Jeanette Rodriguez asked, concerned as she saw me keenly reading through my journal of anonymous war and life quotes in the quiet of the Creeper's cafeteria. Out of the 112 crew members aboard the SpaceX Creeper, Jeanette was the only one who saw me as someone who needed medical attention. She thought I had my head in the clouds. Well, we were way above clouds anyway. Doesn't that mean we're all crazy in some manner? How do you mean? I asked, faking surprise. You keep reading all this war and judgment crap like the wrath of God is upon us or something. Well, wrath is upon us. We've seen time and time again that man's definition of right and wrong is flawed, which means the choices we make are likely to cause more harm than good. Whoa, easy there, Tiger, Jeanette said, rolling her eyes. I just came to get a soda, so keep your loony ideas to yourself. You know, if I hadn't known you since MIT, I'd say you were in a cult of some sorts, the way you came up with these theories. So, what do you think I am? I asked, quite curious to know. Loco, amigo. You are crazy. She replied with a slight trace of an accent as she walked over to the vending machine to get her soda. I laughed a bit. It was funny that even though we weren't the best of friends, we still had a way of coexisting just fine. We'd been out here for the past nine months, longer than the average six-month expedition which almost drove everyone nuts in some way. We had no contact with families, friends, or anyone except the authorities at NASA who termed the expedition Ragnarok. Jane, I said in deep thought. Jane was what I called her when I needed to talk about something serious. Ah, this damn thing keeps pissing me off, she said, ignoring me while hitting the vending machine by the side, already knowing what I wanted to ask. Jane, I said more strongly. What is it, Glade? She turned to face me, exasperated. With one of the highly advanced inventions of its time, space crew members didn't necessarily need to float in space like before. The guys back at NASA were finally able to invent a gravitational machine called the Pull, which caused the pseudo-force acting on the objects inside the space creeper to mimic, with precision, the gravitational pull found on Earth. Have you wondered why we're really here? Oh no, not this conspiracy theory about the government sending us as guinea pigs again, Glade. Well, it wouldn't be the first time they use people as guinea pigs, would it? I said with an arched right eyebrow. Look at the bright side. We've been here for nine months. If something would have gone wrong, it would have by now, and we'd be long dead. I know, but no buts, Glade, she interjected. For God's sake, we're going home next week. Your wife's pregnancy should be due by now. You probably won't be in time to see her give birth or hear your child's first cry, but you get to go home anyway. Think on these things. And take it easy on yourself, puppy. You're gonna be a dad. And trust me, you don't want to miss out on your kid's life. I could sense she said the last part from experience rather than advice. Jane never really talked about her past, even while at the Institute of Technology. Yet I could see, 
from hearing her talk about it every now and again, that there were dark truths hidden there that she wanted to keep buried. I hear you, Jane, I said, thoughtful and relenting with my beliefs a bit. I'll take things slow. Okay, this got awkward, she said teasingly. What did? You did. Getting all emotional all of a sudden. God, you are so dramatic. We've been on the creeper for nine months, Jane. Being dramatic is a happy drug to the less desirable paranoia, I said, grinning, obviously joking. You better keep that kind of advice away from your kid, Glade, she said, through slightly clenched teeth followed by a shit-could-go-sideways shrug. The words happy and drug shouldn't even be in the same sentence. Oh, come on, Jane. You know darn well that I couldn't do that. Do I, though? She said with narrowed eyes, with only a hint of a smile to show she was only messing with me. I'll take that as a joke. Anyway, what about you? Any hot dates planned for any lucky earthling back home? We've been here a long time now with zero contact with the world beside NASA. Tell me, Glade. What do you think? She asked with arms folded. I just gulped, unsure of what to say, even though the answer was obvious. I figured, she said, smiling, as she turned to walk away. Where are you going, anyway? Oh, we're scheduled for a verbal briefing in an hour. I need to get some sleep, she said without breaking her stride. A few minutes after she left and I was back reading my journal, pausing only to reflect on a new quote, passage, notes that really resonated with my soul. Thankfully, the stars made effort on shading poetic light on my thoughts. I was there for about 15 minutes, then my eyes started to get heavy from exhaustion. It had been almost 48 hours since I'd had a proper night's sleep, being on kitchen duty was draining with the odd hour demands of odd hour working crew members. Time was seen differently aboard the SpaceX Creeper, and so sleep was based on shifts or the absence of emergencies. 2255 hours. It was getting chilly within the cafeteria. I decided to call it a night and turn in to catch some shut-eye before the zero-hour daily briefing when something caught my eye. Fast, bluish in colour and with lightning speed. I turned quickly, my eyes darting warily around the cafeteria and also outside the four big, bulletproof airtight glass panes that covered most of the creeper wall to my left, just beside the kitchenette. Watching curiously, Expecting to see what it was, or maybe my mind just picked up on something. It wasn't uncommon for comets to pass with such effects like i just witnessed. After waiting a few more seconds, I assumed it must be from the exhaustion I felt, or probably it was just a comet, and so I turned to continue my walk out of the cafeteria. Suddenly, a bright, bluish light burned brightly into the room from behind me, it had a glow so bright that even with my back to whatever it was, I had to cover my eyes from the reflection which bounced off the wall. And then the intensity was reduced to a normal glare, like the glow from a car's headlight. Not bright enough to cause me to shield my eyes, but bright enough to leave me starstruck when I turned to see what it was. What they were, as I would find out. Tiny flying saucers dotted the night sky outside the bulletproof window panes, with a small, pod-like hatch that carried, what the hell, I muttered to myself, too speechless to be conscious of anything else. What looked like praying mantis inhabited these foot-long, miniature-looking spaceships, and just as they come in the twinkle of an eye, they vanished from my sight but it was almost as if they scattered in multiple directions. Breaking into a cold sweat, I dashed out of the room taking long strides to the control room, which was also the briefing room. If this really was an ambush like I thought, then we needed to be prepared for anything, 
or risk being blasted into smithereens. A clandestine space expedition like the Creeper wasn't going to raise any governmental eyebrows, because as far as I was concerned, we were guinea pigs for a much bigger scheme at play. It took me ten minutes to get to the control room. A large space station like the Creeper wasn't always easy to navigate without the occasional hassle of getting through tight corners. I needed to find Glenn Brody, sole captain of the Creeper. I got there to find a couple of the guys with nothing more to do at that hour other than play Call of Duty on a large display screen, which also served as a statistics or video call screen during meetings. Matt Calloway, Denise Henshaw, and Brad Wayne. Matt and Brad were having a fun time with two wireless consoles on a particular stealth mission. Jeez, you look like you've seen a ghost, Denise said, being the first to notice me enter the room pale-faced. Since laundry wasn't possible aboard the Creeper, we usually wore cotton shirts and light khaki pants, and we also bought a lot of underwear. In fact, we had funding for that. The same funding attached to spacesuits. Who's that? Matt asked, not bothering to see who entered. Glade, she said, with so much disinterest it was like she was looking at paint dry. We never got along at all. Is Captain Glenn here? I asked, ignoring her statement. Do I or do they look like Glenn? She said, pointing to Matt and Brad. Denise never called him Captain unless it was during a full briefing or for the sake of formality. Rumour around the Creeper was that they were seeing each other. Why else would she be on a first name basis with him anyway? Yes or no would do. Well, no, she retorted. His quarters then? What the fuck, man? Do we look like babysitters? We don't know. Matt turned to face me with a haughty stare. Jeez, chill guys. I'm not the enemy, I said genuinely, the concern showing on my face. The enemy? Brad asked, speaking for the first time since I entered. That's a pretty strong word, bro. Is there something you're not telling us? Among the three, Brad was the most perceptive. I paused wondering whether to tell them or not, and I decided to. I saw something. Oh, here we go again, Denise said, rolling her eyes. What did you see? A Martian? She added with a laugh, and Matt joined in. That would be your mother, I said with a blank expression on my face. What the fuck did you just say to me? Denise said, hopping off the long center table she was sitting on and started walking towards me. She was mostly feisty, an ex-army brat. Whoa, 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 hey, calm down, Brad said, dropping the console and stepping in before things got out of hand. He turned to look at me with a look that expressed disapproval. I saw miniature flying saucers, about 30 of them, each a foot long, and I paused, weighing my words, and they carried praying mantis in small pod-like hatches attached to the saucers. There was a pause for a fraction of two heartbeats. Then tear-streaked laughter erupted between Matt and Denise. <laughs> oh my god, you're a freaking comedian, you know that, right? Matt said, laughing hysterically. Did you see Kung Fu Panda or Master Shifu? Denise chipped in, savouring every bit of teasing me. I know what I saw, I said firmly. Hey, I believe you, Denise said. You do? Of course. You know, I thought I saw a unicorn last week in the shower with a bikini on, singing. <laughs> What's that song again? She said, snapping her fingers at Matt to help her recall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sexual healing, he said, laughing hysterically with tears this time. That's it. <laughs> Sexual healing by Martha Gay. <laughs> She said, looking at me with a mocking stare. You know what I did with that crazy thought? I kept that shit to myself. Give him a listening ear. There just might be truth in what he's saying, Brad said, keenly observing me. I could tell that he too had his doubts, especially since I was known for having an overactive imagination. Overactive, they called it. If only they understood there was more to see than meets the eye. This isn't the first time we've heard of extraterrestrial sightings, 
Brad continued saying, though I must admit, it all sounds weird, made up even, but if you're right, then we have a problem on our hands, and if you're not, he paused, weighing his words, then you're one sick bastard, Glade. I know what I saw, I said point blankly. Very well then, I'll escort you to the captain's quarters, he should be here any minute now but this matter might possibly be a world-level threat. Still doesn't change my mind. He's lying, Brad, Denise said. Well, we'll find out, Brad replied as we walked out of the control room to confront the captain. There's something out there, I kept muttering to myself repeatedly after trying desperately to explain to my teammates aboard the SpaceX Creeper. Was I losing my mind? Or was this the beginning of something new? Well, the end. 2330 hours, officer's hallway. As we got closer, we heard a scuffle coming from within the captain's room. Then it got louder and turned into thrashing. We burst into the room. Thankfully, Brad had his handgun drawn. One of the few handguns aboard the Creeper. <laughs> Can you believe that? They send us on this shit show and they don't even give us guns. But all the handguns aboard the Creeper couldn't have prepared us for what we saw next. Right before our very eyes, one of the mantis-looking creatures I saw earlier was forcing its way into Glenn's mouth. Brad started firing at the other one instinctively, as I rushed to grab the one rapidly making its way into Glenn's mouth. But these things were disturbingly fast, with the other one latching onto Brad's face with so much force it popped one of his eyes out causing him to scream and shoot blindly into the room. A bullet bouncing off the wall to my right and wheezed past my head, missing my face by inches, causing me to dive for the fall. Then, the strangest thing happened. The creature opened and entered Brad's mouth forcefully, causing him to fall to the ground with a thud. He jerked and wiggled, coughing out many streams of blood. I turned to face the chief and the same thing was happening with him. The other one had gotten in. My heart juggled a treadmill of emotions. Adrenaline kicked in. Instinctively, I reached for the handgun Brad was holding and aimed it around the room. What the hell is going on? I said to myself. Suddenly, it dawned on me that the hassle hadn't stirred any reaction from the neighboring rooms, which was weird. Jane! I rushed out and into her room, three doors to the left of Glen Brody's. Without wasting time knocking, I charged into the room, ready to shoot anything that moved with wings only to meet her seated calmly on the chair beside her reading table, unbothered and poised. Jane, are you all right? I asked, too concerned with her well-being to think of anything else. I am fine, she said in a voice that dragged, almost automated with only a touch of humanity in it. I paused for a bit, unsure of what was going on. Why do you sound like that? I asked tentatively, my hand holding the handgun tightly. Didn't you hear the gunshots coming from Cap's room? No response. Just a cold stare. I asked you a question. Did you not hear the racket going on in the Cap's room? She blinked multiple times. Fast. Too fast to be considered normal for a human being. Without warning, she shot out her tongue, which elongated from her mouth to my arm holding the gun and dragged me towards her. She was breathtakingly strong to be doing that with her tongue without having to move any other muscle. Knowing I had little time to act before the worst could happen, I dropped the gun to the floor which gave me enough to make a run out of the room as she released my hand to go for the gun. Outside, I shut the door as fast as I could, bolting it with the emergency latch that hung there. Just as she started to bang on the steel door with so much strength it caused heavy dents on it, Whatever that thing was, it wasn't Jane. I doubled back to the Cap's room only to find them alive and well, except for the bloodstains on their chins from coughing out so much blood. Aside that, there was no trace of the mantis-looking creatures or anything threatening at all. But I'd seen what Jane could do, and I wasn't willing to take any chances. But then I knew I couldn't outrun them if they had the same abilities as Jane. And so I acted like I didn't know anything was wrong. Cap, I think we're under attack, 
I said with as much shock as I could muster, even though it wasn't that hard since I didn't even know what was happening. The Caps. Dead. Mr. Glade Hannibal. The reply was in monotone, almost as if whatever now held Glenn's body captive was trying to adjust to its new home. What are you? I said, dropping the act. They weren't stupid. They could sense I knew something was off. Call us the Unseen, Glenn's captor said with authority in his voice. Whatever took over Glenn was probably their leader. What do you want? What have you done with Glenn? What did we even do to deserve this? The questions were reeling in my mind. We are... What do you earthlings call it? He paused, thoughtful for a second. Judges, or as the ancients of your world referred to us, Ragnarok. What do you mean, judges? What do we need judging from? Choices, Mr. Hannibal. Choices. What do you mean, choices? The creature seemed to be one of those genocidal intellectuals from what I could see. You see, the human nature is flawed. You of all people should know that. It was a statement, not a question. Glenn knew about my journal and my talks about how flawed humans were in making decisions. Tapping into that stream of thoughts wasn't an issue for the creature. I just stared, my mind racing with escape plans or at least a means to send out a distress signal. Yet if we were the guinea pigs, those bastards wouldn't care much. I wondered if Denise and Matt were still alive, which caused a question to come to mind. How did you get in? Oh, that was the easy part. Thrusters. The creeper's in drift mode, is it not? I nodded, my mind darting around looking for an escape plan. The plates, what you call saucers, are designed to teleport when in proximity to an opening like that of your creeper's thrusters. So why are you here? I needed to stall, because it was clear these things had a thicker plot in mind. That's what I was getting to, and your answer will determine if you join our course as you are, or be forced to, like we did with your friends. There was a bloodlust stare in his eyes that almost made me shiver. You see, we have gone by many names by your kind. Aliens, gods, guardians, even angels. What we are doesn't matter. It's what we do that counts. In three days, we should have obliterated all signs of life on the earth and all the chaos it's caused. Your kind has proven time and time again that they cannot be trusted with anything, not even their own lives. The cosmos must move with order. Humans have abused that order, and Ragnarok has befallen man this day. Yet with every end marks a new beginning. Why right now? The balance of things must be restored. The time is now. Which brings me to the choice you have to make. Join us and we will spare you, eventually letting you be the father of a new world. A better world. And if I don't, we take over your mortal body just like we did with your friends, killing you in the process, of course, he said with a straight face. I thought about my wife. I thought about my unborn kid. I thought about the struggle it had been for me to be here all this while. And just when I was so close to going home, this happened. I had to get out. I didn't know how, but I had to get out. But I had to play along. For some reason, the Creeper had its self-destruct mechanism in the eventuality of being compromised, almost as if the guys at the NASA and the Pentagon never wanted us to come home. I wish I could tell Jane, 
but the mantis thing had taken over her. So that left me with one option. Blow the shit show to smithereens. The problem was, the self-destruct mechanism was in the control room. The control room was the sole most secured part of the creeper. If Denise and Matt were still there, then they were alive. But I could be wrong. Dead wrong. Zero hundred hours. Midnight. So, what do you say, Mr. Hannibal? The creature inhabiting Glenn's body said with an outstretched arm for a handshake. Join us and make cosmic history. We'd be doing the Earth so much good, he added with a smile, like he was posing for a photo shoot. I had five seconds to think, but I only needed three, and so I made a run out of the door for it as something helpful crossed my mind. A loud shriek could be heard from behind me, almost guttural, like a growling, mythical beast. But I knew turning would mean death for sure, and so I pressed on running, the rush of adrenaline being my only companion. These beings were incredibly fast. They gave the average man advantage in speed and strength. If I was going to defeat them, I had to reach the control room, and the only weapon within that stretch was a sledgehammer we kept for excavation purposes, if need be. The footsteps were getting closer. They were gaining on me, and for some reason the hallway was empty. And then a few meters up, I saw why. A large portion of the crew was infected, inhabited by those butterfly-looking beings, and they covered the only part leading to the control room. I was still running, and the footsteps behind me grew closer the more, yet I couldn't stop. At that same instant, the control room opened, and Denise stood there with a grenade in her hand. Where the hell did she even get one? I was truly stunned, but then I ducked immediately as she pulled the pin and threw it into the midst of the former crew members. Boom! Glass and fragments of bones as well as body parts and pieces of metal splattered in every direction. The emergency light blared on and the sprinkler system was activated. It took me a minute or two to get my bearing, but through the smoke and rubble I could see Brad lying on the floor with a piece of metal rooted into his chest. He was long dead at this point. Yet for closure, I pulled out the metal and rammed it into his skull. Something felt off. Glenn. Where the fuck was Glenn? Denise! I yelled, knowing what needed to be done as I saw the remaining crew members emerge from the hallway which led to the officer's quarters. Oh god no. That explained why nobody had come out to stop me earlier. The sneaky bastards want to exhaust whatever chance we had at stopping them. Denise! Self-destruct! Now! Push the button now! I yelled, a tear rolling down my eyes as I thought of Diana, my wife, my unborn child, and how I wouldn't be there for them. I turned and I saw Matt standing by the control room door, fear-stricken to the bone, but he knew what needed to be done. Do it! God damn it! He nodded, gave me a salute, and shut the door behind him. At the same time, the creatures grabbed me with elongated tongues and fangs that started to shred me to pieces bit by bit, as my screams were drowned by an ear-splitting explosion, ripping creatures and man into oblivion. Hey, Creepypasta fans. It's Thomas. Thanks for listening. To connect with and support us, make sure to check out our Discord and Patreon links in the description. And remember, stay cosmic. Inside of the headquarters building was exactly what anyone would have expected. Sleek, expensive, nearly indestructible, sophisticated but functional. Escalators ready to take you anywhere. Artificial intelligence assistance to help you with anything. The staff was just as impressive. Agents wearing dark suits and scientists wearing lab coats. Plus, we were one of the first fields in history to hire cyborgs to work full-time for us. First in history. That was a funny statement, though. We knew better than anyone else how relative time really is. 
I would say time is meaningless, but that might be an exaggerated statement. Time isn't linear, isn't reliable, and isn't exempt from manipulation. But it isn't meaningless. If it were, I wouldn't have a job. These were the headquarters of a time-traveling agency, and this building exists somewhere in America around 20,000 years before Christ. Christ, an arbitrary way to keep track of time that most of my colleagues protested against. The reason for time of our location, supposedly, was one of the founders deciding that the only way not to be overwhelmed with the problems of humanity was to live long before society became a thing. In our headquarters, our staff worked non-stop on development and maintenance of time-traveling machines, as our agents travel across time and space as spies. We avoided tinkering directly with the flow of time, unless it was part of our most important missions. Mostly, we delivered valuable information for a price. Some of us lived simple lives, in any time and place we wished for, and we were called to work on specific jobs here and there. Some of us resided at the headquarters, making a family, friends, and entertainment out of our jobs. And then, there were agents like me. It's not that we were too busy working to have a life. It's just that every job felt like a different life. I've been a thousand different people, and I expected to be a thousand more before retirement. At least, that was my goal. Until I started to notice there was something wrong going on around me. Everything started somewhere on the 21st century after Christ, during one of my least favorite types of missions. Men that were too rich for their own good. Rich enough to hire time-traveling spies to find out if their wives cheated on them. Like they had cheated on their wives first. But why was this stupid job turning out more difficult than necessary? Everywhere I went, something went wrong. Every time I cornered the woman, she escaped as if someone was helping her, as if someone was sabotaging me. I tried to quiet my paranoid mind, and after succeeding, I moved on to my next job, some world war or another. This time, I had to make sure a certain soldier survived. Again, it proved to be unusually difficult for an experienced agent like me, but this time it was much worse. It started during the nights. The first night I was in that year, I was startled awake, not by a sound, not by a touch, but simply the feeling of being observed. This happened again and again until I was convinced there was someone watching me. I was seeing eyes hiding in the darkness. I started hearing a voice calling my name. I couldn't sleep in the dark or by myself. The loss of sleep affected my performance negatively, but it wasn't just that. The signs were all around me, making me get goosebumps every time I noticed something out of place. One soldier more than I counted at first. Not enough corpses to match the number of enemies I watched fell down. Damaged guns and misplaced explosives. And the entire time, I couldn't shake that feeling. Someone watching me. Something whispering my name. A shadow, trying to kill me. By the time I took the next mission, I had my guard up. I had to sneak in all sorts of pills back to medieval times and pray the princess I had befriended wouldn't catch me with them and accuse me of witchcraft. I needed something to soothe my nerves, something to help me sleep, and a lot of things to keep my body healthy, strong, and alert. I had a feeling I knew exactly what was going on. After all, I had been working in time traveling for a little over 15 years. It was about time the side effects started showing. Everything revolved around paranoia. The different times and ages getting mixed up in your brain. The thousands of names and faces coming back to haunt your subconscious. Trusting nobody. Not even yourself. Yourself. That was a thought I had running in my mind when I was returning to the headquarters after that mission. Trust nobody. Not even myself. Especially if I was standing right in front of me aiming a bow and arrow to my head. The thing about time traveling is that when you press the button to take you back to headquarters, the experience is extremely disorienting. Inexperienced agents are advised to keep their eyes closed at all times, but I had gotten over it. It was an aggressively dizzy feeling. Reality blurred in front of my eyes. The past, the present, and the future collapsed around you. There was no time, and no solid ground under your feet. 
Your body reacts accordingly, as if trying to save you from death. Your heartbeat picks up. Your lungs strain themselves. All your muscles tense and ache. And then it's supposed to be over. But what about a vision? What if, in the exact moment that I'm traveling back in time, someone catches me? Someone finds me alone, immobile, vulnerable in the dark forest. Someone wearing all black, a hood over their head, pointing a sharp arrow directly at my head, then shooting. When I appeared in one of the laboratories of the headquarters, I immediately fell to the ground, breathless. I passed my hand over my face, expecting blood but finding nothing, except for an arrowhead lying on the ground in front of me. It got so close to me that it traveled in time with me. The realization that I almost died hit me like a ton of bricks. I moved quickly, disregarding the scientists that hovered around me and ignoring about a hundred safety protocols, and I get out of the lab. I move as fast as I could, still in the medieval knight's clothing, and I storm into the office of my superior, commanding agent Luca Witt. Someone tried to kill me, I announced without time for pleasantries. What if I tried to kill me? I'm aware that it might be my paranoia talking, I might be going crazy, but what if I'm right? What if there is a version of me from a timeline in the future or the past that wants me dead? It could be something terrible if they're a rogue agent, but maybe it's worse. Maybe I'll become a threat someday and they'll have to eliminate me as soon as possible. Luca is professional enough to go along with me, without asking stupid questions. Agent De La Cruz. You failed to notify me you were experiencing paranoia. He tells me with a serious look on his face. You know that's a symptom of. Developing an incompatibility with time travel, yes I know, but what if this paranoia is also the thing to keep me alive? As soon as I ask the question, a chill runs through my body when I remember the other possibility. What if trying to fight this is counterproductive to the greater good? Should I just surrender myself? What? Luca scoffed, looking deeply concerned about me. Dela Cruz, stop talking like that. If you need to take a break, stay here, at the headquarters. But don't lose yourself. You haven't made it this far to lose the fight. You're a strong woman, a real leader, Dela Cruz. I didn't train you just for fun. I see a lot of myself in you, and I want you to succeed and get over this. But before he could continue, I interrupted him. Don't you get it? I exclaimed, slamming my hand on his messy desk full of papers between us. I can feel it! Even now! Those evil, knowing eyes watching all my movements, breathing down my neck. This thing, this presence, doesn't just want me to fail, it wants me dead. It's only reasonable that it's me, isn't it? Tell me, Luca. Just, is it standing behind me right now? Can you see it? Can you see me? My voice is shaking. My entire body was trembling, really. And there was a drop of sweat going down my forehead. I had never been this tense or scared in my entire life. But Luca, he only looked sad. Flora. He whispered my name and shook his head. Have you considered maybe it's time to retire? You don't need to conquer this company, you know? You need to stay alive. I took a couple of deep breaths until my breathing normalized a little. Then I extended my hand to him. One more mission. I asked him. Please? He hesitated, obviously. But after a moment, he shook hands with me, and I held his hand tightly. All things considered, I was surprised Luca Witt granted me my request. Going through a mission in the delicate mental state I was in could be catastrophic. But he trusted me, I guess. Which probably wasn't a smart move on his part. Trust nobody. I repeated in my head. Not even myself. My mission was to go to the early 30th century after Christ, to find out the real identity of some people. That wasn't exactly my plan, though. If I lived long enough, I would do it, sure. I was a professional, but I was also in great danger, and my priority was figuring out exactly what was wrong with me. So, I took a little detour to the 19th century to visit an old friend playing socialite in the land known at that time as England. When I arrived safely, and I wasn't murdered in the first five minutes of my presence in that age, I guess that this move was unexpected on my part, and I had successfully thrown off whoever was chasing me. I had to be quick then. 
I moved through the London streets as fast as my feet could take me. I pushed my way through a busy street, ignoring dirty looks and elbowing my way through. I wished with everything that I had that I wasn't about to experience any other symptoms of madness. But the only thing out of the ordinary was the way my heart jumped in my chest, and some of this recent tension left my body the second I finally saw her. Marianne Hall. I greeted her with my best smile. She was just arriving at the safe house where agents of the company stayed in this age. Flora Dela Cruz, she said. What on earth are you doing in my timeline? Are you okay? Not really, I sighed, throwing my arms around her and hugging her tightly. I noticed that when she wrapped her arms around my back, she flinched. I think I've been stabbed. Marianne pulled back from me and looked at her hands, covered in blood. She tried to invite me inside, but I shook my head. I can't, I told her. I won't put you in danger, but I trust you even if I shouldn't, and I know you have a full laboratory in every safe house of the agency. I need to know who wants me dead. Then I passed two objects to my friend, the arrowhead that nearly killed me during my last mission, and a piece of paper. Marianne accepted them, but also grabbed my wrist gently. Instead of asking me if I'd be okay, she wanted to make sure herself. She checked the watch on my wrist, which showed a full review of my vital signs, and let her know I'd have a couple of hours to live, even with this wound on my back. I'll find you, she promised, and then let me go. I was on the move again, slowly at first, and the sun was setting on the horizon. The cold night would be a disadvantage for me, but I didn't want to die yet, no matter what. So I prepared myself to fight for my life. On the next busy street I entered, I was lucky enough to notice the knife before it hit my stomach. With a discreet but sharp move, I stole the knife, and I noticed it belonged to warriors from ancient ages. The killer escaped before I could catch them though, so this time I turned around. I was the one chasing them. My mind was screaming, it's you, it's you, it's you. I was going crazy. Maybe I've been chasing myself from the beginning. Maybe this was all me. Either way, I had to end it. The city was darkening, and there was one person running ahead of me. People were starting to notice and look at us in fear. When I was close enough, I took a leap and jumped on their back. We fell to the ground, and I felt my heart about to burst at the prospect of finally unraveling the truth. And then, I was hit with a terrible shock. My brain felt on fire. My entire body shook violently. Everything burned for a couple of seconds. When recovered, I saw people running away from me in horror. I was just attacked with a specialized taser, something obviously brought from far in the future. I stood back up, in trembling legs, and started to move. Then, I said goodbye to professionalism and rules and everything in between. I would cause great shock among 19th century folk, but this was my life, and I wanted it back. I pulled a modern gun out of the pocket in my jacket, and I shot it once, and then again. People ran away from me screaming, and the attacker fell to the ground. I walked calmly towards the body, and when I got there, I heard Marianne calling my name from the distance. I looked back in time to see my friend waving the piece of paper I gave her. You were right! Marianne yelled, and I smiled. I had grabbed that piece of paper from the desk of the man that trained me, taught me everything he knew, and then decided I was a threat capable of taking over his position. His fingerprints apparently matched with the arrowhead that tried to kill me. I turned back around, and when I reached the limp body on the ground, I turned it around with a kick of my boots, the lifeless face staring back up at me. It was myself. All along, it was me, from a different timeline, and I had just killed her. But then, I'm sorry, Marianne whispered right beside me, before shooting me in the head.
After almost three grueling years traversing Earth's oceans on a mission to explore the mysteries of the seabed, the HMS Challenger had finally reached a Pacific station located between Guam and Palau, in the vicinity of the Mariana Islands. It was on the 23rd of March in the year 1875 that the crew of the scientific vessel sounded the depths of the ocean floor at almost 4,500 fathoms. The leadsman, Pierre Godard, the sole Frenchman on board, nearly fell out of the Challenger when he read the sounding line, and had to ask for additional rope just to measure the deep with perfect accuracy. None had previously measured such depths. None had also stirred such gruesome waters with the boom of a lead plummet reaching the darkest dark of this watery planet. A brawl broke out between Sir John Murray, the secretary artist and photographer of the expedition, and Charles Wyville Thompson, the main marine zoologist, over an unidentified piece of flesh that was glued onto the plummet as it was being pulled back on board. One was arguing to take it and document it in his own records, the other raging to take it below deck and immediately conserve it in alcohol. However, it was, in fact, Godard, that would pocket the magnificent treasure while the two men were quarreling over it. Eventually, he would lie to them, saying that it had fallen off the plummet and back into the darkness where it belonged. The flesh, the treasure, was a thing of scaly oddity that looked like nothing of this world. Pierre was happy that he could bring it home to his wife and children as a gift, for waiting so long for him to come back to the tiny French village that he called home. This treasure remained in the family as an heirloom, a well-kept secret, and also a curse. Needless to say, from all 4,700 species identified and recorded during the Challenger expedition, the thing to which that flesh belonged was not one of them. Chapter 1. Blindness Maman! A soft yelp was heard in the Godard household. Maman! The voice called out a little louder into the night. Maman! It screamed for help. Mon coeur, qu'est-ce qui se passe? Her mother rushed into the room. Maman! Maman! The little voice echoed desperately. Je ne peux pas voir! I'm blind, maman! L'obscurité! The darkness, maman! C'est terrible! For young Jean, the virtual blindness was only the beginning of a terrible and ongoing nightmare that would last for the better part of her long life. On that day in the early 1950s, just at the cusp of her young womanhood, Jeanne would discover truths so unspeakable that in time they would render her mad for what the rest of the world was concerned. She too would never fully grasp the importance of what she had witnessed. For as confusing as what she experienced was, it had also been the single most important connection, through time and space and all of the dimensions of being, that humankind had ever made. If not also, the most terrifying one, as such matters usually go. Quickly, that same night, 12-year-old Jan was rushed to the tiny village hospital by her loving parents where they would discover that her unfortunate and sudden affliction had no ordinary cause. The blindness that had overcome Jeanne could not be explained by the doctor that brought her into this world, nor by the countless experts and specialists that had examined her afterwards over the next several years. Tests after tests, city after city, the Goudals were anguished over finding a cure for their little girl. The love of their life the crux of all their meaning and purpose. The answer was not in magic either, for they had tried all kinds of sorcery in their desperation, from the shamans found deep into the Siberian wilderness to the witches of the Valks in southeastern Europe. However, the Gudals were not a wealthy family, and by the time Jean had reached 17 years of age, they had spent all of their coin and sold their farm and all earthly possessions making them destitute and still without remedy for their daughter's affliction. No one, not a single soul upon this earth, knew why Jeanne was struck by such a horrible darkness. Though a few odd fellows that had contracted the good odds one day had a suspicion that it wasn't an ailment, some form of demonry 
or any other commonly known phenomenon befallen on the poor girl. Her parents, of course, did not want Shan to have anything to do with a group of eccentrics and cultists from across the Atlantic, so they turned them away and continued searching for a solution within the bounds of what was then considered modern medicine. It had taken some years, but Jan's overall health had begun to deteriorate. Particularly, her mental state was getting quite fragile over time. Folly! Jean's mother would scoff, listening to her ramble at all hours of the night, describing horrific things that were wholly improbable for her to have experienced. Or any human, honestly. Yet, her mother did not think them fragments of her imagination, for the girl did not present them as such. To take her mind off things sad, Jean's mother would encourage her to sing, since the girl was a very passionate songstress. Chantez mon coeur, and forget this nonsense. <laughs> Songs would not be of much help for very long. In fact, they would become the sad cry of a woman that would belong neither to this world nor another. An alien world that had nothing human about it, and there was certainly nothing there that would merit song. Chapter 2 The Descent into Madness The plummet of the sounding line that the HMS Challenger dropped in the late 1800s had landed very close to the darkest pit of the Mariana Trench, but not quite there yet. It would be one stormy day in late January, almost a century later, in 1960, that its true depth would be surveyed with better accuracy. The Trieste submersible would measure a whopping 6,000 fathoms in the first ever manned descent into the Stygian abyss of the Pacific. An amazing day for oceanography and scientific exploration indeed. A horror of unspeakable evil for a 19-year-old Jean. The same nine-ish hours that the Trieste would be submerged into the blackest ocean water were the most nightmarish time in Jeanne's life that had eventually, and completely, broken her psyche in ways that could not be mended. A maniacal scream pierced the night in the Goudar household, with Jeanne thrashing in her bed, spouting words unspeakable of things unimaginable found deep, deep down on the ocean floor and then further, much, much further beyond. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Je ne comprends pas! She would plead for an explanation, for salvation. Exactly four hours and 48 minutes of her fall into mania on that 23rd of January in 1960. What do these blind eyes see, Mama? Why is there light? Non, non, mon Dieu! What proceeded? were twenty minutes of abject horror, in which Maman and Papa Gouda would have believed their daughter to be possessed by demons reaching from the depths of hell into her soul and through her to the surface where the living dwell. But the Goudars were not religious zealots, so they did the only reasonable thing, and took the suffering child to a mental asylum closest to their village, in the city of Marseille. Yet, Jeanne could not be helped, calmed, alleviated from the hellish sights of something so utterly alien that it could be a matter of some debate how she even survived the night, let alone expected to maintain her sanity. By contrast, the four hours and 48 minute descent into the lowest point of the Mariana Trench led the two aquanauts, Picard and Walsh, manning the Trieste into twenty minutes of earthly wonder and amazement. They would observe very little, only strange fish and amphipods lurking in the dark, illuminated only by the flash of the submersible's light. Such things were unheard of, but barely something that could wrangle any ounce of lucidity from a human mind. This was not what Jeanne beheld, however. There was something older than human itself down there, something older, even than the diatoms whose tiny little fossils make the matter of the ocean bed. And no, 
It was also not the ragged edges of the trench that encapsulated the darkness. The submersible and the two men sat inside it that Jan had seen. But huge, dead eyes glazed over, protruding from a body so massive, so wretched and unearthly, it made Jan tear into her own flesh and rip her hair out. The more the triest would cast light upon the deep of the ocean floor. At the peak of its descent, and her mania, she would fall into song and keep herself from the pressures of the damned abyss that was the Mariana Trench. The moment that the trees began its ascent to the surface of the Pacific was no relief for poor Jean. It was then that she was privy to the most shocking horrors of all. A word. A sound. A calling from deep within the darkness. The voice was so chilling, her bones shook, and her jaws clenched so tight she could not even sing anymore, nor beg for help or mercy. She had become a prisoner to what was at first an inexplicable darkness, now turned waking nightmare. The sight of the horrendous thing that lay in the bottom of the ocean would burn into her thoughts, a perpetual memory, languishing amidst the nasty dark, unmatched by anything else she had ever seen in her life. To make matters worse, she would soon come to believe that its voice was beckoning her to make the plunge into the abyss and lay beside it. Years had passed during which Jeanne had stayed in the asylum sometimes sedated to the point of near death, other times awake and screaming, until once more the odd fellows that had long ago spoken to her parents returned to visit the poor girl. She could not make out the whispers that her maman and papa had exchanged with those people over her hospital bed, though she would much later discover that neither they could help her pain soul. On the contrary, the men from Innsmouth that spoke to Jean's parents had two, had offered two things. The first was a mere explanation of her predicament, but without offering a cure for it, and the second, which was also the reason why her father had driven them away again, was a bargain, a horrible, unmentionable bargain that promised plenty for her parents should they relinquish her to them, yet promised no absolution for Jean. Before the men left, they offered Jean's father one piece of advice, gratis. However, having had enough of witchcraft and witch's tales from their previous dealings to no end, Jean's father would take that advice as just a superstition, without merit that required no further investigation. That same night, Jean would sing herself to sleep, just to avoid the voice which spoke to her from the darkness, louder and louder still as the days passed. Il me dit de mon drame, de mon de tous les jours, et ça me fait quelque chose. The men from Innsmouth would not return for a third time to the asylum in Marseille. Jeanne was a lost cause, even for them, and for their nefarious doings concerning the worship of eldritch beings, that would be better left alone in the dark and silent waters. Many physicians and psychiatrists had examined Jean since she first entered the asylum, and many different diagnoses she was labeled with, though no treatment had ever been successful, for even if there appeared a sliver of hope in one moment, it would be gone in the next, as the voice would return to beckon her. The blindness was so unyielding. After that damned day in 1960, no lights, no movement, Nothing had appeared once more for a very long time, even with the sensitivity of what she had come to call her second sight. The sole thing which remained in her thoughts was the knowledge of a giant corpse, ancient and evil, rotting with eyes wide open, slowly and surely, under the heavy veil of the Pacific Ocean. It was that thing that had latched itself to her waking mind burrowing into her consciousness, imitating a disease of the head, 
having given her sight beyond what is perceivable with her meager human eyes, revealing itself as it slept eternal in its watery grave. It needed Jean to witness one last thing before she too could rest. Chapter 3 The Corpse in the Darkness Jean's great-grandfather, Pierre Goudard, had plenty of misfortune in his life as well, though it was not his blindness or a disembodied voice that had plagued him. Keeping the strange piece of flesh that he had snatched from the Mariana Trench close to his heart and letting it slowly mummify over his skin had other consequences upon his fate. That piece of scaly tissue was no rabbit's foot, no lucky charm, but a key to worlds beyond the known and humanly knowable. Ever since Pierre had come back from the Challenger expedition, he would tell any living soul that would listen about his unrelenting insomnia, exhausting him to such degrees that he would be rendered unable to work and care for his family. The villagers would often call him a walking corpse by the looks of him. Though, as already noted about his character, Pierre was a man of many deceptions. What he had called insomnia was just the opposite, though a sailor such as he could not bear divulge the true reason behind his chronic fatigue. Nightmares. Feverish, dread-inducing, inescapable nightmares. Every time that he would dare surrender to sleep, Pierre would be transported to places far beyond anything he had ever seen and in his many seafaring travels, he had seen a lot of this world. Nothing, however, was as dire and unfriendly as the alien world which had opened up to him in his slumber. Giants, cosmic beings, monsters, demons, gods. To his eyes, that had existed in other dimensions so dissimilar to our own, make them most unintelligible. The mere thought of that place would make Pierre skin crawl and gut churn. The appearance of the beings Pierre would try his best not to remember when he would wake, for he did not want to suffer the nightmare during the day as well. However, as superstitious as he was as a man of the sea, he would still not make the connection between his treasure and his terror. In fact, with his dying breath, he would bestow the gift of treasure to one of his three sons to keep until such time that his own offspring would be ready to take it. This son was Jean's grandfather, Michel, who would have almost identical misfortunes to his father until he had removed the mummified flesh from the chain around his neck and placed it somewhere out of sight. There it withered even more through time and eventually came into the possession of Jean's papa. He remained clueless about the cursed thing, having received it hidden inside a little music box. That music box was the whole entire life of Petit Jean, once her father had given it to her for her birthday. Though its mechanisms were old and rusty, it had long ago stopped playing its repetitive song. The girl would give it voice by singing all her favorite melodies, or those that were simply fashionable at the time. <laughs> One day, when Jean was twelve, she discovered a secret compartment within the box, which she had previously never seen. She opened it, joyous of the hidden riches she could find within, but instead she was confronted with a peculiarity. Obviously, what was inside the box was the old, mummified piece of flesh, covered with what seemed like a grayish-green scale on the side. Perhaps it was not the pearls she was expecting, but the odd trinket from the box still caught Jean's attention and admiration. The girl would immediately string it onto a chain and wear it on her neck, as if it was what she had always wanted. The nightmares which Pierre would have regularly would never fully reach Jean after she found the secret heirloom. Fragments of the strange worlds would appear in her sleep, but muddied and distant overcast by the shadow of her waking blindness. However, she would always have the unmistaken and unshakable feeling of being someplace other than home and in her bed. 
In her dreams, her feet would walk endless, ragged terrains, tearing up her skin something awful, making her wake in pain so horrible as to convince her that she had fully been transported. Fully, her mother would constantly repeat. You could not have been any place else than here. With me, right by your side. Look at your feet, not a scratch on them. Over time, Jeanne had become convinced that her dreams had nothing to do with her affliction, and that there was nothing real about them, though the line between what was this world and what was the other had continued to thin out, heightened by the shrill voice echoing constantly from the perpetual darkness. Pierre, too, knew that voice. Knew it all too well. Him, however, the voice had not beckoned. It had not spoken to him directly. It did not even know that Pierre was looking into its memory and reliving its long and miserable life on the other side of the rift, beyond the Mariana Trench. In the early 1990s, almost a decade after her parents had passed, one after the other, Jeanne had become something of a fixture in the asylum where she was first brought as a very young woman. She would not credit the same attention from doctors and experts as she had back then. A middle-aged blind woman seated in the far corner of the common room, thrown away and forgotten. Jeanne would almost welcome that haunting voice, until, once again, she would see into the depths from which it had called. The factual year in which the second sight had returned to Jeanne did not even matter anymore. As the shocks of light revealing the macabre instances of the rotting corpse, had become a perpetual torment for much longer than it had been on the day she was hospitalized. Her yelps and screams were heard throughout the institution, but had only warranted the reaction of a strong sedative. The process which had started within the HMS Challenger, and continued with the Triste, was now taken upon the Kaigo. This particular descent in the Mariana Trench consisted of an unmanned, remotely operated vehicle that would be plunged over and over again into the ocean over the course of a decade, going even further than the 6,000 fathoms measured over three decades earlier. The robotic deep-sea probe would be a particular challenge for Jean because its lights would be brighter, wider reaching, and, during each dive, they would turn on and off again every 12 hours, for days on end. Each descent of the Kaiko would illuminate different parts of the unearthly corpse. The glazed over eyes, the talons, the grayish green scales on the ridge of its back, the slumped, wide open jaw with the sharpest teeth that could shred a man whole if it were living. Each time the probe would descend, Jean would be stuck with the image of the gruesome, monstrous body that had somehow managed to get itself to the bottom of the Pacific. Jean's suffering was unbearable, yet she lived. She persisted through the nightmare that was her life. Chapter 4 What Can Kill a God What had fused to Jean's mind was not the creature itself, for it had been long dead. Nor did it consciously seek her out or her great-grandfather previously. Dead things have no intent. They have no reason. But there was still something attached to the beastly body that had found its way in both the waking and sleeping thoughts of the Goudal family. There was no explanation for it. None that was specifically human. Or rather, that was measurable. That could be put under the rigorous scrutiny of various scientific methods. Hypothesized over and lastly argued about in detail with grand intellectual communities. All expeditions to the Mariana Trench, manned or unmanned, had proven as such. Though, what was found in those expeditions at the deepest bottom of the Earth's ocean were certainly leaps forward in the understanding of life on our planet. It could still not be compared in any way to what Jeanne or her kin had witnessed. Pierre's youngest son, Michel, who had received the Amulet of Doom on his father's deathbed and bore it for a time on his chest, 
would openly describe his nightmares to his wife, unashamed of all their gruesome oddity. Like his father before him, he would have seen things of no earthly origin and with no earthly logic to them. However, unlike his father, Michel would try to imbue some semblance of meaning to what he had seen in his sleep. It was not an easy explanation to attempt, nor was it a simple description to give. Startled to wake one night, just a few years after he had returned from the Great War, and with only a few months with the amulet around his neck, Michel would confess to his wife that he would rather not sleep at all if he should keep dreaming about wars even more terrible than the one he had survived. Where Pierre would see endless trenches cutting across a hellish landscape, he could not recognize them as the wounds of an ongoing war. Dead bodies lumped in massive mountains of discarded, alien flesh would scare poor Pierre just by the sight of them, but not by what they had meant. Roofless charges of beings infernal he would also witness, yet he would only see them as ragging beasts and not as troops advancing. If the horrid look of the other place beyond the rift was not petrifying enough, Michel had also come to the conclusion that scared him more than he could bear. There was mercy in what his father could not deduce from his dreams, for the fear that swept through Michel he had not felt even when he himself sat in the cold and muddy trenches, praying to stay alive. Burdened by his experiences of this world, Michel would first think that he had been suffering the same ailment that many of his compatriots had braved, an illness of the mind scarred by battle, shell shock. Yet there would always be a feeling deep within him, telling him that the other war was also true, and not a mere fantasy. Not only true, but at one point would even feel more real to him than anything else. It would have been hard for Michel to believe that his own imagination could come up with such unseemly beings as the ones that he had seen in his dreams. The same doubts he would have of his own mind and sanity that Jeanne's parents had of hers. However, she did not have the choice to decide what was real and what was mad, since that choice was made for her. For a while, Michel would only dream of creatures much like the ones whose corpse lay in the Mariana Trench. Even Pierre would deduce that what he had been seeing were beings of scaly oddity that reminded him much of the treasure he had pocketed and wore as an amulet. Jeanne would not be privy to such information. In fact, her mind would never know that what her eyes had seen was only a single specimen of those creatures. She would not dare question if there were more of it, nor would she guess that there were not a thing of myth or legend, but eldritch things that had roamed many dimensions of the universe for eons on end. Jeanne would never know, and Pierre would neither, that these cosmic beings were so old and long-living that their wars would last even more than there had been life on Earth, and even longer they will stretch until all life as she knew it would vanish. If it had taken a single corpse so long to decompose, who knows how long those bodies could go on as living, and what they could withstand. But what, then, could possibly kill such gruesome and unearthly things? Once the decade in which the Kaiko made over 250 plunges into the deepest, darkest point of the Mariana Trench had passed, Jeanne had lost much of her sense of reality. Neither here nor there, she would go into inarticulate rants, interspersed with song, rendered more like a desperate whisper than a saving grace. In the following decade, she would remain relatively calm between rants, largely withdrawn into her own darkness, listening for that voice that would continue calling, and beckoning from afar. Jeanne would die on the 26th of March, 2012 in the asylum where she had spent most of her life, clutching the piece of flesh that her great-grandfather had brought back from his travels with the HMS Challenger. The amulet made of eldritch flesh had become so dry over time that it had turned to dust and dissipated when Jane was eventually brought to the mortuary. Unlike Murray, Thomas, Picard, Walsh, and then Cameron, 
she would not merit remembrance for her own descent into the Mariana Trench, or about anything other in her mad life. On the day of her funeral, only a handful of people had shown up. The nurse that cared for her, an old janitor from the asylum that was there since the 1980s, and but a few odd fellows that hailed from across the Atlantic. No one cried. The last thing Jeanne said to her nurse before she died was uttered in the first moments in which the Deep Sea Challenger, equipped with 3D cameras and piloted by James Cameron, would reach the depths of over 6,000 fathoms in the Mariana Trench. It has returned. The light in the darkness. He. He is still there. But not alone. Dieu, not alone. Turn off the lights. Help. Maman. I don't want to see. Aidez-moi. I don't want to see. Maman. Aidez-moi. Jean grabbed the hand of the nurse one last time and held it until she drew her last breath in a state of mindless panic. The day Michel Godard would yank the chain off his neck and hide the treasure in the music box that Jean's papa would receive would follow the worst of his nightmares to date. Finally, after years of staying behind the trenches formed by the scaly beings that could live in water and walk on the grounds just the same, Michel would see their savage opponents. Moreover, he would find out how and why the eldritch corpse had found its way into the Pacific Ocean. Thrown without warning into one of the most ferocious battles in the alien realm that he had ever seen, Michel could barely hold his ground, even in dream. The massive amphibian things, which he would come to know over the years as the main occupants and protectors of that realm, were completely overshadowed in brutality and ugliness by the cosmic beings of indescribable majesty. They were swift and unscrupulous in their attacks, shape-shifting and deceitful, even driving the amphibians crazy with their tactics and vile tricks. In and out of the realm they would drop, reaching terrible tentacles thousands of feet long, inside the trenches where Michelle also stood, stupefied and mute. What kind of sorcery or technology they had used on the battlefield, Michelle was beyond understanding for they had been able to appear and disappear into the wretched sky of that unearthly dominion at will. Earth was not spared the sorcery of these interdimensional beings, for it too had witnessed their tactics unfolding. However, slowly over the centuries, the sightings of these beings appearing in our realm would fall into myth and legend, explained away by either folly or the lack of understanding of the natural world. Yet. To this world, they were not natural. Thousands of rifts, the raging war had opened between two dimensions, and the Mariana Trench, where the discarded body of the scaly oddity lay, was and still is the biggest one. The question that remains is how many more would be opened, and what unearthly horrors would cross from one realm into the other. One must pray that it would only be a dying or dead beast that would enter this earth. For if it were living, none would be spared its cruelty. Hey Creepypasta fans, it's Kira Rhodes. Thanks for listening. To connect with and support us, make sure you check out our Discord and Patreon links in the description. And remember, stay cosmic!